Chapter 16 Lucas opened the driver's door to Thompson's Humvee and found the keys in the ignition. When he started its engine, the dashboard displayed the time as 11.11 p.m. The GPS system installed into the center console beeped twice, then booted its operating system. Moments later, he knew his exact location, 35 miles northwest of the Phoenix metropolitan area. He used the GPS interface to plot two courses. One was to the Capitol building in downtown Phoenix, where he knew General Alvarez was headed. The other was to his mother's home in north-central Phoenix. Both destinations required him to take the same route southeast to Phoenix until he ran into Interstate 17, giving him about 30 minutes to decide on his final destination. If he chose to go home, he still had time to make it there before midnight to wish her a Merry Christmas, and it would give him time to rehearse what he was going to tell his mother about Drew's death. On the other hand, if he decided to hunt down Alvarez, he'd have time to devise a stealthy approach. He stepped on the gas and drove off across the desert in the same direction as General Alvarez. The road, if you could call it that, was filled with gullies, sand, and rock, sending his head crashing into the Humvee's padded ceiling numerous times. Tumbleweeds, bushes, and a few cacti careened off the truck's grill guard as he plowed through everything in his path. Just when he thought the uneven terrain would never end, he came across a paved, two-lane highway. He turned left and headed southeast toward the freeway. He drove about a mile down the road, then over the crest of a steep hill near one of the state's man-made lakes. A skyline view of the Phoenix metro area opened up before him, catching him off guard for a moment. It was a stunning nighttime panorama of the sprawling desert metropolis. The spectacular view would have been jaw-dropping beautiful and soothing if not for the pair of killer energy domes glimmering in the distance and the fresh wound from Drew's death squeezing his heart. Death and destruction seemed to be all around him and following his every move. Shit, they're back. More blood on my hands. One of the domes appeared to be devouring the downtown Phoenix area, while the other was near Scottsdale, a suburb 30 miles east of Phoenix. Pockets of the city's power grid were now failing, flickering off and leaving dark, featureless voids across the brilliant nightscape. Twenty minutes later, he arrived at the north side of Phoenix, where he turned right and took the south access ramp onto I-17. Downtown Phoenix was straight ahead and still a bit of a drive. He jammed the gas pedal to the floorboard, plastering his back against the driver's seat. The opposite side of the freeway was crammed with a long line of cars and trucks, each filled with people trying to evacuate the city. He appeared to be the only one dumb enough to be heading south, directly toward the chaos. Ten minutes later, he was nearing the point in his trip where he needed to make a choice, track down General Alvarez or go rescue his mother. A mile ahead was the Thunderbird Road exit, the point of no return if he wanted to drive to his mother's house. The terrain blurred by his window, seemingly speeding up the passage of time. The tires churned and the engine roared, taking him forward at high speed. Second by second ticked by, until he could see the exit ramp approaching on the right. Reason and rage battled within him. He didn't know what he was going to do. Which path should he take? Suddenly, his mind detached from his body, filling his consciousness with the sensation of being outside of himself. He was now floating high above the truck, looking down through the top of the windshield like an observer. He could see his dirt-covered fingers gripping the steering wheel as the momentum of the Humvee took his body forward into the future. Without warning, his flight path changed, swinging him around the driver's side of the truck and lowering his viewing angle. He could now see himself working the steering wheel, his face smothered in emotions. At that instant, he knew what his body was thinking about. His mom, his dad, and his brother, everyone who was important to him. What would they want him to do? Alvarez or rescue mom? The answer came to him the instant the Humvee swerved to the right, down the Thunderbird Road exit ramp. Family first, he decided. His out-of-body sensation passed, and he was now back behind the steering wheel and in full control. Full control of the vehicle, his emotions, and his future. Intersection after intersection flew by, and so did the traffic heading the opposite way. He was now only a minute from his mother's house. 
The rest of his plan was simple. Get Dorothy out of town and away from the energy fields. He needed to save what little family he had left and do it now. Then find the words to explain to her what had happened to Drew. Lucas arrived on the street to their family home just short of midnight. Dorothy was normally in bed around 9 p.m., but he figured she was still awake. He imagined her sitting on the plastic-covered living room sofa, staring out the front window, sipping eggnog from her favorite coffee mug, which had a nonsensical mathematical calculation on its side, with the humorous caption, Friends don't let friends derive drunk. Dorothy was probably still worried and still awake after he and Drew failed to show up in time for Christmas dinner. There was sure to be a pile of homemade oatmeal cookies sitting on the coffee table next to a cold glass of milk with his name on it. Oatmeal Krispies were his favorite, and she made them for him every year. It was a Ramsey family tradition, one started by his grandfather Roy, back before the gruff old man was banned from the household. The thought of cookies and milk stirred in his brain, making his stomach growl with hunger. If he was going to face his mom without Drew at his side and explain his death, he needed a sugar fix first to bolster his energy. Then he got an idea, wondering if the general's men had any food in the Humvee. A second later, the vehicle's center console was open and he found two power bars tucked under a pair of sunglasses. He ripped off the wrappers and wolfed them both down in seconds as he crept closer to Dorothy's house on the right. His foot eased off the gas pedal a bit when he saw a white van parked along the curb in front of his mother's house. The street lights were still blazing, providing ample light to identify the vehicle, a campus security van. If its driver was someone he knew, it would make explaining the night's events all that much easier. He intended to pull behind the van and park, but changed his mind when he noticed two armed guards standing next to it on the side facing the house. His mother was being escorted out of the house by another pair of men, one alongside her and supporting her right arm as she moved, and the other was two steps behind, carrying a pair of suitcases and a knapsack over his left shoulder. As the Humvee cruised a little closer, Lucas realized the person escorting his mother by the arm was Bruno his favorite campus security guard and king of the sugar junkies. Lucas studied the face on the other man to see who it was. He recognized him, too, but did a double-take to confirm. Yes, the man carrying the baggage was him. What the hell? He snapped, frowning in confusion. Maybe he'd been hit on the head while he was drugged. His mind must have been playing tricks on him. That's all he could figure. He decided to check a third time in order to convince himself he wasn't going crazy. He closed his eyes tight, took two deep breaths to calm himself, then looked again. Shit, he wasn't seeing things. The man carrying the suitcases was him. This isn't possible, he told himself. Is it? It was clear from Dorothy's smile and demeanor that she believed her escort was Lucas. But how could she not know the man walking with her was an imposter? A mother knows these things, right? She knew Lucas better than anyone else in the world, except for maybe Drew. That meant only one thing. The charlatan wasn't simply an actor, and his resemblance must have been more than just superficial. His mother was being fooled and probably in trouble, he decided. Lucas lowered his head and drove past the house, hoping to avoid detection. There was plenty of ambient light from the moon, but nobody seemed to notice him or the Humvee as he drove slowly by the house. At the end of the street, he turned off the truck's headlights and made a U-turn, parking behind a dented and scratched four-door GMC dually truck on the opposite side of the street. A stack of inner tubes was tied down inside the bed of the gas guzzler using bungee cords, and its front wheels were parked up on the sidewalk at a sharp angle probably due to the driver having one too many six-packs at the indoor water park Lucas knew was only a mile away. He got out of the stolen Humvee and snuck along the street until he made his way to the house next to his mother's. He crouched down behind the three-foot-tall hedge separating the two lawns, giving him a clear view of the front yard and the waiting van. The sliding door was open, but shadows cast by the halogen street lamps partially obscured the interior from view. Bruno opened the passenger door and helped Dorothy into the front seat, then walked around the front of the van and got in the driver's seat. A black laptop computer case with an L.A. Kings hockey sticker on its front pocket was slung over his shoulder. Lucas recognized the computer. It was his. 
He'd put the sticker on the case just a few months before. The red-haired man impersonating him opened the vehicle's open side cargo door. The phony handed both suitcases to one of the armed guards already inside, then stepped up and entered the vehicle himself. Seconds later, the other guard joined them and the sliding door slammed shut. Part of Lucas was impressed. The man pretending to be him moved exactly like he did. His walk, his mannerisms, his facial expressions, everything. But only part of him was impressed. The rest was furious about his mother being kidnapped under the guise of friendship and family. He wasn't about to let this charade continue and needed to expose it. But first, he needed a plan. Those armed guards wouldn't like someone sneaking up and causing hell, so caution was in order. Lucas went back to the Humvee and waited to turn on his headlights until after Bruno flipped a U-turn and drove down the street in the opposite direction. Lucas put the transmission into drive and followed the university van for the next hour as Bruno worked his way through traffic, traveling west across the north side of town. Lucas kept the Humvee back at a safe distance, trying not to be spotted as a tail. His plan seemed to work. It wasn't difficult to blend in with the numerous army trucks interspersed within the civilian traffic. Bruno made a sudden turn and drove south along the access road bordering the Loop 101 freeway until he reached the Glendale Hockey Arena's front side parking lot. The van drove down a sharp incline and disappeared into an underground garage. To the right of the ramp's entrance was a 20-foot wide sign that read, Arena Renovation General Contractor BTX Enterprises. Lucas knew Dr. Cleesby's development company had purchased the vacant hockey building and was in the process of renovating it, but he'd never set foot inside the arena. He'd seen it on TV many times, the last being two years earlier, right before the Arizona Coyotes filed for bankruptcy, a second time, and then relocated to Mexico. Nobody expected the financially strapped team to thrive in Mexico, but it did. To this day, he never got used to saying, Los Coyotes. Lucas waited five minutes before driving the Humvee down the entrance ramp. Inside, he only found one other vehicle, Bruno's security van. It was parked backward in the very last row, only about 20 feet from his current position. He could see the empty front seat of the van and its cargo door. The van looked abandoned. He looked around to see where Bruno and crew had taken his mother. There were only four exits on the sublevel, including the entrance ramp behind him, at the far end of the garage was the main elevator and its adjoining stairs, but the white university van wasn't parked anywhere near them. The only other choice was a closed orange door, which was about ten feet on the other side of the van. Lucas pulled forward slowly and parked the Humvee nose to nose with the van. He set the parking brake and got out. The soldier's gun was in his right hand as he looked through the van's driver's side window. No one was inside. He tried peering inside the van's rear windows, but they were heavily tinted and the garage lighting was poor. He couldn't see much of anything. He went to open the double doors on the back of the van, yanking hard, but they were locked. He walked to the orange door he saw on the way in and put his left hand on the doorknob. The plan was to carefully open it and sneak inside, but he stopped his hand from turning the knob when he heard voices coming from the other side. He leaned in close to the door and pressed his left ear against it to listen. One of the voices he heard was a perfect rendition of his own. There was a friendly argument happening between the imposter and Bruno, something about who should go first. He didn't know what they were talking about, but they were kidding around like old chums at happy hour. The imposter certainly had everyone fooled, except him. He listened for his mother's voice, but didn't hear the familiar melody of her words. A handful of seconds later, an electrical hum rattled the doorframe, startling him for a second. Inside, a female's voice said, Please step onto the pad. Activation sequence will begin in 30 seconds. Remember not to hold your breath. It wasn't his mom's voice. It was someone else. Lucas slowly twisted the doorknob, trying to open it, but it wouldn't budge. It was locked. Again, he heard the same female speak on the other side of the entrance. Please step onto the pad. Activation sequence will begin in 30 seconds. Remember not to hold your breath. Both times the woman spoke, she used the exact same inflections and timing, making her voice sound artificial, like a recording. 
He waited and listened for another few minutes, but heard nothing else from the other side. It was time to break in, he decided, kicking at the metal door. But it wouldn't open. He tried again and again, each time getting nowhere. A new plan was needed, so he hustled back to the Humvee and searched it for tools. There wasn't much useful inside, other than a heavy-duty scissors jack stuffed in a recessed sidewall compartment behind the rear seat, and a three-foot-long tire iron with a tapered end like a screwdriver. It was wedged inside a form-fitting cutout just below the scissors jack. A second later, the steel bar was in his hands, and he was sprinting back to the orange door with the intention of using it as a crowbar. He took aim, then jammed the bar's tapered end into the door jamb with a single thrust, splitting the metal seam next to the lock. He wiggled and pushed the tire iron farther into the crack before leveraging his weight against the bar. It worked. The door popped open with a creak of metal and a crack as the lock assembly finally broke in half. He flattened himself against the outside wall and waited to see if anyone came running after all the noise he'd just made. No one came. He let out the breath he'd been holding in his lungs and put the bar on the cement floor before walking inside with the loaded gun out in front of him. He snuck along the brick wall lining the hallway until he came to a chamber about the size of a 7-Eleven convenience store. Inside, he discovered two stacks of blinking electronic equipment with a metal desk and computer console sitting in front. It was all black and chrome and looked incredibly high-tech, definitely out of place in an abandoned sports arena. He checked the room, but there was no sign of his mother or anyone else. The place was empty. He didn't understand how, but it was. A clear cylinder about the size of a phone booth stood in the center of the room. It was a few feet taller than Lucas and resembled an oversized pneumatic tube, like those used by a bank in its drive through lane. On the left side of the tube, A bundle of gray and black cables snaked their way along the floor, connecting the tube to the electronic equipment. The cylinder's base was a round pad about three inches thick and four feet in diameter. Its surface was shiny and appeared to be made of glass or possibly an acrylic. The pad was sectioned off into four pie-shaped triangles of different colors, red, blue, orange, and green. When Lucas approached the cylinder, its enclosure rotated automatically, revealing two clear overlapping glass tubes, one inside the other. The glass rings continued moving in opposite directions until a man-sized opening appeared. The device wanted him to step inside. He was tempted, but decided to wait. More information was needed. He went to the computer desk, where a rotating 3D font was spinning on the computer's 20-inch monitor. The phrase, BTX Enterprises, danced across the screen in block letters, taking turns bouncing off the four edges of the display. He didn't see a mouse or keyboard, so he touched the screen to deactivate the screensaver. The computer display changed to show, Network Console, Jump Pad 13, Destination Silo 3, Status Online Ready, Com, Sync, Stream, Outbound, Core, Charged, Buffer, Waiting, Engage. Cancel. Jump pad 13. Com sync. Buffer waiting, he mumbled aloud, working through the details in his brain. The device must be some type of streaming communication system, he decided, and it was connected to a silo. Apparently not the only one Cleesby owned either, since it showed silo number three. He used his finger to press the engage button. A female voice instantly said, Please step onto the pad. Activation sequence will begin in 30 seconds. Remember not to hold your breath. Her voice came at him from every direction and was obviously being artificially generated by the technology in the room. His eyes darted from left to right, scanning the walls and ceiling, but he didn't see any speakers. The computer's voice spoke again. Please step onto the pad. Activation sequence will begin in 30 seconds. Remember not to hold your breath. Uh, I don't think so, he said to her, taking a step back while thinking about the contents of the screen and the fact he was alone in the room. Then the answer hit him square in the forehead. The machine must have been some type of telepod or transporter. It would explain how they left. Must have taken it to Silo 3, wherever that is, he mumbled. The computer spoke again, issuing the same commands as before. He ignored it like before, returning to the vertical cylinder to consider his options. There were two choices. 
step onto the pad and take a ride, or abandon his intention to rescue his mother. If he gave up now, where would he go? What would happen to her if he didn't chase after them? After a few more moments of deliberation, he decided the only choice was to risk the transporter, if that's what this thing actually was. He stepped into the device, making sure the handgun he was holding did not damage the glass. Lights flashed, and a high decibel alarm blared through the room. Then, the same female's voice said, This is a weapons-free zone. Please discard your weapon immediately. You have 20 seconds to comply, or a nerve agent will be released. A steel door slammed shut from the ceiling above, blocking his access to the entrance hallway. He was trapped inside the room. Then, a four-foot-wide metal drawer slid open along the wall next to the electronic equipment. Lucas didn't need to be told twice. He flew off the pad, ran to the deposit drawer, and tossed in the handgun. The drawer closed as soon as the weapon clanked along its bottom. He listened for the computer to respond, but she didn't. I just gave you the gun, he shouted to the room, hoping she'd cancel the nerve agent threat. But he heard nothing. He waited for it, but didn't hear the sound of gas being released. Maybe he was in the clear. He went back to the pad and stepped inside. This time, its enclosure rotated closed without any alarms or warnings, allowing his heart rate and supercharged lungs to slow a bit. He closed his eyes and waited for the machine to do its thing while concentrating on his breathing, making sure to inhale and exhale normally as the computer told him to do. Everything was going fine until he started thinking about the 1986 movie The Fly. He suddenly worried he might come out the other end of the system as a hybrid organism, like the movie's Brundle fly creature, half human, half fly. He opened his eyes and listened for insects buzzing around the telepod. There were none. Then the equipment powered up while he was checking for insects, making him hold his breath. He began to feel lightheaded, as if he were in a dream floating above the clouds. It was almost a spiritual experience, which was more than strange, since, unlike his brother, he didn't believe in a supreme being. He preferred the hard reality of science, and couldn't fathom how his mother and brother could blindly follow church doctrine without a shred of proof or assurance. A long second later, he heard the same computerized female voice say, Welcome to Silo 3. Lucas pried his eyes open, expecting the worst. He looked down and checked all his body parts. Each was intact and still human. So far so good, he thought, as a wave of dizziness came over him. He stumbled a bit before throwing out his hands against the clear glass enclosure to catch his balance. A second later, the enclosure began to rotate open, and he stepped out in a flash. He was in a room much like the one he'd just left, electronic equipment installed in wall-mounted enclosures along one side of the room, and a stubby computer desk with a flashing monitor sitting on top of it. Lucas walked to the only door, opened it, and stepped into a featureless, gray, concrete hallway. Two people, a thirty-something male with thick, horn-rimmed glasses, and a mousy-looking younger female with her auburn hair pulled back in a tight bun, were approaching from his right. They were lab techs of some sort, judging by their identical white tunics and turquoise-colored surgical pants. They were shuffling their feet forward at half speed, obviously in no hurry to get where they were going. The woman was eating a bagel while her colleague carried the conversation. It was too late to go back inside the room, so Lucas decided to stand there and act natural. Maybe they wouldn't notice him. However, a moment later, the man turned his eyes toward Lucas, it sent a wave of panic down Lucas's spine. Hello, Dr. Ramsey. Enjoying your visit so far? The man asked, giving him a friendly, welcoming smile. Lucas was stunned for a second, then realized the man thought he was the imposter. He pushed through his surprise and glanced at the man's name tag to play along. Yes, I am, Dr. Corey. The girl flashed him a grin, too, but didn't say anything as they cruised past him, heading down the hallway to the left. Lucas waited till they made the corner, then decided to head in the opposite direction, following three different colored floor stripes, red, orange, blue. They were painted down the middle of the cement floor and about four inches apart from each other. When the stripes branched off from each other, he went with his instinct and followed the red stripe, only because red was his favorite color. He needed to pick one, knowing that without additional data, the odds of selecting the correct stripe were 33% in his favor. 
Of course, the pessimist lurking inside his gray matter would say it was 66 against, but he chose to think positive. The red line led him down two more connecting hallways, where he eventually found a half-dozen closed doors lining the wall on the right. The first door was labeled with a sign that read, Laundry. He kept on walking until he came upon another door that read, Supplies. He opened it and went inside. The room's interior was just as he expected. Two floor-to-ceiling metal shelves with cleaning supplies on one and office supplies on the other. There was a janitor's mop and bucket, several worn yellow sponges, a pair of dirty yellow Converse sneakers that appeared to be older than he was, and a handful of fly-fishing magazines sitting under a box of handy wipes. A blue baseball cap with a crusted ring of sweat was draped over the end of the mop's handle. Several waist-high rectangular signs were leaning up against the wall next to the door. Some of the printing was faded beyond recognition, but Lucas was able to make out Titan II Missile Sight, AZ-18, stenciled across the top of each sign. Just below the title was a single number, varying from 1 to 8, depending on which sign he looked at. Below each number was a differing floor plan with footprint icons leading to exterior doors. Floor schematics, he mumbled, wondering if the signs belonged to the building he was in. He'd visited the Titan Missile Museum just south of Tucson during his freshman year of college, and recalled what the tour guide had explained that day. When the Department of Defense decommissioned various missile silos around the country, they often sold the property to citizens at pennies on the dollar. He wondered if Cleesby's company had bought one of them and refurbished it. If his boss had, it would explain the silo name on the telepod's control screen. And since the professor had given its name number three as well, it meant he'd likely purchased several of them. At least three would be a safe guess. Okay, I'm underground in an old missile silo. But where? He inspected the office supplies and found they were all from the same supply store in Tucson. He recognized the address as just south of campus on Broadway Boulevard, telling him he was probably still in southern Arizona. Good news. He wasn't far from the university. He went back outside and continued down the hall, turning right around the next corner. He could see an elevator at the far end of the corridor with a woman standing in front of it. To his immediate left, there was a door marked Armory. That's more like it, he quipped, before ducking inside the door. The room was only slightly larger than the shared bedroom in his apartment, but much better stocked. An overcrowded weapons rack with machine guns and semi-automatic handguns was hanging on the far wall. In addition to the rack, there was a generous supply of other combat gear, including handheld radios, ammunition, night vision goggles, smoke and flash grenades, helmets, and Kevlar protective vests. He'd hit the mother load. On his way to the rifle rack, he bumped into a case of odd-looking handheld weapons sitting on top of two black corrugated storage containers. The guns were dark gray, almost black, with a blocky right-angle appearance, much like a police-issued taser. He picked up one of the weapons and balanced it in his hand. It was much heavier than expected. A pea-sized lever stuck out on the side of the gun and just above the hand grip. He pressed it with his thumb, releasing a two-inch rectangular cartridge from the bottom of the stock. The cartridge was glowing green, warm to the touch, and fit into the palm of his hand. He snapped the cartridge back into its chamber, then pointed the weapon at the empty wall next to the closed door. He wasn't paying attention to his fingers and accidentally pressed the trigger, sending a crackling blast of white energy out of the gun's barrel. When the energy ball hit the wall, it scattered across the surface like static lightning frolicking across the night sky. It raced around the room, spreading out and fading in intensity as it went, until it became only a memory. Holy shit, he muttered, staring at the energy weapon. He smiled, then tucked the gun inside the back of his waistband and pulled his shirt down over it to conceal the bulge. He also grabbed a black 9mm handgun from the weapons rack and checked its ammo. All 15 rounds were loaded into the magazine, which he rammed into the gun's stock. Lucas took a moment to admire the precision engineering that had gone into building the semi-automatic firearm, letting the importance of the moment settle in and register. The two weapons he was now carrying suddenly made everything seem more real. What came next wasn't going to be easy, and he wondered if he was ready. Not that it mattered. He didn't have a choice. He needed to venture forth into hostile territory and do so without backup or support if he hoped to save his mom and figure out what the hell was going on. 
he'd already lost Drew and wasn't about to let someone take the last member of his family away. This is it. Time to get serious, he told himself, his hands shaking and knees feeling weak. He took a deep breath and exhaled slowly, calming his nerves a bit. Playtime is over. Overall, he felt good about his progress thus far. He'd made it past the sentry door in the underground parking garage, figured out how to use a high-tech transportation device, then fooled two lab techs in the hall. Now came what he assumed would be the lethal stage. He stuffed the 9mm inside the front of his belt and returned to the hallway, where he continued down the corridor toward the elevator, keeping track of the armory's location in case he needed to return. When he reached the end of the hall, the elevator door opened and a security guard walked out, whistling a happy tune. Can I help you find something, Dr. Ramsey? Lucas cleared his throat, trying to act cool and play the part of the imposter. Have you seen Bruno? Last time I saw him, he was down on Sub-8 in surveillance. Thanks. Of course, any time, the guard said, walking away. Then the man stopped and turned around. Hey, didn't I just see you down there? How did you get up here so fast? Lucas pretended he didn't hear the guard's question and quickly stepped into the lift. He just needed the doors to close before the man asked him a second time. He pressed the number eight button on the panel, then smiled at the guard as if everything was normal. The guard brought his hand up with his index finger pointed as he went to say something, but the elevator doors closed before he could get the words out. Shit, that was close. I'd better hurry. The lights on the elevator showed he'd been on sub-level 5, and it was only a matter of seconds before he reached sub-level 8. A bell chimed, and the door slid open. Lucas expected to see another hallway, but instead, the lift opened directly into a warehouse-sized room filled with a 5x4 grid of 20 massive video screens covering the far wall. He stood there speechless, with his jaw hanging open, watching the sweeping array of technology. He'd seen control rooms like this in movies plenty of times, but the reality of where he was now and how he got there was a lot to take in. The screens featured a wide variety of images. Some were only displaying numbers, charts, and graphs, while others showed energy domes wreaking havoc and destruction across the planet. Between Lucas and the video feeds was a group of six technicians, all men, they were seated side by side in front of a control station that stretched from one side of the room to the other. Like the three men standing behind them, they were facing forward with their backs to Lucas. Everyone in the room looked to be focused on either the huge wall of video feeds or the control panels in front of them. No one seemed to notice his arrival in the back of the room. Lucas recognized the three men standing with their heads tilted up toward the active screens. One of them was Cleesby, who was leaning on crutches, wearing his patented flannel shirt and coveralls. One of his pant legs was cut off just below the knee to make room for the white cast wrapped around his ankle. Bruno was standing between Cleesby and the imposter who had carried his mother's suitcases from the house up in Phoenix. Before the elevator doors closed, Lucas quickly moved forward, aiming his 9mm handgun at the back of Cleesby's head. Someone mind telling me what the hell is going on here? He shouted, making Cleesby turn around in a lurch. Chapter 17 Cleesby's eyes flew wide, as did Bruno's and the imposters, all three of them now facing the business end of Lucas's gun. Well, what are you doing here? Cleesby asked. You're supposed to be dead, Bruno added, looking like someone had just walked over his grave. You mean like my brother? Lucas asked, sending an angry scowl with his words. Exactly, the red-headed imposter said with attitude. Sorry to disappoint, but I'm alive and kicking. It's obvious to me now you're all in cahoots with General Alvarez. I should shoot all of you for what you've done to my family. Cleesby put out his hands like he was trying to stop a runaway truck. Wait, it's not what it looks like, L. Yeah? What does it look like? Lucas replied. It startled him that Cleesby called him L. He'd never done that before. And what do you mean, L? You know perfectly well what my name is. Please, put the gun down and let me explain, Cleesby said. Where's my mother? She's safe and resting upstairs. Lucas pointed the gun at the imposter. Who the hell are you? I'm you, the real you, the freckled man answered, looking like he was about to start laughing. What? What do you mean, the real me? You heard me. You're not you. I'm you, he answered with a full smile on his lips. You think this is funny, asshole? Lucas asked. 
Yeah, it's hysterical. I know for a fact you're not going to shoot. Lucas waved the gun, wanting to drive his point home. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Just then, the elevator's arrival bell chimed behind him. Lucas didn't turn to look at it right away. Instead, he slid four steps to the left to maintain a defensible position. If a security team was arriving next, he needed to be ready. A second later, he swung his eyes to the elevator doors when he heard them swoosh open. Then, he saw it. A wheelchair with a handsome young Italian man in it. It was his little brother, looking at him with his big, handsome eyes. Lucas's mind froze, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. He lowered the weapon a few degrees and loosened his grip, almost dropping the gun on the floor. Drew, you're alive? How can that be? A smile erupted across Lucas's face, but vanished just as quickly when he realized the person sitting in the wheelchair could be another imposter. He regained his wits and tightened his hold on the pistol. What the hell is going on here? He asked, pointing the firearm first at the kid in the wheelchair, then at Cleesby, and then at his double. He was usually an excellent problem solver, but this situation had him stumped. He wasn't prepared for any of it and didn't know what he should do next, so he kept shifting targets to buy time while he figured out what was happening. Bruno took a step toward Lucas, but Cleesby stopped him with an armbar maneuver. Lucas pointed the gun at Bruno and held it there. That's close enough, big fella. Everyone just stay right where they are until I get some answers. Trust me when I say that my emotional state right now isn't something any of you should bank on. Easy now. Let's all take a breath and not do anything rash, Cleesby said, stepping between Bruno and Lucas. We're all friends here. Lucas turned to the boy in the wheelchair, who had a heavy bandage wrapped around his leg. Who the fuck are you, and what are you doing in my brother's chair? It was all he could do not to pull the trigger and blow a hole in whoever was sitting in front of him. The Drew imposter smiled. It's me, Lucas, your brother. Please put the gun down before someone gets hurt. Not a chance, Lucas said, shifting targets again. This time, the professor's forehead was the focus. Someone better tell me what the hell is going on here before I let my trigger finger do all the talking. That wasn't me out there with Alvarez, fake Drew said. I never got shot. You're going to have to do better than that, Lucas said, shaking his head. I saw my brother's brains get splattered all over the desert after Alvarez's men drugged us and took us out there against our will. You can't be him. I was there. I saw him die. It's something I'll never forget. The general took everything away from me. And now this? Please, El, let me explain, Cleesby said, his face frantic. Yeah? Why should I listen to you? Everything you've been telling me all along has been nothing but a lie. I should shoot all of you right now. Fuck this! Wait, wait, wait! Just give me a chance to explain. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Bullshit. It'll just be more lies on top of lies, Professor. It never ends with you. He's telling you the truth, Bruno said in a calm, steady voice. So you're in on this too? Lucas asked his friend, not wanting to believe it. Just hear him out, please, Bruno said. Lucas could see the sincerity in the guard's eyes. His heart wanted to believe his friend, but his logic had other plans. And why should I do that? Why should I believe any of you? Because the fate of the human race depends on it, Cleesby said, this time with more confidence in his words. All I need is five minutes, and I can prove it. Lucas stood motionless and silent, considering the request. I'll answer all your questions. Full disclosure, I give you my word, Cleesby said. Lucas thought about it for a short minute, then decided to take a chance on the man and listen to what he had to say. Fine, by all means, enlighten me, Professor, but no sudden moves from any of you. Why don't we start with how you got away from the situation in the desert, the Professor asked. Lucas decided to play along, hoping his mentor would give him some answers before he started spraying and praying. His nerves were completely frazzled, and his patience was wearing thin, almost microscopic. He finally understood what the phrase itchy trigger finger meant. He could feel the power of the gun building in his hand, coming alive and ready to strike. He locked eyes with Cleesby. After Alvarez shot Drew and left, I overpowered his guard and took his Humvee. Then I went to Mom's to get her and saw you guys escorting her out, so I followed you to the hockey arena. He gestured to Bruno. Nice transporter, by the way. Did you kill him? Bruno asked. Who, Alvarez? No, the guard. Lucas shook his head. 
I sure as hell wanted to, but I decided to just cuff him and leave him in the desert with a canteen of water. I didn't want to sink to their level. Then this ain't over, boss, Bruno told Cleesby with a worried look on his face. We'll deal with that later. The boys are safe as long as they remain here with us. I'm still waiting for an explanation, Lucas said, wiggling the gun to get their attention. Bruno, it's time to show him, Cleesby said. Sure, chief, Bruno said, stepping forward in front of Cleesby. Lucas took a step back as the overweight man extended both of his arms straight out from his shoulders, then tilted his head back and closed his eyes like an evangelist preparing for deliverance. His arms and legs started to quiver slowly at first, then gradually built in intensity until Bruno was in a full-blown, full-body seizure. The contours of his face and body twisted and contorted, morphing its symmetry into something unexpected. His body mass shrank, decreasing to two-thirds of its original size. The convulsions calmed before he brought his head forward from the tilted position. Bruno, or what was left of him, looked at Lucas with a devious smile, his cheeks now soft and smooth. It took Lucas's mind a full second to catch up to what his eyes were reporting. The old Bruno was gone, replaced by version 2.0. Only this version was a hard-bodied female with curves in all the right places. Somehow, Bruno had just transformed himself from a fat, lovable security guard into a gorgeous female in mere seconds. But not just any female. He was now Mary Stinger, Cleesby's assistant. He, or rather she, was dressed in a short plaid skirt and sheer pink blouse. But that wasn't all. She wasn't wearing a bra, and the pair of six-inch stiletto heels almost leveled her height with Lucas. The video equipment illuminated her body from behind, allowing Lucas to see much more of her figure than he'd ever dreamed of or wanted to, given the circumstances. A gut-wrenching pain wrapped his abdomen when reality sank in about the metamorphosis from manly plump to stunningly sexy. It was the most bizarre thing he'd ever witnessed in his life, and considering what he'd seen the past few days, that was saying something. How do you like my figure now? Mary asked, using Bruno's grizzled voice. She stepped out of Bruno's duty belt, which had fallen past her slender waist and landed on the floor. What the hell is this? Lucas gasped, regretting every lustful fantasy he'd had about Mary for the past couple of years. How could he ever trust his eyes or his raging hormones again? Bruno is one of our infiltrator units, Cleesby said in an even tone. Lucas pointed the gun at Mary. An infiltrator unit? So he's... she's... what, a cyborg? Not exactly, Cleesby said. Bruno's a genetically engineered biomorph, a synthetic replica of the original biological entity. The red-headed imposter with cheek scars who claimed to be him laughed out loud. I had this exact same conversation just a little while ago. Talk about deja vu. Lucas poked Mary in the arm to see if she felt real. Uh, biomorph? Cleesby replied. He has the ability to mimic different organisms and assume their identity. He looks and acts just like the original, but can be programmed to carry out a specific mission. So which is he? A clone or a robot? He's neither, and both. He's something in between. Bruno's what we call a synthetic, an artificial being who can transform at will to assume any identity or shape, whatever the mission demands. All he needs is a good supply of sugar to generate the energy needed to sustain each transformation. Lucas smirked, letting out a sarcastic laugh. What a complete load of horse shit. You can't possibly expect me to believe any of this. I've heard some whoppers in my day, but this one is biblical. Okay, smart guy. You tell me. How do you explain what you just saw? The professor asked. Lucas thought about it for a bit, but came up with nothing. Nice try, boss. But it's not up to me to explain. I'm the one holding the gun, remember? Look, my old friend. Everything I told you is true. Just take a minute and run it through that analytical mind of yours. Weigh the facts and let them align themselves until the answer runs clear. And if I don't agree? Then, by all means, shoot us all. What? Mary asked Cleesby in Bruno's voice. Don't plant ideas. Just give him a minute. Trust me on this. L will come around. 
Lucas ran it through in his head, sifting through all the bizarre and curious facts he'd accumulated while being part of the project, not only recently, but over the entire time he'd been working for the professor. He wanted to prove Cleesby wrong, but he couldn't. Everything seemed to line up perfectly to support the professor's claims. He stared at Mary, or Bruno, or whatever name he should call the person in the dress. She smiled and winked. It's all true, Dr. Lucas. All I need is a supply of sugar for the energy to complete the transformation. Lucas nodded, slowly at first, but with more vigor as time passed. It was all starting to come together. Lucas understood why Bruno was addicted to all things chocolate. The security officer consumed mounds of donuts and candy for the sugar rush, then used the energy to transform and assume different identities. Lucas was astonished when he thought about how human Bruno had acted for the past 18 months. He never would have guessed the fat man wasn't human. How many infiltrator units are there? Lucas asked, watching Bruno change back into his regular self. He knew he'd never look at Bruno the same way, at least not without thinking about Bruno's alter ego, who was no longer standing there in a short skirt and heels. Bruno's not the only one. However, the exact number is classified and on a strict need-to-know basis. When Lucas thought about Bruno and Mary being the same person, he discovered a discrepancy in Cleesby's story. Wait a minute. Something's not right here. What's that? Cleesby asked. A few days ago, when we were escorted to NASA's facility, Bruno was up on the surface and Mary was waiting for us down on sub-level 20. How could he or she be in two places at once? Let me show you, Cleesby said, calling forward one of his video technicians to stand next to Bruno. Lucas hadn't realized it earlier, but all the video techs looked like brothers and were wearing the same oversized pentagon-shaped watch as Bruno. Bruno extended his left arm and the tech his right. Their index fingers touched in the middle as if they were plugging into each other's bodies. Their fingertips fused together into one scarlet-colored mass, which resembled the semi-liquid substance found inside a lava lamp. The blob shimmered as it slithered across the connection, slowly encasing the tech's arm, then spread to his torso. Eventually, the goop smothered his entire body. For the next 15 seconds, the tech's body fluctuated under the gelatinous layer like a waterbed mattress swaying in an earthquake. When the spasm subsided, random sections of the gooey substance disappeared, revealing more and more of Bruno's appearance from underneath. When all of the scarlet material had dissipated, the tech was gone, having been replaced by an exact replica of Bruno, clothes and all. The only things missing were the duty belt and sidearm. Both copies spoke to Lucas in perfect unison, using Bruno's deep, raspy voice. We are one. We are many. We are whoever we need to be. Hopefully, now you understand. It took Lucas a few seconds to process what he'd just seen and heard. So, you can make copies of copies, like a Xerox. Yes, exactly, Cleesby answered. Okay, I get that. I don't believe it, but I get it. Regardless, it still doesn't explain what happened in the desert with Drew. The red-haired imposter, wearing his freckled face, stepped forward. He pointed at both Bruno copies and said, Jesus Christ, don't you get it yet? You're one of them. You're a copy. So was the Drew that Alvarez shot. Lucas didn't say anything. He needed a moment to think. Trust me, you two are replicas and were sent there to die, the imposter added. So the real me and him could live, he said, pointing at Drew in his chair. Lucas rolled his eyes, then turned to the professor. Okay, let's assume for a moment I believe you, which I don't. How did you know Alvarez was going to kidnap us? We have a spy inside the general's unit. He tipped us off when Alvarez was coming after you. Remember my note to Trevor outside the conference room? I had him go make contact with our operative, Cleesby said. That night in the hospital, Trevor replicated both of you while you two were asleep. We knew Alvarez was gunning for you, but we didn't know when or where he'd strike. It was the only way to protect your authentics. Alvarez had to think Lucas and Drew were dead. Otherwise, he'd never stop looking for them. That meant we had to let him kill you. Since we needed you and Dee to act like your authentics, we couldn't let you know you were copies. Lucas remembered the sticky stuff on his hand when he woke up in the chair in Drew's hospital room. 
His mind flashed to a vision of the gooey material he stepped in when he was washing his hands in the bathroom sink, and his sore neck and back when he woke up in the red chair. Then he remembered seeing Trevor's big orange suitcase and wondering what was inside it. If his lab assistant hadn't brought a change of clothes for him and Drew, why take a suitcase to a hospital? Even though the facts were compelling, he still didn't believe he was the copy. Or maybe he didn't want to believe it. His body felt real. His thoughts felt real. His emotions felt real. He'd watched his brother get shot in the head for fuck's sake and had his guts ripped out over it. He'd felt anger, sadness, rage, the whole gamut. Plus, he'd almost killed a man and almost carved his brother's initials in the asshole's forehead. But compassion rose up inside him and he stopped himself, like a righteous human being would do. How could a copy go through all that? How could a biomorph, as Cleesby called them, feel and experience everything that he had recently? A copy couldn't, he decided. Cleesby must have had the two of them confused. No, nope, I don't buy it. I'm not the copy. I'm the real Lucas. He pointed at the imposter, grinning back at him. He's the fake, not me. Maybe you need to show him the med lab, boss, Bruno said to Cleesby. Cleesby did not respond. Instead, he walked to the front left corner of the room and stood near an eight-foot-wide section of empty wall space. In front of him was a red wall-mounted fire extinguisher. Cleesby opened a sliding compartment hidden underneath the extinguisher's nameplate. Inside was a digital security keypad and biometric scanner. He entered a numerical security code and pressed his left thumbprint against the scanner. The empty wall segment slid up and disappeared into the ceiling, Lucas realized the hidden segment was actually a thick, reinforced metallic door covered in fabric that matched the wall, creating a perfect camouflage. Beyond the door was a room roughly the size of Lucas's E-121 project lab. Welcome to our med lab, Cleesby said. Two seven-foot-long stainless steel surgical tables stood in the center of the med lab. Their smooth, polished surfaces reflected light shining from directional units beaming down from the ceiling above. Their edges were raised like coroner's tables with depressed sections spaced evenly across their surface. Runoffs for blood, Lucas decided. Above each table, robot-like medical equipment hung down from the ceiling. A well-stocked mobile surgical cart sat between the two tables, adorned with instruments and supplies. Scalpels, scissors, forceps, and hemostats shared space with gauze bandages, plastic tubes, and syringes still in their wrappers. What Cleesby called a med lab was looking more and more like a torture chamber. Metal shelves lined three walls of the room, packed with clear glass containers. Each container was about the size of a janitor's mop bucket and was two-thirds full of a scarlet-colored liquid. The ceiling carried a supply of two-inch diameter tubes, which connected the containers to a furnace-sized machine along the back wall. An enormous blonde-haired technician was standing in a lab coat in front of the machine with his back to the entrance. Lucas walked into the lab and pointed the gun at the male technician. Turn around and let me see your hands. The tech turned around and smiled. It was Trevor, their Swedish lab assistant. Seriously? So what, everyone knows about this except me? Lucas asked. We know this might not be easy to accept, Cleesby said. Let us show you, then you'll come to understand. Trevor fetched a glass container from the shelf closest to him and poured the red substance into one of the surgical table's depressed areas. It oozed out of the container like semi-frozen red pudding. Cleesby called in one of his operation techs from the video room and had the man roll up his sleeve. Cleesby submerged the tech's hand into the scarlet material and held it there for a good 20 seconds. We call this substance Biotex. It's synthetically engineered living latex, Cleesby explained. Once his hand is submerged, the Biotex processes his DNA and begins the replication process. It requires at least 15 seconds of contact in order to create a genetic map of the donor's body. Plus, it downloads the donor's memory engrams at the same time. Living latex? Lucas asked. Cleesby withdrew the tech's hand from the biotex. We prefer to call it biotex, which is short for biomimetic latex. Lucas stood there, watching the biotex coagulate and thicken as it spread itself across the length of the table. 
it rose up from the table like bread dough and progressively assumed the shape of a featureless human body. Soon after, a facial structure began to materialize and show through the scarlet substance, like a person's face pushing up through a silk sheet. Mouth, eyes, and nose formed first, then hair sprouted and grew to full length. Eventually, the entire body, including genitalia, took shape. The final step was the appearance of a lab coat and clothing. When the transmutation was complete, an exact copy of the male technician lay before Cleesby on the table. Lucas shook his head. If the replica is a perfect copy, right down to its DNA, how do you tell the copy from the original? He asked, thinking about himself. He wondered if he could somehow switch places with the imposter without anyone knowing, or vice versa. Cleesby picked up a handheld electronic device the size of a paperback book. This is a biotech scanner. We use it to check the validity of any subject. When it senses the biomolecular resonance of biotechs, it lights up red. When it senses an authentic human, it lights up green. Cleesby aimed the device at Bruno's chest. After three seconds, the unit lit up red. Red means he's a replica. He pointed the unit at the imposter. Green means he's an authentic. If I pointed it at you right now, it would light up red. Lucas took a sharp step back to avoid the scan. He already knew the answer and didn't need a piece of unfamiliar equipment telling him who or what he was. He was the authentic, not the imposter. He was sure of it, and he wasn't going to let a piece of machinery he'd never seen before try to convince him of anything different. Cleesby held up the scanner. May I scan you to demonstrate? It'll only take a few seconds, L. Lucas pointed the gun at Cleesby. I told you to stop calling me that. It's not my name. How many times are you going to make me say it? Okay, okay. I'll call you Lucas if you prefer, Cleesby said. Just relax. We're all on the same side here. Everything we've done is for your benefit and your brother's. If you'll let us prove it, you'll see we've been trying to protect you. By calling me L? That's simply the naming convention we use for replicas. We call them by the first letter of their donor's name. Is it okay if I approach... It's the only way to resolve this situation and bring you into the fold. Lucas paused, then finally agreed. He lowered the gun, but kept his finger on the trigger, pointing the weapon at the professor's kneecap. Cleesby aimed the scanner at Lucas's chest and activated the device. It lit up red, just as the professor said it would. Shit. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not me. Lucas took his finger off the trigger and lowered his hand, aiming the gun's barrel at the floor. A second later, Bruno tackled Lucas from the side, pinning him spread-eagled to the floor. Then, Trevor jumped on a half-second later and inserted a four-pronged electronic device into Lucas's neck. Lucas screamed in pain, feeling an electric discharge coursing through his body, right before his hands, legs, and arms went limp. Get off me, Lucas gasped with his face and chest pressed hard against the floor. The combined weight of the two men on his back was making it tough to breathe. He watched his fingers slowly melt away, turning into the runny scarlet substance. It was true. He was the replica. He craned his neck to look down along the side of his torso, and then he saw it happen. His body began to lose cohesion as it dissolved into a runny blob of biotechs. Moments later, his mind went blank and his vision went dark. Chapter 18 The authentic Lucas looked at the puddle of biotechs lying underneath Bruno and Trevor on the floor. I sure am glad that's over with. I never realized what a stubborn son of a bitch I can be. He turned to Drew. I'm sorry for being a lifelong pain in the ass. You're forgiven, Drew said, laughing. Besides, if you weren't a total pain in my butt, I'd think you'd been abducted by aliens and replaced with a normal guy. You mean a boring guy, right? Sure, that's one way to look at it. One thing's for certain, life just wouldn't be the same around here without my high-speed, low-drag brother watching my back, even if he gets a little edgy at times. Edgy? Cleesby asked. That's the term you chose? Drew shrugged. I was trying to be nice. You guys don't have to tiptoe around me and sugarcoat everything. I know perfectly well who and what I am, so don't sweat it. It's all good. No worries, Lucas added, hoping to sound like the jab Drew just took at him didn't hurt. 
It did sting a little, but he pushed past it. He knew Drew didn't mean anything by it. His little brother didn't have a mean bone in his body. That was Lucas's job, as well as a few others in his diminishing circle of trust. Bruno rolled out of the biotech's sludge. Well, that was interesting. For a moment there, I thought your copy was going to shoot us all. He sure was one mixed-up dude, Lucas said with a half-smile. Wouldn't you have been, given the circumstances? Drew asked. Not a chance. If I was staring at two of you, I'd know the real Drew. I doubt that, considering replicas are perfect copies, right down to their synthetic DNA. Trust me, I could tell. No problem. Guys, now that L's been handled, we need to get back to business, Cleesby said. Sure, Professor. Sorry, Lucas said. So then, before we were so rudely interrupted by L, you said you still had some questions. Lucas had to think for a minute. With everything that just happened, his memory needed a wake-up call. Oh yeah, now I remember. Does it always take ten minutes to replicate someone, or can you speed up the process if needed? Yes, ten minutes, but only the first time a synthetic duplicates someone new. After that, as long as the replica maintains its sugar supply, its biomimetic programming remains intact. It only takes a few seconds to resume any of its previously copied identities, switching from one to another, almost at will. Even clothes? How? From the authentic's memory. The biotex scans the subject's mind and determines what the donor was wearing at the time of replication. It then synthesizes the clothes, just like the rest of the body. What about memories and emotions? Are they replicated too? Cleesby nodded, changing to his methodical, professorial voice like he was about to start an hour-long lecture. Since memories and emotions stem from physical structures in the brain that register levels of certain chemicals being manufactured by the body in response to stimuli, they are copied as well. These structures are all part of the whole. A biomorph is a perfect replica of the original, right down to the cellular level, including every cell and neuron in the brain, which include memories and emotions. Blood, bodily fluids, voice, brain patterns, and memory are mimicked perfectly. Even a human DNA analysis wouldn't be able to detect the difference. Only a biomolecular resonance scanner like ours can distinguish the replica from the original. Lucas thought about his brother's disability and wondered about a cure. What about genetic defects and things like injuries and diseases? We can program the biotechs to repair any physical defects during the replication process. However, we usually leave the imperfections in place to help make the impersonation more believable. Diseases are irrelevant and don't affect the replica, since it's not a real human being. Can your biomorphs impersonate anyone? Like the president? Well, yes they can, but there are issues when replicating a high-profile individual. First, we need prolonged contact with the donor to process its genetic makeup and download its mind. With someone as well-protected as the president, that wouldn't be possible. Then, you have the issue of what to do with the original. We wouldn't want to have two of them running around the White House. Obviously, that would cause problems. Yeah, no doubt. If you remember, I told you Bruno needs an ongoing supply of sugar in order to transform and maintain his identity. The same would be true with a copy of the President. The replica would need to consume significant amounts of sugar to maintain its form and not revert to pure biotechs. Someone would certainly notice the sudden change in the president's eating habits if he became a sugar junkie overnight. Okay, makes sense, Lucas said, nodding. Drew asked, Once the replica reverts back to its native form, what would happen if someone inserted their hand into it? Wouldn't it start to duplicate them? Cleesby shook his head. The biotechs can't be used again without the introduction of a reactivating enzyme that only we possess. It's one of our fail-safe mechanisms. The enzyme, and the knowledge to make it, is kept locked away under tight security. It's as important as the biotechs itself. We certainly don't want our own technology used against us, so we take every precaution. Did you invent this stuff? Drew asked. Yes and no, but I'm afraid that's all I'm at liberty to say at this point. I'm sure you'll agree our biotechs and its unique properties are beyond top secret. The rest of the details are on a strict need-to-know basis. I understand, Professor, Drew said. No need to explain. You're the boss. Lucas remembered reading somewhere that latex could be either a natural or synthetic substance. It was made up of several ingredients, including sugar, which explained Bruno's chocolate requirements for genetic transformation and cohesion. Nevertheless, he still needed more information. I have a few more questions, Professor. 
Hopefully you guys can answer them without violating whatever DOD or DHS confidentiality agreement is keeping your lips tied. Cleesby smirked, but didn't seem upset. Go ahead, I'll answer what I can. So, Bruno is one of these replicas, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so where's the original Bruno? And what about Mary Stinger and the other people he impersonated? Are they walking around somewhere? Excellent question. Some of Bruno's various identities were duplicated from the bodies of people who died. After someone dies, there's a 40-hour window in which we can duplicate them before a complete DNA breakdown occurs. What about the ones who haven't died? Sorry, that's part of an ongoing operation and classified. Lucas exhaled and tucked in a lip, wondering if any more of his questions would be blocked. How do you get access to their remains? We own our own chain of mortuaries, which gives us priority access to the recently deceased. Grim, Lucas thought, but effective. He wondered where else Cleesby might have replicas besides General Alvarez's unit. I understand why you have replicas inside the military, but what about in the government? And positioned throughout various industries, too, I bet. Absolutely, both, though it can take years for one of our replicas to work its way up the chain of command in order to be in a position of influence. Tactically, we have to be very patient and plan far in advance, especially within the appointed branches of government and the armed forces. It's much easier for our replicas to infiltrate the various intelligence agencies or corporations. How do you control the copy? Lucas asked, thinking about Bruno's flying takedown of L a few minutes ago. During replication, we introduce new base coding sequences into his synthetic framework, which allows us to control him. Lucas nodded. It sounded like Cleesby had everything covered. Any more questions? Cleesby asked. Both Lucas and Drew shook their heads. Then we've got work to do, Cleesby said, walking out of the med lab. Bruno, Lucas, and Drew followed the professor into the video room. Status report, Cleesby asked his technicians. Looks like they're getting ready to drop a probe into the Korean energy field, the center tech reported. Put it on the center screen, Cleesby told him. What's up? Lucas asked. There's an energy dome near one of the U.S. military bases in South Korea, Cleesby said, before asking the tech. Can you tap into the telemetry? You can do that? Lucas asked. Yes, the probe's one of ours. One of our subsidiaries manufactures them for Uncle Sam. Lucas was impressed by the breadth of surveillance technology at Cleesby's disposal. His boss was far more than simply a professor turned real estate developer. Lucas figured there were a lot more layers of Cleesby below the surface, just waiting to be revealed. The wall of video screens was filled with live feeds from all over the world, one of which showed an aerial view of the energy field. An Air Force plane flew over the dome and dropped a cylindrical object from its cargo bay. Probe has entered the field, receiving data now, the tech said. So I was right. It can be penetrated through the crown, Lucas mumbled. Bruno nodded, putting a hand on Lucas's shoulder. Well, Cleesby asked the tech. Reading an incredibly dense gravitational eddy at the center of the object, sensors report numerous subspace distortions around a condensed spatial pathway. The vortex seems to be streaming differentially charged tachyon particles. Sounds like an unstable wormhole in an advanced state of decay, Drew said. A self-contained one at that, Lucas added. Can you extrapolate the telemetry and identify where the micro-singularity leads? Cleesby asked. Applying a transvector algorithm, the tech said. Sorry, sir, but I'm unable to determine its endpoint. There seems to be a strange phase shift within space-time. I can't get a lock. Have you heard of anything like this before, Professor? Drew asked. No, this is something entirely new, Cleesby said. He asked the tech. Can you use the new sensors to give me an energy reading before it's crushed? Six times ten to the thirty-first terajoules. Cleesby turned to Drew. That number sound familiar? Seems likely at this point. Probe has stopped transmitting, sir, the tech said. So, let me get this straight. Our E-121 experiment spawned a bunch of artificial wormholes, Lucas asked, dumbfounded by the revelation. Sir, the logs show the probe was scanned several times before it was destroyed by the anomaly, the tech reported. Source, Cleesby asked. It appears to have originated from the far side of the singularity, the tech answered. That means there's some level of intelligence on the other side, Lucas said. Drew turned his wheelchair to face Cleesby. Can we communicate with them, if there is a them, and tell them to stop? Maybe they don't know what kind of damage they're doing. I wish we could, but we don't have that kind of technology. 
Even if we did, I doubt it would make much difference. I don't think the energy fields are here by accident. There's clearly a specific agenda behind them, Cleesby said, just as his cell phone began to ring. He stepped away to answer the call. Lucas whispered in Drew's ear, We could have used Cleesby's sensors to trace the energy spike. I wonder how long they've had them. Drew shrugged. I wonder what else we don't know. There's obviously a lot more to the professor than meets the eye. Now we know where he spends all his cash. Still, this took a load of capital to build, not to mention the ongoing costs to maintain, Drew said. He could have a benefactor, or he's in cahoots with good old Uncle Sam. Cleesby accept help? Or money? Does that sound like the professor we know? No, he likes to fly solo, be the man in charge, Lucas said. Then he must have been at this for a while, probably most of his life, wouldn't you say? Lucas nodded. Cleesby held his hand over the phone's receiver and told the tech, Bring up Gunsan in Korea. Show me the airfield. The tech changed the video feed for the center screen. It was now showing one of the Air Force Base's runways where a black B-2 Spirit stealth bomber was taxiing along the tarmac. The sleek, triangle-shaped aircraft was turning into the wind and was almost ready for takeoff. Damn it, no! Cleesby shouted before continuing with his private phone conversation. Looks like they're going to attempt to collapse the energy field, the tech said. How? Drew asked. By dropping in a big Ivan. Are they nuts? Drew shouted. Bruno tapped Drew on the shoulder. What's a big Ivan? It's a hundred megaton thermonuclear bomb, the biggest ever made, by far. The Soviets were so scared of it, they never actually tested it at full power. Actually, we estimate its yield to be closer to 200 megatons, the tech said. The Russians made a few enhancements to its tertiary to double its effective yield. 200 megatons, Bruno asked. Yes, it's 13,000 times the destructive power of the warhead we dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, Drew replied. Holy shit, Lucas snapped. Drew shook his head. This has virtually no chance of working. It's simply not enough power and will probably make the situation worse. It's like throwing a stick of dynamite into a raging forest fire, hoping the relatively small explosion will snuff out the flames. Unfortunately, the president's science team seems to think it will. Dr. Cleesby's been trying to talk them out of doing this, the tech said. Drew replied, The sudden influx of that amount of radiation in a small contained space will most likely cause a cascading reaction that could exponentially increase the dome's size and destructive power. There's no telling what might happen. Not to mention the lingering effects of nuclear radiation on our planet, Lucas added. Their scientists believe the radiation will be contained within the dome and processed through its vortex, the tech said, potentially killing whoever is on the other side. Drew shook his head adamantly. Why in God's name would they double it to 200 megatons, Bruno said. Pure desperation, Drew answered. I'll bet their physicists ran the numbers and realized their solution was a pipe dream. To overload and destroy a self-sustaining energy vortex of this magnitude would take much more power than we could ever hope to generate. The military could simultaneously drop in every WMD on the planet, and the energy field would only laugh and keep on charging. It's simply not enough power to overload its energy matrix. Leave it to the military to try to blow up whatever they don't understand, Lucas added. Exactly, and it might end up killing us all, Drew replied. How's that? Bruno asked. A 200 megaton blast could conceivably cause a tiny but permanent shift in the Earth's orbit around the sun. It's the very reason the Russians were afraid to test Big Ivan at full power. We're barely inside our sun's habitable zone as it is, and even the slightest change could cause all of us to die a slow, frozen death. Or fry in a microwave oven, Lucas added. When Cleesby returned from his phone call, Drew told him, Professor, we have to stop this. It's too late. Cleesby said, pointing at the video screen. The B-2 bomber was already airborne. What's the target, he asked, looking at the tech. There's a swarm of energy fields on the ground in Seoul, South Korea. Geocode tracking reports the primary target is located at 37.1 degrees north and 127.3 degrees east. Looks like they're going after the largest dome. Distance to the target? 150 miles and closing fast, sir. Show me the ground feed from Seoul. A center monitor changed to show a cross-section view of downtown Seoul. In the foreground, an immense energy dome was eating its way through the center of the city. There were two additional energy fields to its left, though they were much smaller and farther away. This was the first time Lucas had seen multiple energy fields on the ground at the same time. Each was a different size, carving up the city and leaving a network of destruction trails behind. 
It reminded him of the sandy underbelly of his first ant farm experiment. Despite his brother's warnings to the contrary, Lucas could understand why the military was taking decisive action. The spread of energy fields had escalated faster than anyone had predicted, and the world was running out of time. Someone needed to act, and quickly. The one on the left is huge. It's got to be five miles wide, Lucas said, thinking about all the innocent people being killed across the globe. Guilt and remorse wanted to creep into his heart, but he kept them at bay, vowing to stay strong and stay focused. If there was a chance to make any of this right, he'd probably only get one shot at it. That meant keeping emotion out of the equation. It's the most powerful one we've seen so far, the tech replied. It's been on the ground for almost 15 minutes. Can you tighten up on the target? Make sure all digital multi-streams are active and being recorded, Cleesby said. The tech adjusted the feed and the camera zoomed in considerably closer. They had a front row seat to the detonation. 30 seconds, the tech said. The transport has entered stealth mode and is off radar. Lucas wondered why the military chose to deliver Big Ivan from a stealth aircraft. It was unlikely the phenomenon had onboard radar, so why try to conceal its approach? He thought about it for a few seconds and concluded the aircraft's flight crew was just following standard deployment protocols. Most likely, they were required to use stealth mode when live nuclear weapons were being deployed. Pull up the aircraft's onboard feed, Cleesby said. Next to the center monitor, a high-resolution video feed from the underside of the bomber's fuselage appeared, providing a close-up view of the aircraft's target. From above, they could see the energy field chewing its way through the Korean city. The bomber's camera showed the enormous tip of Big Ivan as it was dropped from the plane's cargo bay. Even though the bomb's aerodynamic casing was the size of a small bus, it quickly disappeared from view as gravity guided it toward the energy field at terminal velocity. Sir, the ordinance has been deployed and is approaching the target. A few seconds after Big Ivan entered the dome, a blinding, powerful flash lit up the energy field from deep inside. Right on target, Bruno said. Lucas looked at the other monitor to view the detonation from the ground-level camera. He waited for signs of the detonation to extend beyond the dome's open crest, yet nothing appeared. The anomaly contained the blast, just as the government's scientists predicted. So far, so good, Lucas thought. Maybe the president's scientists were correct. The energy field started to oscillate in color, and the dome began to grow. Its expansion was slow at first. Then, after a few seconds, it picked up steam and grew quickly. The hairs on Lucas's arms stood straight up when the energy field suddenly quadrupled in size and turned a reddish-orange color. Yep, we were right. They just pissed it off, Cleesby said. Lucas assumed his boss was only speaking metaphorically and would never actually believe the energy field was some form of creature. Just then, the dome's perimeter wobbled for a few moments before splitting into two equal halves, like a single-celled organism reproducing through mitosis. Ah, uh, that can't be good. The twin domes started revolving around each other, cutting an even deeper and wider channel into the earth as they moved. The stealth bomber flew off into the distance as the energy fields continued their march across the Korean landscape, moving faster now. That should put an end to the Big Ivan idea, Drew said. And to Seoul, Lucas added with emphasis. How will we know if the Earth's orbit was changed, Bruno asked. We'll have to run a few calculations, Drew answered. Or just wait for the weather patterns to change, Lucas said. Boss, what would you like us to do next, Bruno asked. There's not much we can do right now, Cleesby said. Let's get some shut-eye and start fresh in the morning. Chapter 19 Lucas and Drew rode the elevator down from sublevel 2, where they found Cleesby and Bruno standing together in the middle of the surveillance room. Lucas took the last sip of his soda and tossed the can in the trash bin next to the elevator. Food was pretty good, considering, Drew said. I thought the eggs were a little bland, but the bacon was just the way I like it, extra greasy. Mom didn't seem to like it much. She barely touched her food. I don't think she slept that well last night, being in a new place and all. I'm worried about her. Drew's gaze sharpened. So am I. We should take turns keeping an eye on her. It's what Dad would have wanted. Yeah, for sure. Did you bring the notebook? Lucas asked. Of course. Got it right here in my backpack. You need it? 
Yeah, I think we should show DL your QED equations, Lucas said, as they walked up silently behind Cleesby, who was in the middle of a conversation with Bruno. By the time you get him outfitted, I'll have its location and the rest of the assets in place, Cleesby said. What are the rules of engagement, boss? Bruno asked. Stun only. There better not be any casualties this time. Count on it, sir. Cleesby flashed a glance at Lucas, but didn't say anything. Lucas nodded hello. So did Drew. Lucas turned his attention to the middle row of video screens, which showed activity at three locations he recognized. The first was his apartment complex, where military troops had surrounded the building. A squad of men was approaching the front entrance. The second location was a lengthwise view of his mother's neighborhood. The camera was too far away to see much detail, but Lucas could see soldiers and Humvees lining the street. The third screen contained a high-angle feed, possibly shot from the clock tower of the student union, showing a platoon of men guarding the open shaft leading down to NASA's underground facility. Two soldiers were standing next to the opening, prepping their climbing gear. Cleesby looked at Lucas. It's General Alvarez. He's searching for you. Where? I don't see him, Lucas said, checking the three middle screens. He's outside your apartment, Cleesby answered, turning to his tech. Can you give me a close-up? I want to see who he's talking to. The camera zoomed in on General Alvarez standing near the door to the manager's office, then panned to the right, showing a shorter man with two black eyes and a heavy gauze bandage taped over his nose. That guy's a mess, Lucas said. Must be the guard L overpowered in the desert, Cleesby said, shooting a friendly glance at Lucas. I didn't know you had it in you. Well, technically, neither did I, Lucas replied with a grin. One never knows what one's copy is going to do. Alvarez is never going to stop. Not until you're dead, Bruno told Lucas. In his mind, you killed his daughter. Lucas agreed with Bruno. So what's the plan, Professor? I'm afraid we have no choice. We're going to have to kill you. Lucas wasn't sure what to make of the remark. You're just kidding, right? I'm dead serious. You need to die a horrible public death, or else the general will never stop gunning for you. Follow me. Cleesby used the hidden access panel inside the fire extinguisher to open the secret entrance to the med lab where Trevor was working. Let's get started, Cleesby told Trevor. Trevor retrieved a bucket of biotechs from the shelf and poured it into the middle recess of one of the medical tables. Ah, I understand. You're going to duplicate me again, Lucas said. Precisely, Cleesby said. But what happens when the body dissolves into biotechs? Won't Alvarez realize something fishy is going on? You mean like what happened to D in the desert? Yes, we don't want him getting suspicious. I'm guessing what happened to D's body wasn't part of the plan. No, it wasn't. When Alvarez came for your copies, we had no idea he'd incapacitate them. It's possible the drugs he used compromised the replica's sugar level in some way, Cleesby explained, looking at Bruno like he was waiting for an answer. Bruno nodded. The drugs may have caused D's biosystems to switch into survival mode, to rally against the forced unconsciousness. It would explain the tremendous loss of energy reserves. Which is why he dissolved too quickly, Lucas said. Cleesby nodded. Temperature and humidity can also affect dissolution time, which is normally several hours. This time, we're not taking any chances by letting the general capture you. Instead, he's going to see you die but we're not going to leave any forensic evidence behind. It's going to be more dramatic, and hopefully more effective. But just me? Not Drew, too? From what our inside man told us a short while ago, they think L took off with D's body from the grave. Right now, Drew is dead in their minds, and they're only looking for you, so I'd like to keep it that way. That means Drew doesn't leave this silo, copy or otherwise, Cleesby said in a commanding tone, looking at the men standing around him. Understood? Sure, Professor, whatever you think, Lucas answered. So did the others. Trevor reached above the medical table and lowered a retractable arm with a flat, four-pronged electronic probe attached to its end. A bundle of multicolored wires connected the probe to the retractable arm's housing, which Lucas presumed was used for the programming download. Trevor checked the contents of a four-inch gray plastic tube attached to the side of the electronic probe. The plastic tube resembled a tube of caulk and had a funnel-shaped tip. What's that? Lucas asked. It injects the biotechs with the activating enzyme. Trevor inserted both the electronic probe and the plastic tube tip deep into the surface of the biotechs, then entered a series of commands into a handheld device. 
The area around the probe's submerged tips began to glow like an underwater diver's flashlight, only this one was orange. A minute later, Trevor removed the probe and allowed it to retract to the ceiling. Cleesby grabbed Lucas's right wrist and inserted his hand into the biotex. Lucas held his breath when the viscous substance sent a warm sensation rippling across his skin. He could sense the synthetic being's presence as it smothered his hand and wrapped around his nervous fingers. It felt like a freshly mixed batch of preheated Play-Doh as it seeped into the crevices between his fingers. The pliable material had tremendous strength, squeezing his hand tight and partially restricting the blood flow. The DNA transmission was in full swing. Lucas wondered if parts of his consciousness were being harvested as well. If they were, would it somehow make him less of a human being? While he waited for the process to complete, his mind drifted farther and farther away from the moment. He considered the spiritual implications of the biotech's technology. He was sure certain religious groups would argue that his rightful place in heaven might come into question if he allowed his soul to be transferred to another human being. Others might argue that once his consciousness was downloaded, the synthetic copy should be considered a sentient being and eligible for salvation. Even more compelling was the question of replica dissolution. What would happen if the replica's handlers ordered it to dissolve into an inert state and effectively lose its self-awareness? Would that be considered suicide or perhaps homicide? Drew and Lucas had both been raised to be good Christians by their mother. Dorothy was a devout Catholic, but she never forced her religious beliefs onto other members of the family. She allowed Lucas and Drew to find their own paths and decide for themselves. Faith is a personal journey, she proclaimed. Each of you must find your own path to God. Unlike his brother, Lucas had trouble accepting most of the church's doctrine, feeling as though 90% of the world's population had been tricked into donating their hard-earned money to something that could never be proven or quantified. He believed their fear of mortality was masquerading as blind faith. He didn't begrudge anyone their personal beliefs, however. In truth, sometimes he found himself a little jealous of their convictions. He could see the comfort others found in their religion, but he couldn't bring himself to take the leap. It went against everything he believed in as a trained scientist. Regardless of his own personal views, Lucas had difficulty resolving the conflicting religious and scientific questions raised by the biotech's technology. The more he thought about it, the more his mind fluttered. He'd known a few people who'd taken classes called the Philosophy of Science and seen papers with titles like The Ethical Implications of Cloning. Up until now, he thought it was all a bunch of abstract nonsense and a waste of time. Now he wasn't so sure, but decided it was best to leave the philosophical questions to people with more life experience. Hard science he could handle, but he certainly didn't feel qualified to form solid judgments on such slippery topics. Once his memory and DNA were downloaded, the biotechs released his hand, snapping Lucas back to reality. He stepped away to observe the transformation process. One by one, his features began to appear from within the synthetic ooze lying before him. It was as if he were watching a rendering of a 3D computer-generated model except it was happening in real-world space. Drew asked Cleesby, How long have you guys been developing the mimetic properties? Longer than I care to admit. It's been a long, slow process, but the results have been worth the effort. I should say so, Lucas said, slipping back into his thoughts again. No wonder the professor was never in his apartment. With everything on his plate, when did Cleesby have time to sleep? Between his university duties, his real estate development operation, managing the silo, and developing all this cool new technology, Cleesby must have been stretched pretty thin. It brought the meaning of multitasking to a whole new level. Drew said, I assume you're using nanotechnology to manipulate its synthetic framework, some form of real-time genetic engineering. I'd love to know more about how this amazing material works. Perhaps when we have more time, Cleesby replied, reviewing a batch of paperwork just brought into the room by a video technician. Ten minutes later, the replica sat up on the medical table, turned its head, then spoke to Lucas using his own voice. Hello, I'm Dr. Lucas Ramsey. Pleased to meet you. 
Lucas studied every millimeter of his twin's face, looking for imperfections in the replication process, but found none. Even his jagged scars and dimpled cheeks were duplicated perfectly. The replica smiled at him, sending an eerie tingle down Lucas's spine. Damn impressive, Professor. Nice work, he said to Cleesby, wondering if this copy was more stable than the first. If not, then Bruno would have to tackle this one, too, and put it out of its misery. Can I ask it some questions? Sure, fire away. I'm sure Elle won't mind, Cleesby said. Do you know you're a copy of me? Lucas asked his twin. Sure do. I'm a biotech's duplicate of the single greatest mind on the planet. Drew guffawed, beaming a toothy smile. Oh yeah, that's you all right. My brother, the smartass. Lucas ignored Drew's verbal jab. What was our dad's favorite TV show? The X-Files, his twin answered correctly. Dad had a big crush on Scully, the redhead. What about mom? Mom never watched TV. She preferred to curl up with a good book and a bowl of homemade strawberry ice cream. Right again, but those were simple. Let's try something a bit harder, Lucas said, formulating a trick question. How many girlfriends have you had, and what were their names? We've only had one real girlfriend. Her name was Jill, and she was this smoking hot blonde who lived up the street. We were 14 at the time and spent hours making out in her parents' basement, but she never let us pass second base. Lucas looked at Cleesby and nodded. Then his replica added, However, we did lose our virginity to a 40-year-old librarian named Robin. We did it on the floor of the library. The whole thing lasted about 30 seconds, though. She ran off crying to her car, and we never saw her again. She quit her job the next day and never came. Okay, that's enough. We get the idea, Lucas said, throwing his hands in the air. At that moment, he realized the replica had no real emotions, no shame, and no common sense. Otherwise, he never would have revealed the embarrassing incident with the librarian. And he certainly wouldn't have admitted he was a two-pump chump, especially in front of his boss. He wished he could go back in time and never ask that last question. Well, Cleesby asked, are you convinced? Yes, Elle's memories are intact and accurate, Lucas answered, thinking about the replica's curious use of the pronoun we in his answers. He wondered if it was a conscious effort on the part of the duplicate, or if it was encoded as part of the fabrication process. Maybe it was some type of residual personality trait inherited from him? Too bad he hadn't taken a few psychology classes during his undergrad days. He might have been able to answer that question. Lucas slid two steps backward when the replica jumped down from the table and stood uncomfortably close to him. Listen, L, he said, holding out his hands in a stop position. You might be a perfect copy of me, but I still need you to respect my personal space. Sorry about that, Dr. Ramsey, L replied, moving back two feet. Don't you need to go eat a box of candy bars or something to replenish the sugar supply? Lucas quipped. Bruno, why don't you take L down to outfitting? I'll send the bio updates down when they're ready, Cleesby said. Chapter 20 Replica L followed Bruno into the armory on sublevel 5, where three more soldiers, each one an exact copy of Bruno, were putting on equipment vests and checking their rifles. L felt like he'd just walked onto the set of Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. How many of you are there? Eleven in all, the main Bruno said, like it was no big deal. How do you tell yourselves apart? We can't, and neither can you. That's half the fun of it. Bruno, too, said, stepping aside to allow the other two Bruno copies to leave the armory. I assume the real Bruno is walking around here somewhere? Actually, he died a long time ago. He was one of DL's oldest friends, and the professor's been replicating us ever since, Bruno 1 said, handing L a set of combat fatigues and boots. Here, put these on while I find a vest for you. L let his street clothes dissolve and be replaced by his own skin, then slipped into the pants of the green camouflage uniform. He finished dressing and laced up the heavy black tactical boots. Bruno 1 helped him into an equipment vest. It fit perfectly. Suddenly, L's stomach felt empty and he had an overwhelming craving for cotton candy, which was strange since he hated the sticky treat. Bruno 1 checked the sights of an assault rifle, then handed it to L, along with a metal clip full of ammunition. Go ahead and load the weapon. L flipped the magazine around, inspected its contents, then inserted the open end into the rifle's stock. The motions came naturally to him. 
He knew the original Lucas had never loaded a rifle in his life, but somehow he knew exactly what to do. Curious, he thought, must be part of my mission-specific programming. He forced the clip upward, hearing a ratcheted click. Did I get it right? Yes, perfect. L pressed the release mechanism to discharge the clip, catching it in his other hand. He held up the open end. Why do these bullets have crimped ends instead of a projectile? Because they're blanks. We never use live ammunition unless we're left with no other choice. Won't this be a problem when we have to defend ourselves? We're not authorized to engage until we're fired upon first. And when we do, we're not to harm anyone. Besides, we have other tools at our disposal. Can't we just miss them on purpose? L asked, putting the rifle down on a storage container to his left. Even poorly aimed weapon fire can cause collateral damage, Bruno too said, beating the other Bruno to the answer. Cleesby expects the mission to be carried out to the letter, which means zero casualties, Bruno 1 added. He handed L a semi-automatic M9 Beretta handgun and a magazine full of blanks. Cool, a 9 mil, L said. Bruno 1 reached for his belt line and pulled out his vibrating cell phone to answer it. L rubbed the tips of his fingers over the 9mm's contoured grip and polished barrel, waiting for Bruno 1 to finish his call. He aimed the gun at an empty spot on the wall and imagined what it would feel like to squeeze the trigger and feel the weapon's lethal recoil when the round left the barrel, traveling without thought to its target. He felt invincible with it in his hands, even if it was loaded with blanks. He slid the gun into its holster and flexed his palm and fingers a few times, trying to loosen the soreness inflicted on the real Lucas by the biotechs. He looked at both sides of his hand, wondering why his body was registering pain from something that happened to someone else before he even existed. Had he formed some type of empathic relationship with his donor? He thought about his recent birth, reliving the moments leading up to his creation. He remembered how nervous he was, slipping his hand into the gooey substance right before his viewpoint shifted from the real Lucas to his current self, the copy. He recalled his first thoughts as a replica, sitting up and introducing himself to himself. His head was swimming with vivid childhood memories, all of which now seemed like artificial flashbacks inserted from someone else's life. Despite what his logic was telling him, his memories and emotions were alive and felt absolutely real, yet he knew he was the copy, making the entire experience difficult to process. During man's evolution on Earth, he wondered if there was a single moment in time when an ape's pure instinct for survival evolved into self-awareness, thereby classifying the mammal as a sentient being. Was it an instantaneous change in perspective, or did man's primordial emotions slowly develop and adapt over time? And what about the peripheral, non-essential emotions, like laughter and humility? Did they suddenly manifest, or did they have to be cultivated and learned through complex social interactions with other evolved primates? Maybe it was simply a random convergence of factors that developed out of necessity, or possibly it was nothing more than the inevitable result of an ever-advancing intelligence. Whatever the case, he remembered from his first semester biology class that certain biological traits would persist over time, passing from one generation to another when survival was involved. And those that didn't involve basic instincts, including the fight-or-flight response, would eventually wane and become secondary, sometimes disappearing altogether. He wondered how those genetic tendencies would evolve now that he was a copy of the original. Would his race of biotech's replicas develop their own evolutionary chain of improvements, or would they stay the same from one incarnation to the next? And how would his existence affect the rest of the universe now that he was in it? When he was the real Lucas, he'd studied every facet of Einstein's theory of relativity, pondering the complexities of time fluidity and the twisted paradox of cause and effect. Temporal mechanics would cause a mental meltdown for most graduate students, but like his younger brother, he welcomed its complexities. He knew he wasn't caught in a time loop, but his current reality was distorted and seemed to be governed by a close cousin to cause and effect. His twin consciousness transcended the limits of a single life and a single perspective, 
leaving him as both the real Lucas and the replica, but not both simultaneously. He was the true embodiment of the quantum paradox. He was both the wave and the particle. Much like Schrodinger's cat, the feline who was both alive and dead at the same time, he was a stateless contradiction, living somewhere between the worlds of theory and fact. Perhaps it was more accurate to say he was living somewhere between human and alien. Either way, his existence was difficult to quantify. Then, he realized, as a synthetic being, he had no real family and no home. His life had been rebooted, bringing him back to where it all started. Once again, he was an orphan, whose passions were imprisoned between the margins of fortitude and heartache. L snapped out of his thoughts when he heard Bruno 1 speak into his cell phone and say, Yes, send them down to the armory. L felt a cramp in the middle knuckle of his right hand, which soon spread to the rest of his fingers. His hand turned a scarlet color as it slowly wilted like a water-starved tulip. Hey, Bruno, I need a little help here. Check your pockets, Bruno 1 told him. They're stocked with candy bars and other sugar rations. You need to eat one of them now. Bruno 1 looked at L's hand, and I do mean right now. L inventoried the contents of his pockets and found a five-inch caramel-covered chocolate bar. He tore its plain white wrapper open and consumed the snack in only three bites. Within seconds, a wild rush of energy surged throughout his body, invigorating him. Wow, talk about intense, L said, watching his malformed hand and fingers spring back to life in human form. I take it you were feeling rather hungry just before the deformation began, Bruno 1 asked, not waiting for an answer. Hunger is precursor to reversion and means your sugar reserves are low. If you want to avoid a public spectacle, you should refuel immediately once hunger starts. It's better to stay on top of your sugar intake, though, and make sure you top off every chance you get. Seems rather impractical, L said, pulling out a stale golden sponge cake from the right front pocket of his vest, to have a stop in the middle of whatever we're doing to wolf down a five-year-old Twinkie. L tapped the Twinkie against the metal rifle rack, emitting a loud clang. New replicas take time to build up adequate fuel reserves. In the beginning, you'll only have a short window to refuel, just a few minutes. That's not much time to find sugar. Will it increase? Yes, once your synthetic engine adjusts to your new human metabolism. It's like breaking in a new car, or bringing doses of medication up to a steady state. You need more at the beginning, but eventually your body will give you more advanced notice when reserves are low. L raised his eyebrows while looking at Bruno 1's rotund waistline. I know what you're thinking, the man said, rubbing his belly. I have a lot invested in my rather stout figure, and must be able to go for days without a pit stop. But don't forget, my size is simply an internal volume adjustment, nothing more. I can choose any programmed identity, like skinny little Mary, for example. My external shape has nothing to do with how much onboard fuel I'm carrying. It's more about building up glucose reserves, Bruno too said. Your artificial nanocells need the stored energy to maintain their volatile memory. Without it, they'll suffer a cascade failure and revert to pure biotechs. You mean, I'll collapse into a puddle of red goo? More or less, yes. Wouldn't it make more sense for us to wear a device that acted like a fuel gauge? L asked. With all your advanced technology, I have to believe there's something better than waiting for your stomach to growl, than running to the fridge to scarf down a dozen ding-dongs. Bruno 1 opened one of the corrugated storage boxes stacked in front of the rifle rack and pulled out a pentagon-shaped digital watch. You mean something like this? Bruno 2 pointed to the watch on his right wrist, which was partially camouflaged by his forearm tattoos. We all wear them. They also function as a communication device, a proximity sensor, and a bunch of other cool stuff. We'll teach you about the rest, if and when it becomes necessary. I always wondered about that thing, L said, drawing on the memories of his authentic. He took one of the watches from Bruno 1 and latched it around his wrist. How does it work? Is there a hidden speaker and a microphone somewhere? No, it uses non-linear neuroelectrical connection. As long as you're wearing the device, communications will be delivered through your nervous system and directly into your inner ear. No one else will hear it. To transmit, press the face of the watch and speak normally. Does everyone hear what I'm saying? Won't that be confusing if we're all talking at the same time? 
They're wirelessly networked through a central comm system, which uses artificial intelligence to monitor and deliver communications automatically, so only the intended will hear your comms. Like a smart voice router, L said. Aren't you afraid someone will steal them and reverse engineer the technology? Not possible. They've been encoded with biosensors, allowing them to only be used by our kind. If it loses physical contact with a biotech's replica, the advanced technology inside the watch self-destructs. To a human, it would appear to be just an ordinary watch. So basically, don't take it off your wrist or at Fry's, L said. Correct, unless you turn off the self-destruct mechanism first. Before L could ask about the self-destruct mechanism, a balding, pot-bellied male technician in a lab coat walked into the room. He was carrying an enormous syringe, big enough to scare an elephant. They're here to install tactical programming, Bruno One said. Okay, but where are you going to stick that thing? L asked, worrying about his backside. It looks like Schwarzenegger's forearm. In your left ear canal, the tech reported. That's where your direct neural interface device is located. L pushed the tech away from him. Synthetic copy or not, the injection sounded painful. Are you kidding me? My ear? Don't get near me with that thing. Bruno, is he serious? Yes, it's fine. We do it all the time. You just need to deactivate your pain receptors, the tech said, holding up the probe for insertion. Am I supposed to know how to do that? Bruno, help me out here. Close your eyes, tilt your head back, and concentrate on your ear's cellular structure, Bruno 1 replied. You have the ability to control your shape, which means you can morph any part of your body into gelatinous form. It'll allow you to receive the encoder probe without pain. Like this, Bruno too said, tilting his head back. The side of his head began to lose its shape and consistency, turning a scarlet color. He inserted most of his left hand into the shimmering glob, then withdrew it a second later. See? No pain, he said, while his ear and the side of his head returned to human form. Pretty slick, huh? L was still skeptical, but decided to try to give it a shot. He closed his eyes, tilted his head back, and concentrated on his left ear canal. He thought he might be getting the hang of it when he felt a watery sensation inside his left ear canal, but then his right eye drooped down across his cheek. His vision went askew, and he knew he was in trouble. Dude, your eye, Bruno too said. Oops, my bad, L said, covering the deformity with his right hand. He quickly adjusted his concentration, making his eye return to its normal shape and location. Phew, that's better. This is going to take some practice. You'll get the hang of it. Go ahead, try it again, Bruno 1 said. Only this time, try not to think of anything but your left ear. L took a deep breath, then exhaled a rush of wind across the roof of his mouth. He mumbled quietly. Don't think about your groin. You don't need its contents melting down your leg. Concentrate on your ear canal. You can do this. L continued his efforts and eventually succeeded in converting his left ear to the native biotechs. He was able to hold the semi-liquid state long enough for the technician to insert the probe and complete the 15-second programming update. Okay, you're good to go, the balding tech said. Glad that's over with. It's harder to do than it looks, L said, feeling his ear return to its normal shape. Without thinking, he inserted the tip of his index finger and began to rub the inside of his left ear, making the moisture squeak. He removed his finger and checked it for earwax, realizing his new ability would make removing the water from his ears much easier after his daily shower. Things were looking up, he mused. Gentlemen, it's time to deploy. We have a mission to complete, Bruno One told the group in a commanding voice. L stuffed four extra ammunition clips inside his vest pockets. You can never have enough ammo, even if they're only blanks. You're catching on quick, Doc, Bruno One said. Oh yeah, that's right, I'm a doctor, L said, remembering the day his authentic earned his PhD. See, there are perks to being synthetic. It's not all sugar and goo. L grinned. This is gonna be fun. Lock and load, Bruno Two replied. Bruno 1 escorted L and Bruno 2 up to the ground floor, where Bruno 3 and Bruno 4 were waiting in front of the silo's entrance. Two lumbering tanker trucks with gleaming chrome pipes along their sides and one dark, unmarked sedan with tinted windows pulled up in front of the group. Drew leaned back in his wheelchair to watch the array of video monitors in the surveillance room. 
The screens were filled with energy fields wreaking havoc across London, Moscow, Las Vegas, and New York City. Densely populated neighborhoods and even entire cities were being razed without mercy. He'd seen enough. Lucas, we can't just sit here while thousands of people are being murdered in their homes. I agree, but what can we do? Drew furrowed his brow, pretending not to know the answer to the question he was about to ask. Remind me again, how big was the energy spike in our lab? Six times ten to the thirty-first terajoules, but I'm sure you remember that. Drew's concentration drifted from his brother. He stared straight ahead, at nothing in particular, while the tip of his tongue pushed at his lips, protruding out of the corner of his mouth. His head bobbed like it was ready to join the crowd on a dance floor. Hey, I know that look, Lucas said. Come on, spill it. Assuming we could generate enough energy and then somehow channel it into the dome's vortex, do you think it would be sufficient to destabilize the wormhole? In theory, yes, it might work, but the energy requirement would be huge. What would be your estimate? At a minimum, we'd have to match the energy field's total output. Which is 6 times 10 to the 31st terajoules, same as the E121 energy spike, right? Of course, but where are you going with this? I've been thinking about taking the Big Ivan idea to the next level, Drew said, opening the red and blue theory notebook from his knapsack. Remember those equations I saw the two NASA techs working on when we followed Mary to the conference room? Vaguely. I think you said they had something to do with controlling virtual protons in a quantized field? Exactly, Drew answered, pointing to a set of equations on page 15, with the letters QED written above them. Quantum electrodynamics? Do you remember the tremors in our lab right before E-121 vanished? Sure, but I don't see the connection. What if NASA was running a vacuum energy test at the same time we were running our experiment? It might have caused some type of subspace linkage between the two, amplifying both. A QED amplification conduit, Lucas mumbled, thinking it through. A few seconds later, he nodded when the facts crystallized in his brain. He smiled. You might be onto something. Let's hope so, because I can't stand watching that anymore, he said, pointing at the video feeds. Everywhere he looked, the screens were filled with death and destruction from all across the planet. You and me both, Lucas said, showing a furrowed brow. I'm pretty sure my theory is sound, but the problem will be the power requirements. Do you think it would work, combining ours with NASA's? It's possible, but we should run this by DL. He'll know for sure. Drew followed Lucas to Cleesby's location across the room. Excuse me, Dr. Cleesby, but Drew has an idea you need to hear, Lucas said. Cleesby looked up from the paperwork he was poring over, bringing his eyes to Drew. Okay, shoot. What's up, sport? When we were on NASA's sublevel 20, I saw something in one of the labs. Two techs were standing in front of a grease board, working on a set of equations. I could only see part of their work, but I'm almost positive it had something to do with quantum foam. What's quantum foam? Bruno asked. It's a subatomic storm of creation and destruction that takes place constantly inside empty space, Drew replied. Wait a minute. If it has a storm in it, how can it be empty? The guard asked. The laws of QED say that, on average, the vacuum of space is empty, which means there are other times when empty space isn't empty. It all depends on when you happen to look at or sample the empty space. The storm happens so fast, sometimes you see it and other times you don't. Bruno shrugged and muttered, Um, obviously the information confounded him. Drew tried to dumb it down a little. Think of it like the percolating foam on top of a bubble bath, except it takes place at a subatomic level. The storm is always churning away, creating particles of matter and antimatter, which instantly destroy each other and give off energy. Now, imagine you're in the same bathroom, but it's dark, and all you have is a strobe light that's flashing slowly. If you happen to open your eyes at the same moment the light is on, you'll see the foam creating and destroying virtual particles. If you look when the light is off, you won't see it, even though the foam's still there, doing its thing. Bruno stood there with a puzzled look. Drew continued. The way it works is empty space borrows energy from the future to create one particle of positive mass and one particle of negative mass. When these two particles meet, they annihilate each other and release tremendous amounts of energy. This, in effect, pays back the borrowed energy to the future. This constant creation-destruction cycle is what we call quantum foam. Okay, I think I'm starting to get it, 
Bruno said, rubbing the top of his glistening skull. Lucas added, It's like on Star Trek, when there's a breach in the engine room's antimatter chamber. When matter and antimatter meet, they instantly destroy each other and everything around them. We think this is where all the excess interstellar radiation comes from. Ah, yes. Genes show, Bruno replied, smiling at Cleesby. And why is all this relevant to the situation at hand? Cleesby asked Drew. The night E-121 vanished from the core, we felt powerful underground tremors. If NASA was running a quantum foam experiment at the exact same moment when we fired up our E-121 experiment at full power, then maybe the zero-point energy produced by their experiment was drawn into yours. Like interstellar light being sucked into a black hole, Bruno said with an upturned corner of his mouth. Cleesby continued, moving his eyes from Drew to Lucas. You think NASA's experiment caused the energy spike, a quantum amplification wave of sorts. Yes, sir, we do, Lucas said. And that's not all. Go ahead and tell him, Drew. Professor, I don't think it's purely coincidence these domes are using the same amount of energy as the energy spike. I think they're related in some fashion. We might be able to use the energy produced by NASA's experiment to overload a dome's power matrix and collapse it. How? Not sure. I haven't figured that part out yet. I'll need a better look at those equations and crunch some more numbers. If I can get you back down there, do you think you can show me where you saw those equations? Not a problem. I have the location memorized. How are we going to get past the soldiers? Lucas asked. By killing two birds with one stone, Cleesby said, putting a hand on the shoulder of one of the video techs. Where's the squad right now? Ten miles out, sir, the man reported. Good. Then we still have time. Get them on the horn for me. Chapter 21 Even though the city streets were mostly abandoned, Bruno waited for the green arrow to appear on the traffic signal before turning left onto 22nd Street from Kolb Road. Now only five miles east of campus, he was driving the lead car of their three-vehicle convoy in the rightmost lane, keeping under the posted speed limit. L was to his right, staring out the passenger's window, while two more Bruno copies were directing the lumbering tanker trucks behind him. Bruno's handheld 10-watt Motorola radio squelched from inside the middle console, startling him for a moment. Rabbit, this is base. Do you read? Bruno dug for the two-way radio, taking his eyes off the road. Hey, watch out, L said, snapping out of his trance. One of the tanker trucks blew its horn three times when Bruno's black four-door sedan drifted to the right, nearly hitting the curb. Bruno swerved the car to the left, just missing a newspaper dispenser chained to a light pole. His heart was pumping full steam when he rolled down his window and gave the other Bruno copies a courtesy wave. He picked up the radio and pressed the talk switch. This is Rabbit. I'll read you loud and clear. Over. There's been a change in plans, Cleesby said. I need you to deploy to Checkpoint Alpha. You've got 47 minutes. Roger that. Proceeding to Checkpoint Alpha, Bruno replied, adjusting the angle of the camera mounted to the dash. It was disguised as a portable GPS unit. How's the video feed, sir? We're receiving you five by five. Is L ready for this? I think so, Bruno replied, looking at L. Excellent. Make sure you're not captured. Will do, Chief, Bruno said, before hearing Cleesby's sign off. Are we going to make it there in time? L asked. Yes, if I can keep this thing off the sidewalk. So we're really going to do this? Bruno nodded. We don't have a choice. DL's counting on us. Bruno pressed the transmit button on his radio. Chase one and two. This is Rabbit. Did you guys copy that? We're redeploying to Checkpoint Alpha. You guys continue on with your original mission. Understood, one of the Bruno copies reported. 10-4, the other said. Bruno looked into his rearview mirror as they drove through the next intersection. The tankers behind him slowed down, then turned left, per their instructions. Good luck, guys, he said. What's their ETA? Lucas asked one of the silo's video surveillance techs, keeping his eyes on the video monitor just below the center screen. It was streaming live from the camera mounted on Bruno's dashboard. Approaching the checkpoint now, the tech said. Are the tankers in position? Cleesby asked. Yes, sir. Location confirmed. Go ahead. Call the press. The video screen flickered twice as Bruno's sedan inched forward toward Checkpoint Alpha, which controlled access to the campus from 6th Street. The checkpoint was comprised of two semicircles of sandbags piled four feet high, manned by two National Guardsmen each. 
A red and white colored barricade stretched from one set of sandbags to the other, blocking the street. A Humvee with a roof-mounted machine gun was parked behind the post, in case anyone tried to breach the checkpoint. The wide-angle camera was aimed straight ahead, out over the hood. One of the checkpoint guards disappeared from view as he walked up to the driver's window. Both the miniature U.S. flag mounted on the left side of the hood and the two-star command flag on the right were flapping in the breeze. Here we go, Cleesby said. Too bad we don't have audio, Drew said. If Bruno does his job, we shouldn't need it. The guards will surely recognize his passenger, then take action. A few seconds later, the screen showed Bruno's vehicle backing away from the checkpoint at high speed, providing an underside view of the lower concourse to the university's 58,000-seat stadium to the right. Smoke from its spinning tires hung in the air as the vehicle spun 90 degrees counterclockwise, then accelerated west along 6th Street. ETA to the tunnel, Cleesby asked. Four minutes. Lucas checked the video feed monitoring the open stairwell shaft above NASA's bunker and the one in front of his apartment complex. The soldiers guarding both locations took off running, scrambling away from their posts. Excellent. The chase is on. What about my mom's house? Drew asked. The tech changed one of the other monitors to show Dorothy's neighborhood. The soldiers were no longer positioned along her street. Wow, better than we hoped. Looks like they all got the message, Lucas said. What's the lead separation? Cleesby asked his man. Two minutes, sir. That's too close. Notify the tankers and show me the tunnel feed. The center screen switched to a lengthwise view of a two-lane road. The camera was mounted deep inside a tunnel whose surface had been desecrated by a blanket of brightly colored graffiti. Two military tankers were sitting at the far end of the tunnel, just outside the entrance, parked on opposite sides of the street. Clouds of white and blue smoke were puffing out of their tailpipes. Can you zoom in? Drew asked. I can't see Bruno's car. He'll arrive in a moment, the tech answered, not changing the camera's focus. ETA to the flashpoint, Cleesby asked. 27 minutes, sir. Cutting it a little close, don't you think? Lucas asked his boss. Unless something unexpected happens, we should be fine. Are the big rigs in place? Ready and waiting, sir, the tech answered. There are the tankers. Looks like we're a go, Bruno told L, checking the sedan's jittery rearview mirror. The swarm of vehicles chasing him was growing larger in the reflection. Dude, the access ramp is coming up fast, L said, tightening his seatbelt before gripping the top of the dashboard with both hands. Bruno waved to his brethren as the sedan blurred past the waiting tankers. He eased off on the gas pedal, preparing for a sharp left turn once they cleared the thousand-foot tunnel. I sure hope this works, L said. It should. There's no other way onto the interstate from here. They have to come this way. Bruno's mirror showed the tankers pulling their front bumpers together, blocking his view of the oncoming procession. Bruno changed lanes and flipped on his left turn signal. A blinker? Really? Now? L asked. Sorry, old habit, Bruno said after a short chuckle. He turned off the blinker and peeked again into his rearview mirror. All he could see were the tankers blocking the tunnel entrance. As his sedan turned left and approached the incline to the freeway, Bruno looked to his left. The two Bruno replicas were standing together just inside the tunnel's entrance, on his side of the tanker trucks. Thanks for the help, guys, he told them on the radio. Good luck and Godspeed, one of the Bruno copies replied. How many Bruno copies are there? Lucas asked Cleesby when the video feed showed two of them standing together just inside the tunnel entrance. Eleven in all. Couldn't afford an even dozen? Lucas joked. The video tech laughed. Cleesby sneered at him. Sir, the sedan's made it onto the freeway and is headed south, the tech said. Give Bruno two the go-ahead. The screen showed one of the Bruno replicas attaching a tan-colored object to the rear section of both tanker trucks. C4, Lucas asked his boss. Something like that. I know you want to delay the soldiers, but won't that take out the tunnel completely? It shouldn't. We only partially filled the tankers. But if it does, there's always the news helicopter, Cleesby said, pointing to the upper right screen. A circling aerial view showed the tankers facing each other outside the tunnel's entrance. Oh, so that's why you had them call the press, Lucas replied, nodding to applaud Cleesby's strategy. Smart. I try, Cleesby grunted. Lucas looked at the tunnel feed just in time to see the two Brunos crowd together, then vanish from sight. The tankers exploded into a billowing cloud of smoke and fire. Where'd they go? Lucas asked, not trusting what his eyes had just seen. Nowhere. They're still right there, the tech replied. Well, sort of. 
Are they using some kind of personal cloaking device? Cleesby shook his head. It wouldn't have protected them when the trucks exploded. Then what happened, Professor? They slipped into an interdimensional rift in subspace. They did what? Cleesby motioned for one of his video techs to join him. The professor grabbed hold of the tech's forearm, just above the man's watch, and held the arm close to Lucas's face. I've seen Bruno wearing that same watch, Lucas said. Well, it does a lot more than just tell time, Cleesby said. It contains a subspace rift regulator that the wearer can use to hide inside a subspace flap. That's where the two Brunos are right now, waiting for the area to clear. They're perfectly safe. Unreal. Lucas smirked. What else don't we know? Cleesby didn't respond. Lucas wasn't surprised. He fiddled with the orange buttons around the perimeter of the tech's device. Can you show me how this thing works? Cleesby nodded to the tech before returning his eyes to the video screens. The tech put his watch hand on Lucas's shoulder, then pressed a combination of buttons on the device with his other hand. A moment later, Lucas was standing in a dark space, wishing he'd brought a winter coat and flashlight with him. The only thing he could see was the glow of the tech's watch to his left. He extended his hands and tried to walk forward, but couldn't move. He felt like he was trapped inside a locked refrigerator with the light off. Why is it pitch black in here? There's no light source in subspace, the tech said with a patronizingly superior attitude. Lucas felt like an idiot for asking such a stupid question. Of course there was no light in subspace. Stars only existed in normal space. Right, I get it, we're in subspace. But where, exactly? We're inside a subspace bubble that's straddling the interconnecting membrane between two parallel universes. It's like an envelope wedged into a door jam. Which explains why we can't move. We must be in some kind of force field that's protecting us from the intense gravimetric forces inside the linkage. Correct. If the two Bruno copies are hiding in one of these right now, how will they know when it's safe to return to normal space? Our watches contain a proximity sensor, the tech said, holding the timepiece in front of Lucas's eyes. He pressed a pair of buttons simultaneously, illuminating a wireframe representation of the surveillance room on the watch face. Two red blips were in the center, with a single red dot to the left. I take it we're the two in the middle, and the other one is Dr. Cleesby? Yes, and the diagonal row shows my co-workers sitting at their stations. Lucas thought about calling out to Drew as a joke, but decided against it. The tech didn't appear to have much of a sense of humor. Can you take us back now? The tech pressed a few more buttons on the device, instantly returning them to normal space. Enjoy the trip, Cleesby asked. That was pretty cool, I have to admit, Lucas replied, feeling a tad woozy. He rubbed his hands together to get the blood flowing again. What was it like, Drew asked. Dark and cold. I felt like a shrink-wrapped sausage in there. Did it hurt? Nope, Lucas replied, flexing his fingers as if he were playing the piano. You should give it a try, little brother. No thanks, I'll pass. I like regular space just fine. Did you guys develop this technology? Lucas asked the professor. We did, Cleesby nodded. Besides biotechs, it's one of our most useful inventions. That's an understatement. James Bond would have had a field day with that thing. So when do I get one? These watches have sensors that only allow our kind to initiate a subspace rift, the tech replied. So you're a replica too? As a matter of fact, I am. But that's not... Gentlemen, we don't have time for this, Cleesby said, pointing up at the screens. The news helicopter was tracking Bruno's sedan from the air. The military chase vehicles, led by the Humvee with the mounted machine gun from the checkpoint, had cleared a path through the tanker explosion and entered the tunnel. They were turning left onto the access ramp leading up to the freeway. What's the separation? Cleesby asked. Ten miles. Do you want to deploy the semis? Let's wait and see. We may not need them. Bruno whizzed past a pair of 18-wheelers parked on the freeway's shoulder. Can you see Alvarez back there? L climbed into the back seat and looked out the rear window. No, the only thing I see is a helicopter following us. I think it's one of Channel 13's. Good. Then we probably won't need the semis to slow them down, Bruno replied, raising the handheld radio to his mouth. Base, this is Rabbit. Do you read? The radio squelched. Rabbit, this is Base. We read you loud and clear. I'm five miles from the primary flashpoint, awaiting final instructions. Increase speed to 77 miles per hour and maintain course. Acknowledged. Setting cruise control to 77. So that's it? We just drive straight ahead? What'd you expect? I thought I'd at least get to fire my weapon before we die, L said, holding the rifle in a firing position out of the right rear window. But they're only blanks. 
I know, but still it would have been a blast to shoot it. Go ahead, let her rip. Seriously? Sure, why not? Just don't unload the entire clip. It's going to be loud. On the video feed, Lucas saw a long, slender black cylinder poke out of the sedan's right rear window. What's that? In the window, he asked Cleesby's tech. Looks like a gun barrel, and someone's shooting it. Is there any way to adjust the camera so we can see what they're shooting at? Lucas asked the tech. I tried, but the servos aren't responding. It's probably nothing, Cleesby said. The chase vehicles are out of range, and there's nothing else on the road other than our big rigs. Lucas thought for a moment, then realized what was happening. I must be blowing off a few rounds, Lucas said, smiling proudly. Sounds about right, Drew said in a matter-of-fact way. Lucas scowled at his brother. Like you'd do any different. No red-blooded American male in Arizona would ever pass up a chance like that. Drew shrugged. Hey, whatever floats your boat. One minute, thirty seconds, sir, the tech said. Show me the horse track in Green Valley, Cleesby said. The upper left screen changed to show a wide-angle landscape view of the northern edge of Green Valley. A sprawling mountain range cut across the upper section of the screen. The rugged brown ridges and valleys were dotted with jagged rock formations. The mountains faded to black in the far distance, serving as a backdrop for a towering cement plant in the foreground. In between the cement plant and the track's parking lot was flat, open desert. The desolate landscape was dotted with half-wilted bushes and saguara cacti. Winter wasn't a beautiful season in the desert, turning the greens pale and dry. The right edge of the screen was filled with a sea of orange-tiled roofs, packed together like war protesters storming the White House gates. The line of houses clearly marked where nature met civilization. Is that the best angle you have? Cleesby asked. The tech nodded. The bottom of the screen contained a section of the track's lower grandstands. Look at all the paper, Lucas said, seeing thousands of tiny strips of white paper littering the track's infield and seats. A short minute later, Lucas asked, Where should we see it? Just on the other side of the cement plant, the tech answered, along the freeway's access road. Right on cue, a bright flash filled the racetrack security feed, just beyond the cement factory. Moments later, the flash dissolved, leaving behind an energy dome exactly where the tech had predicted. Nice work, Cleesby said, patting the tech on the back. Looks like our team planted just the right amount of bait. Lucas wasn't sure what they were talking about, but decided to wait until later to ask when Cleesby wasn't as busy. The news helicopter circled around, pointing its high-altitude camera at the massive dome, which was now moving away from the cement plant, traveling south. It engulfed all six lanes of the interstate. Bruno's dark sedan slid sideways, careening out of control. It left a trail of smoke and skid marks before its inertia carried it into the northern edge of the energy field. The helicopter flew over the dome, allowing the camera to capture Bruno's sedan whipping around. The sedan was shredded into chunks of metal, glass, rubber, and plastic car debris and sucked through the vortex. And then there were ten, Lucas mumbled, thinking of his security friend. The helicopter swung around to show Alvarez's convoy approaching at high speed from the north, while the energy field continued its southerly trek toward the Green Valley retirement community. Do you think they bought it? Drew asked. We'll know soon enough, Cleesby said. Chapter 22 Are you two ready for a road trip? Cleesby asked Lucas and Drew. More than ready, Professor, Drew answered, sliding the theory notebook into the zippered pouch of his knapsack. But we need to check on Mom before we leave. I thought you might want to do that, he said to Drew. Inform the security team we'll be up in ten. Make sure they bring the climbing gear, he told all the techs. Lucas turned and asked Cleesby, have you figured out how we're going to get past the soldiers guarding the hole down to the QED lab? Cleesby stared at the video screens for a few seconds, then turned to face his lead tech. Twins ought to do it. The tech picked up one of the three phones sitting on his console desk. Who do you want me to send? Seven and eight. But make it clear I want them to use stunners only. Got it, boss, the tech replied, with the phone's receiver plastered against his right ear. Twins? Lucas asked. Cleesby smiled. A pair of young, beautiful women should be hard to resist, wouldn't you agree? Lucas figured Cleesby was going to use the twins as some form of distraction, but he wasn't sure how. 
Cleesby's matter-of-fact tone gave him the impression that the professor expected him to put the pieces together on his own, and he certainly didn't want to disappoint his boss. Great idea, professor. Using twins sounds perfect. Cleesby opened a yellow travel bag sitting on an unoccupied section of the video control desk. Did you remember the boosters? Cleesby asked the tech. Yes, sir. They're in here. Excellent. Cleesby flung the tote bag over his shoulder. We should pick up some bottled water on the way up. Forty-five minutes later, Lucas got out of the Humvee and followed behind Cleesby as the man inched his way along the outside of the math building toward its southwest corner. Cleesby gave his crutches to Lucas, then pressed his back against the red-bricked wall of the structure. He peeked carefully around the corner. Ten seconds later, he turned and whispered to Lucas, Seven and eight are pulling up now. Let's hope this works. Lucas looked back at Drew, who was sitting in the rear passenger seat of the truck they'd used to travel to campus from the silo. One of Cleesby's armed security guards was standing near the Humvee's bumper-mounted winch, looking directly at Lucas. He was starting to lose track of who was authentic and who was a replica, with multiple copies of nearly everyone in Cleesby's crew running around. Lucas was fairly certain the guard was a replica, but couldn't be sure. The silo's senior lab tech, who definitely was a replica because he'd introduced himself as one, was sitting in the driver's seat with his hands wrapped around the steering wheel. Lucas gave his brother and the other two men a thumbs-up signal. Lucas crouched behind the professor and leaned slowly to his left. He could see four soldiers in combat uniforms only a few hundred feet away from him. They were clustered together just to the left of the open shaft leading down to the underground NASA bunker. One of the soldiers was doing all the talking. He paused for a moment, and then suddenly the entire squad erupted into a collective laugh. Figures, Lucas thought. Leave it to the military to waste resources guarding an open pit, especially when the rest of campus and most of Tucson had been deserted. If he were in charge, he would have boarded up the hole and called it a day. A blue minivan with a heavily tinted rear window squealed around the corner and approached the soldiers from the west. Country music blared from its wide-open side windows, and two blonde-haired women sat in the front seat. The vehicle swerved across the center stripe and came to a skidding stop with the front wheels on the sidewalk about 50 feet from the soldier's position. Lucas could see strands of blonde locks flapping across the girls' faces as the stiff, southerly breeze riffled through the van. The two girls, exact copies of Cleesby's beautiful assistant, Mary Stinger, stumbled out of the van, laughing and whooping. They wore faded blue jean cutoff shorts and skin-tight white tops that accentuated their identical figures. A moment later, they leaned against the hood of the van and giggled loudly, passing a bottle of alcohol between them. Cleesby winked at Lucas. Wild turkey, Bruno's favorite. The four soldiers, now standing side by side and facing the girls, looked like they'd been struck dumb. None of them moved or said anything. They stood there like horny statues, staring at the twins with their mouths drooling. Lucas realized Cleesby was right. A pair of twins would be a major distraction, especially a pair of hot, drunk twins dressed like Hooters girls. The squad of testosterone-charged soldiers didn't stand a chance. At least I'm not the only one to fall for that one, Lucas mumbled under his breath, thinking about Bruno's sexy alter ego who he'd been lusting after during his stint on Cleesby's team. The driver, Mary One, leaned her butt against the driver's door and waved at the soldiers. Hey, ya boys, she called out. You guys want a party? All four soldiers remained silent, puffing their chests out and smiling. Mary One remained by the vehicle, while Mary Two walked erratically toward the men, swinging her hips almost as wildly as her arms. Halfway into her journey, her ankle rolled over, and she fell to the ground, laughing like a drunk college co-ed. All of the soldiers slung their rifles and left their guard position, sprinting to her rescue. They encircled the girl, showering her with attention. "'Works every time,' Cleesby whispered to Lucas. "'Damsel in distress.' Sexy ones at that, Lucas added. While the men were focused on her sister, Mary One reached into the driver's seat, pulled out a stunner, then snuck up to the soldiers caring for Mary Two. 
She fired the weapon several times, striking each one of the men in succession, sending them limp to the ground. One of the blasts hit Mary too, but she seemed unaffected. Lucas figured Biotech's replicas were immune to electrocution, probably due to their latex substructure. Mary One turned back to face Cleesby and let out a shrieking whistle with two fingers inserted into the corners of her mouth. There's our cue, Cleesby said, grabbing his crutches from Lucas. Why don't you go see if Seven and Eight need any help getting the soldiers into the van? Then we'll head down below and see what's what. Lucas watched the drunken killer twins morph from a pair of Marys into a pair of Brunos. He knew they were just Biotech's replicas, but he was still sad to see them go. Hot was hot, synthetic or not. Fifteen minutes later, Lucas unclipped the rigging harness from his chest after being lowered by rope into the open pit that used to be NASA's elevator shaft. The shaft was musty and dark, already starting to smell like mold. He heard the drip, drip, drip of water echoing from below and hoped a sewage line hadn't broken somewhere. He didn't like the idea of trudging through raw wastewater. Billy Ray, the lab tech who'd preceded him into the shaft, took hold of the harness and rope after Lucas slid out of the gear. Lucas looked up from sublevel 18 and threw a swirling column of dust particles. He gave Cleesby a thumbs-up signal. All clear, he shouted at the professor. Soon, he heard the motorized grind of the bumper-mounted electric winch hoisting the gear back to the surface. Now it was Drew's turn. First, his folded wheelchair came down the shaft, followed by Drew, who was carrying the professor's crutches and a yellow travel bag. Lucas gave Cleesby's items to Billy Ray, then helped Drew into the wheelchair. After the harness made the steady climb back to the surface, Cleesby slipped on the gear next and started his descent. Lucas decided to take a step back to allow more room for the professor to land, but his heel caught the edge of a cement chunk behind him. He grabbed onto Drew's shoulder to keep from falling backward into the debris. Shit, that was close, Lucas said, flexing his ankle to check its condition. They could have done a better job with the cleanup down here. He felt fortunate, though, not to have injured himself more seriously. It was slightly tender, but the pain was manageable. He still needed to carry Drew down the stairs to the 20th sublevel, which would be impossible with any kind of serious ankle injury. His legs were still recovering from carrying Drew up those same stairs, and the last thing he needed was a bum ankle, or any other physical problem for that matter. With the hospitals evacuated, he wouldn't be able to run to the emergency room for medical attention. Everything in the world had changed thanks to the energy domes wreaking havoc across the planet. At least, that was the situation for now, assuming he and Drew would be able to set things right with a little assistance from the professor and his team. How's your leg doing? Lucas asked Drew after seeing a blood stain on the stairway. He assumed the redness was from the gash in Drew's thigh, the injury he'd received while sliding down the debris pile during their escape. I don't know. I can't feel a thing. That's good, I guess, Lucas said. But we need to clean and redress your bandage when we get back to the silo. Now that the hospitals are closed, we can't take the chance it gets infected. Drew nodded and wrinkled his nose, but didn't respond. Lucas unclipped Cleesby's safety harness once the professor's feet were firmly planted on the stairwell's landing. Drew handed the crutches to Cleesby, which the professor promptly handed to Lucas. You'll need to carry those down for me. Lucas groaned silently, realizing he and Billy Ray were the only able-bodied men present. They'd have to do all the heavy work from here on out, meaning he needed to prepare himself and suck it up. His friends needed his help, and so did the rest of the world. Sure, Professor, not a problem, he said, holding the crutches aside while Drew climbed on his back, piggyback style. Drew had the knapsack strapped to his back, which contained several bottles of water, plus the theory notebook and a smattering of writing supplies. Cleesby picked up his yellow tote bag and put his arms through the two straps, hoisting it across his back. At least Lucas didn't have to carry the sack, too. Any more weight, and he'd never make it down in one piece. When Billy Ray started down the stairs, empty-handed, Lucas said, Dude, can you help me out here? Lucas pointed to Drew's wheelchair, which was leaning against the cement wall. Oops, sorry about that, Billy Ray answered. My mind's focused elsewhere. No problem. Lucas stood still and waited for Cleesby to head down first, holding on to the handrail as he hobbled his way down each step. 
Unless the professor was in better shape than he looked, Lucas knew the journey was going to be slow and painful for everyone. And he was right. It took just short of an hour to reach the landing on sublevel 20. Cleesby unhitched the yellow bag and sat down on the bottom step when they arrived at their destination. Lucas's lower back was screaming for a break, so he leaned the crutches against the wall and bent down to let Drew slide off. Drew sat on the step next to the professor. Billy Ray unfolded the wheelchair and helped him into his seat. Where's that water? Lucas asked. Drew opened his backpack and gave him a bottle. Lucas twisted off the plastic cap and chugged it down, barely stopping to swallow. Hand me another, he said, tossing the empty bottle into the corner. The water was lukewarm, but he didn't care. All that mattered was it contained something wet and soothing. He took his time with the second bottle, savoring every sip, while sweat continued to trickle from his scalp and down his neck. A few minutes later, the bottle was almost empty. You about ready? Cleesby asked, after standing up and sliding the crutches under his armpits. Lucas tipped the bottom of the bottle above his head to drain the last few drops into his mouth. He tapped the end of the bottle twice, then answered, Yep, I'm good. Lead the way, Cleesby told Drew. It's the fifth door on the right, Drew said, rolling his wheelchair forward. Cleesby followed him, but without his yellow bag, which was still sitting on the floor. Lucas assumed the professor had left it behind on purpose, perhaps because Cleesby was pissed at him for making everyone wait while he enjoyed his water break. Lucas slung the bag over his shoulder and followed behind the rest of the group. He kept turning around to check behind him, feeling like he was forgetting something, but he couldn't figure out what. He figured it must have been his imagination. It had already been a long day, and he was getting tired. The professor's bag weighed about five pounds and was heavier at one end, making it awkward to carry. As Lucas walked, something inside the bag, possibly metal, clanked with each step. He was even more impressed with Cleesby's strength and agility for having carried the tote bag down the stairs, broken ankle and all. Drew counted out the lab door as they passed. Three, four, five. This is it, the QED lab. Drew pulled at the closed lab door, but it didn't open. There was a security keypad next to the door with a horizontal card slot along the top of it. Cleesby stepped in front of Drew, then took the tote bag from Lucas. He opened it and removed a handheld electronic device with a credit card-sized keycard tethered to it by a ribbon-style communication cable. He inserted the card into the slot and began entering commands into the device. The professor tried multiple times to breach the door's security system, but his device wasn't working. Eventually, Lucas grew impatient with Cleesby's futile efforts. Do you mind if I give it a try, professor? Cleesby held out the device in one hand, but Lucas didn't take it from him. No thanks, I have a better idea. I need you to step back. Cleesby moved out of the way, allowing Lucas to take a running leap with his feet aimed at the door just to the left of its handle. His heels made contact, bending the metal frame inward slightly, but the door remained shut. When he hit the floor, he landed on his right hip, sending shooting pains from his waistline down to his ankles. He gasped from the pain. Fuck, that hurt, he said, squirming on the ground. Billy Ray extended his hand to Lucas. Need a hand, Dr. Ramsey, he said in a thick southern drawl. Lucas gripped the tech's hand, allowing the man to pull him up off the floor. Maybe we should try it together, Billy Ray asked. Good idea, Lucas said with discomfort in his voice. He rubbed his hand over his sore hip before taking two steps back from the door. Go on three. Sure, you count it out. Lucas counted to three and they coordinated the assault on the door. A section of the metal door frame broke loose and flew across the lab as the door flung open with a loud metallic screech, smashing its handle into the wall on the far side. Sometimes brute force is the only way to fly, Lucas said with pride, walking into the QED lab with a fading limp. Three freestanding grease boards were stacked along the right wall. Their clear surfaces were covered in mathematical equations written in both red and blue marker ink. Are those the equations you saw? Cleesby asked Drew. Yes, Drew said, pushing his wheelchair toward them. Looks like they're out of sequence, Lucas said, bringing the mobile boards together end to end. He stood back to garner a better view of the mathematics. I think you should put the last one first and then swap the middle one to the end, Drew said. Yeah, now I'm thinking, Lucas said with a smirk on his lips. 
rearranging the boards, as his brother suggested. Definitely some form of energy extraction from subspace, Drew said. They appear to be incomplete, Cleesby said, looking around the room. Not only that, their cascade variants are all wrong, Drew said, shaking his head. I'm surprised this worked at all. Just more of our hard-earned tax dollars being flushed down the toilet, Cleesby said. They should have hired us to do it. We're probably a shitload cheaper than these guys, Lucas said. And you would have gotten it done right, Cleesby said, smiling at Drew. The professor put his free hand on Drew's shoulder. What do you think, sport? Between the two of us, we should be able to finish these equations. It might take a while to fix their work, but it's doable, Drew said, pulling out a yellow pad and pencil from his backpack. Cleesby told Lucas and Billy Ray, Why don't you two look around to see if there's any paperwork or notes lying around? Maybe there's something that'll shed some light on the missing calculations. Lucas and Billy Ray began searching the lab, starting with the tallest storage cabinets built into the wall to the right of the entrance door. Lucas opened the double doors and found five shelves crammed full of manila file folders. Each folder had a date written on its index tab. The files were sorted in chronological order, starting five years ago. He peeked inside a few of them, but only found hand-scribbled notes on legal-sized sheets of paper. He didn't see any calculations. He tried to read the notes, but the penmanship was horrible. Shit, I thought my writing was bad. This guy must have been an ER doc in a former life. He checked a dozen more folders, but still didn't find any calculations. He moved on to the next cabinet, sifting through the disorganized stack of equipment stored in the next cabinet, when he heard footsteps coming from outside the lab's open door. Shh, he told Billy Ray, who was humming an old country tune. Lucas pointed at his right ear, then at the open door. Billy Ray nodded. Lucas was a good twenty feet from Cleesby and Drew, who were working together in front of the grease boards. Cleesby was closest to him, standing to Drew's left, sucking on one of his unlit cigars. Lucas used a short, low-pitched whistle to get their attention. Cleesby turned first, then Drew. Lucas pointed at the door, then held up a finger to his lips. Both men nodded. Lucas initially thought the footsteps might belong to Cleesby's security guard on the surface, but dismissed the idea when he heard a faint ratcheting noise, the unmistakable sound of someone cocking a gun. Then he heard the jiggle of door handles, each rattle separated by a couple of footsteps. The sounds were getting progressively closer, making Lucas realize the person in the hall was still a few doors away. He figured he had enough time to close and lock the lab door before the stranger arrived, so he inched the entrance door closed, trying not to make a sound. Before it closed, he turned the handle to retract the latch, hoping it would quietly slide back into place when he released pressure on the mechanism. He was able to silently close the door and let go of the handle, but the door latch wouldn't engage because of the damage caused during the break-in. Lucas backed away from the door and crouched down with his back against the storage cabinet. He opened the left cabinet door for additional cover and leaned in, using one eye to peer through the gap in the door jam. Next to the lab door was a fire extinguisher, which he intended to use as a blunt force weapon once the stranger entered the room and had moved past him. He just needed to time his attack properly. Part of him was amazed at how comfortable he was with the idea of bashing someone's brains in with a fire extinguisher. Until recently, violence wasn't a big part of his life. Now, it seemed like violence was waiting for him around every turn. He pushed those thoughts aside and prepared to spring into action. Billy Ray wrapped his calloused fingers around Lucas's left bicep, and then, suddenly, the two of them were in a cocoon of darkness. A damn subspace rift! Shit, Lucas thought. I can't help Drew while I'm stuck in here. What the hell? Take me back, Lucas yelled into the darkness. My brother! Not until it's safe to return. I have my orders, Billy Ray said. I don't care if it's safe or not. Take me back! Sorry, not gonna happen. Not till it's safe. And when will that be? When my proximity sensor tells us the coast is clear, Billy Ray answered, holding his glowing watch face out in front of Lucas where he could see it. The device contained a wireframe floor plan of the QED lab, with a pair of red blips in the top left corner and two more blips in the middle. A slow-moving single dot was approaching from the right. Look, there's only one guy. It'll be easy for the two of us to take him out, Lucas said, pointing to the moving blip. I told you before, not until the area is clear. We have to help them, Lucas said. Give me that thing. 
He tried to tear the watch from Billy Ray's wrist, but failed. I'm the only one who can operate it, Billy Ray said, keeping the watch out of Lucas's reach. If you take this off me, the subspace rift will collapse and kill us both. Cleesby looked around for his yellow bag and saw it sitting on the floor next to the wall, too far away to be of any use. When the lab door opened, Randall Larson from the advisory committee walked in with a revolver pointed at him. Cleesby, still leaning on crutches, raised his hands partway above his head. Any higher, and he'd fall over. Drew quickly followed suit. You really should have stationed more than one guard by your winch, Larson said, pointing the gun initially at Cleesby's chest, then at Drew. He curled his upper lip in an arrogant sneer, showing his teeth like an angry dog. I was told you were dead. Drew shrugged, pushing his hands even higher over his head. What do you want, Larson? Cleesby asked. Where's the other one? Who? Don't try to play me. Unlike my idiot brother-in-law, I didn't buy that whole campus escape to Green Valley. Not for one goddamn second. I'm sure you used the explosion as a diversion, switching cars in the tunnel. Larson pointed the gun back at Cleesby. Tell me where he is, or so help me God, I'll put a bullet in you. He's not here, Drew replied, before Cleesby could stop him from answering. Bullshit. I'm telling you the truth. I doubt it. From what I've heard, you two never go anywhere alone. Go ahead and search if you like. You'll never find him, Drew said. We'll see about that, Larson said, pulling out his cell phone. You won't get a signal down here, Cleesby said. Then I'll just call Raphael from the surface. I'm sure it won't take his men long to find Lucas, Larson said, jerking the gun toward the door. Let's go. Cleesby followed Drew out the door, with Larson trailing behind. Okay, it's safe to return, Billy Ray said, pressing a series of orange buttons on his watch. A split second later, the two of them were back in the QED lab, standing beside the open cabinet door. Lucas motioned for Billy Ray to follow him to the lab door, where he leaned around the corner to spy down the hallway. Drew and Cleesby were about thirty feet away, with their backs to him. Cleesby limped slowly along on his crutches, and Drew rolled next to him in his wheelchair. They were followed by a slender man with blonde hair who was holding a gun and waving it around as he walked, acting as if he wanted his captives to move faster. Cleesby, with his injury, was forcing the group to move slowly, and it didn't appear the gunman was too happy about it. When they turned the corner at the end of the hall, Lucas recognized the gunman. Larson, he whispered. How the hell? He turned to Billy Ray and said, We have to rescue them. How? We'll have to improvise, Lucas replied, unhooking the three-foot-long fire extinguisher from the wall. Sorry, but I'm not trained for this, Billy Ray said, touching the buttons on his watch. The tech slipped back into the subspace rift. Are you kidding me? Lucas said in a whisper to the heavens, as if the tech could somehow hear him. Damn it, Billy Ray, I really need your help. He waited a few seconds, but the man never returned. He couldn't wait any longer. It was time to get moving before he lost track of his friends. Lucas balanced the fire extinguisher on his right hip as he jogged down the hallway. Once he caught up to the gunman escorting his brother and Cleesby, he slowed his pace and crept along the walls to keep out of sight until he was ready to strike. He wondered what Larson's plan was once they reached the stairwell. There was no way Drew was going to be able to climb the stairs by himself. Did Larson expect Cleesby to carry him, or was Larson going to? It didn't make sense, but then again, maybe Larson hadn't thought it all the way through. The opportunity Lucas was waiting for presented itself when he was only ten feet behind Larson. As the trio neared the seating lounge next to the mangled elevator, Lucas spotted a long decorative planter wall that ended at a four-foot-wide cement column ahead on the right. If he could get to the other side of the column undetected, he might be able to get the drop on Larson. While Larson was moving slowly behind his captives and focused on them, Lucas snuck around to the right, bent over, and crept behind the half wall, moving quickly to the far side of the cement pillar. He visualized Larson's speed and angle down the hallway, calculating the timing of his next move. He chose to wait for a three-count, then stepped out and swung the fire extinguisher as hard as he could. The canister caught the right side of Larson's head, making a loud metal clanking sound. 
The attorney was sent flying across the hallway, and so was the gun he was holding. It jettisoned out of Larson's hand, landing several feet away from him. Luckily for everyone, it didn't fire. Take that, you asshole, Lucas hissed in controlled anger, standing over Larson's motionless body. Damn it, Lucas! I didn't want anyone hurt, Cleesby yelled. Sorry, Professor, but I couldn't just let him haul you away to God knows where. Lucas put the dented fire extinguisher on the ground. I had to do something. Yes, I understand, but you didn't have to do this. I had the situation under control. Not from what I could tell, Lucas replied, wondering what his boss meant. It looked like you were being led away at gunpoint. Am I missing something here? Just then, Bruno and two other men came running out of the stairwell door. Bruno stopped short and took stock of the scene before him. What happened? Bruno asked. You're late, Cleesby said. I needed you here 30 seconds ago. Sorry, boss. We came as quickly as we could. How the hell did Larson get past your guy on the surface? Lucas asked. He used to be a Marine, remember? I'm sure it wasn't difficult for him to take our man out, Cleesby said, kneeling down next to Larson. This is all my fault. Damn it! I should have had more men guarding the elevator shaft. Lucas looked at Bruno and the other two security guards and suddenly understood what Cleesby meant when he said he had it under control. Oh, I see. You knew Bruno was watching and would bring reinforcements the minute Larson showed up and took your guy out on the surface. Yes, that's why I was walking slow, to buy time until he and his men got here. We had a long climb to the surface ahead of us, and there would have been ample time for Bruno's team to get into position and take control of the situation, Cleesby said, touching the tips of his fingers to Larson's neck. He's still alive. Barely. We need to get him to medical right away. Where's Billy Ray? He's hiding in a rift, Lucas answered. He ducked out right after Larson took you down the hall. Bruno, see if you can raise him. Bruno pressed a few buttons on his watch. Billy Ray, come in. Do you read me? Bruno motioned to his two guards to fan out and check the area. Lucas walked over and picked up Larson's gun. Bruno spoke into his watch again. DL needs you down here on the double. We're by the elevator. A second later, Bruno turned to Cleesby. He's on his way, boss. When he gets here, you and he take Larson back to the silo and get him to sickbay. Leave your other two men down here as tactical support while we handle the problem from this end. But I want at least three posted up top. Cleesby pulled out a slightly used handkerchief from his back pocket and handed it to Bruno. No more surprises. Already done, chief. Do you think that's wise? Larson knows we're alive, Lucas said, wondering why Cleesby felt compelled to show compassion to a man who, if given another chance, would sell them out in a heartbeat. I don't understand why you want to help him. He's the prick who shut down our experiment, and he wants Drew and me dead, remember? You're right. He's a prick. I can't stand him either. But it's not a sufficient reason to leave him down here to die. And what he wanted doesn't matter now. We have him under control. Billy Ray arrived in a full sprint from down the hall. He and Bruno each grabbed an end of Larson and carried him into the stairway on their way to the surface. So what's the plan, Professor? Drew asked. First, you and I need to finish those equations. Then we need to find the equipment NASA used to cause the power surge. I have an idea of where their equipment might be, Drew said. Okay, explain. Drew sat up slightly in his chair. We felt the ground shake in our E-121 lab every now and then, which we assumed was NASA running one of their experiments. It's not much of a leap to figure they were testing a massive power source. I'd bet it's somewhere close to our corner of the building. We've got 20 floors to cover. Where do you suggest we start looking? Lucas asked. Right here, on this floor. It's the most logical place, since it's where they were working on the equations. Agreed, Cleesby said. We start with this floor and work our way up if need be. Sweep and clear, one floor at a time. We'll find it. If I remember correctly, our lab should be directly above the far end of this hallway, down by the conference room, Drew said. Lucas, you take one of Bruno's men and search that section of the floor and report back anything you find. Drew and I will return to the QED lab to complete the equations. Aye, aye, Captain. Lucas slid Larson's gun inside the waistline of his pants. Ten feet down the hallway, he turned around, looking past the guard who joined him and back at his brother. Uh, what exactly are we looking for? A quantum foam generator, Drew said. It's probably huge, like a power plant or reactor. There should also be high-tech equipment connected to it, like in our lab. You'll know it when you see it. Got it, Lucas said, jogging down the hallway, sidestepping the debris littering the corridors. An hour later, Lucas and his armed escort kicked open another lab door and walked inside the dark room. 
The first dozen labs they'd checked weren't what they were looking for. Most of them were either empty or appeared to be some sort of animal testing facility with empty cages and medical equipment and tables. Maybe lucky number 13 would prove to be different. Lucas found the light switch and turned it on. Yahtzee, he said, seeing the immense lab. The interior looked promising. It was clearly a high-tech laboratory. Four banks of computer and other electronic equipment stood to his left. There was an enormous test chamber straight in front of him. It was made of a black metallic alloy that seemed to absorb the rays from the overhead lights and stretched all the way up to the ceiling. It had to be at least 60 feet tall. He ran to the viewing window and looked inside. That's got to be it, he said, hoping the guard standing by the entrance could hear him. Inside the chamber, he saw a three-story silver-colored reactor with four high-voltage Tesla transformer coils surrounding it. The swirling electrical coils were taller than the reactor and shaped like giant mushroom stools. To his right was a grease board with half-erased equations written in red and blue marker ink. He assumed it was the missing board from the QED lab. He sprinted out of the lab and ran full steam back to the QED lab with his bodyguard chasing him. Drew, Professor, we found it, he said, stumbling through the doorway when the toe of his sneaker caught the corner of the door jam. He was out of breath, gasping for air. Great timing, Cleesby said. We just finished the equations. What does the generator look like? The thing is huge. It has to be at least ten times the size of our E-121 reactor, and it's surrounded by giant resonator coils. I think even you would be impressed. Let's go check it out, Drew said with excitement. Minutes later, the three of them were just outside the generator's test chamber, looking through the viewing window. Whoa, it's enormous, Drew said. I told you, Lucas replied. What do you think it costs to build? A lot more than they gave us to build our reactor, that's for sure. I'll bet it can crank out a few terajoules, Drew said, smiling. Do you think it'll work, Professor? Cleesby nodded slowly. With the new equations, we just might be able to stabilize the reactor long enough to generate the power stream we need. But we'll need to make sure your E-121 experiment is calibrated properly. Uh, that's going to be a little difficult since the science lab's been completely destroyed, Professor, Lucas said. And we certainly don't have another 18 months to build a new reactor. You won't need to. What do you mean? We've been working on something not all that different from your E-121 reactor. We should be able to use it to run your experiment. Not all that different, Lucas asked, wondering why Cleesby chose those specific words. What do you mean? Actually, it's a near duplicate, Cleesby said. You know the old saying, why have the government pay for one when you can have them foot the bill for two at twice the price? More lies and secrets, Lucas thought, trying to wrap his head around the revelation. He understood the rationale behind overstating project costs to obtain excess grant money, but he was concerned why Cleesby thought it necessary to have a duplicate reactor built and never tell him or Drew. Didn't he trust them? Was there something wrong with their design, or was it that Cleesby thought he needed a backup just in case the first reactor crashed? It certainly wasn't needed for Cleesby's biotechs, nor was it needed to power their ultra-cool communicator watches. Then again, perhaps the duplicate reactor existed solely for profit. It wasn't a total stretch to think Cleesby's men could have been sponging off Lucas and Drew's hard work, pilfering their revolutionary ideas to line the professor's pockets. He didn't want to believe it, but it was possible. At this point, he couldn't discount any explanation, not after all he'd learned recently about his boss. Where is this near duplicate? Lucas asked. On the seventh floor of the silo, Cleesby replied without hesitation. What about Trevor's control system? Drew asked Lucas. Shouldn't be an issue, Lucas answered. I have his source code backed up to my cloud storage space. All we need is a cluster of Linux servers and we should be able to recompile and run it. But aren't this room and the silo too far apart for the arc to take place? Drew asked. Actually, we're close enough if you consider the vastness of space, Cleesby said. Relative to the size of the universe, they're virtually right on top of each other. Hmm, I never thought of it that way, Drew replied. What do you think, brother? Lucas heard his brother say something, but he really wasn't listening. He was still trying to figure out why Cleesby needed a second reactor. Not knowing was eating away at his gut like a swarm of maggots devouring a corpse. He couldn't stop obsessing about it. He had to know. Sorry, but I have a question, Professor. Why did you need to build a copy of our reactor? Sorry, classified. 
Wow, really? That's how you want to spin this? The professor didn't answer. He only blinked and stared. Lucas continued. You really think government classifications matter now, Professor, with all those energy domes destroying the world? Come on, Drew and I are about as far in the loop as it gets right now, wouldn't you say? I think we've earned the right to know. Cleesby hesitated for a moment before answering. You're right, but knowing the whole truth might be a little hard to accept. Are you sure you're ready to hear what I have to say? It'll change your perspective on everything, and I mean everything, including what you thought you knew about me and your friends and colleagues on our team. Lucas looked at Drew with a rapid heartbeat thumping away in his chest. His brother nodded at him. Lucas turned his eyes to his boss. We're sure. Why the second reactor, Professor? Okay, then. We are using it to power a transgalactic communication system. A what? Lucas said, scrunching his face until it hurt. That was the last thing he'd expected to hear. The professor must be putting him on. It's the power source for our subspace transmitter. Lucas held out his hands, shaking his head slowly. A transgalactic communication system? Seriously? Yes, I'm dead serious. Okay, then. Who are you using it to communicate with, exactly? Little green men from some distant planet or galaxy? No, I can assure you, no little green men. Then who? My people. Well, our people, actually. We need it to contact them and let them know where we are. We're ready to go home. Home? Where? The professor's face went blank and his lips fell silent, as if he were trying to find the courage to tell someone their parents had just died in a fiery plane crash. Quit stalling, professor. Tell us, Lucas snapped. Well, my young friend, it's a long story. We're listening. Cleesby cleared his throat and sucked in a deep breath before he spoke. I'm not who you think I am, nor are any of my people. In a rudimentary sense, our past is your future. What? Our journey to Earth started 400 years from now, in another time and place, one that's far away from here in both the literal and virtual sense. Let me explain. Chapter 23 April 25th, 2411 Cleesby turned off the digipad containing the final draft of his 1,200-page historical manuscript titled Pathological Absurdity, an Historical Profile of 20th Century Politics. He'd just put the finishing touches on the year-long project and was ready to transmit it through subspace to his copy editor, Dory, back home on Earth. It would be the second hyper-novel he'd published in as many years. He hoped his new exposition would be better received by the critics than the first. He leaned back in his easy chair, rubbed his eyes, and then stretched out his arms until he heard the bones in his elbows pop. It was almost time for his duty shift to begin on the bridge, but he felt lethargic and stiff from sitting and reading for so long. He knew he needed to get into the sonic shower to wake himself up, but decided to remain in his chair a few more minutes to enjoy the spectacular view of the galaxy streaming by his quarters at faster than light speed. He'd earned the extra break. It had been a grueling six months in deep space. His eyes went into a million-mile stare as the stars sped by in long streaks. A sky full of shooting stars, he thought. A child's dream. He propped his feet up on the leather ottoman with his hands behind his head, then called out to the computer. Stella, music please. Specify source and volume, the computer responded. Why break with tradition? Let's go with Paradise Theater, track three, volume ten, as usual. One moment, Captain. He closed his eyes and sang along to the lyrics when the cabin's audio system kicked in at full volume. The classic rock ballad dwarfed the hum of the ship's quantum pulse drive engines and the deck plating pulsating beneath his fleet-issued boots. Too Much Time on My Hands was his all-time favorite Styx song, something he liked to play before every duty shift to energize his mind, body, and soul. His fingers tapped along to the thunderous beat as his mind slipped away to bask in the mood-altering rhythm. Just a few more minutes, he thought. He didn't want to leave his sanctuary. Historical writing and his classic rock music were his escapes. 
Cleesby's hand-picked science crew had just finished an intensive study of a stellar nursery near the fleet's two outposts in the Nethian system. They were a shade over 200 light-years from home on his newly commissioned starship, the USS Trinity. The ship was performing admirably, despite a few glitches in its revolutionary quantum pulse drive engines and the occasional problem with the gravity plating on the lower three decks. Despite the minor setbacks, it had been a fruitful mission thus far, highlighted by the discovery of a scarlet-colored substance germinating in one of the nebula's molecular clouds. His team of astrobiologists were still analyzing the gelatinous material, but its biomimetic properties were promising. He intended to send a full report to fleet operations once they'd run a few more tests to complete their analysis. Stella, music off, he shouted to his empty cabin. What's the exact time? 7.07 a.m., the synthesized female voice reported. Captain, I just received an encrypted communique from Admiral Jenkins with fleet ops. Would you like me to play it? Yes, pipe it through, Cleesby said, moving to his work desk. He sat down and moved a digital picture frame out of the way. He kissed his index finger, then touched it to his wife's lips, which activated the living 3D hollow cell he'd recorded a year earlier. Caroline and their five-year-old son, Brett, were standing in front of a short brick wall along the north rim of Grand Canyon, both smiling and waving at the camera. The spectacular landscape stretched to the horizon, reaching out to infinity and beyond. The jagged rocks of the canyon were covered in a wild array of purples, reds, and oranges, igniting a wash of profound memories in his head. Few people appreciated how vibrant the desert could appear, especially when the sun was low on the horizon, showering the national monument with long, brilliant rays of color. It was a glorious day with his family in the stunning surroundings, one he hoped to repeat soon. He sighed wishing he could hug his son and kiss his wife. It had been six months since he'd taken command of the Trinity, and each day since they embarked on this scientific mission seemed to tick by even more slowly than the previous. He'd met his wife while waiting outside the Chancellor's office during his final year at the New York Science Academy. A whirlwind romance ensued the following day, culminating in their marriage six months later, after he'd earned advanced degrees in both physics and engineering. That same summer, he was recruited by fleet operations and rose to the rank of captain in record time, only six years. Captain Cleesby waved his hand over a rectangular niche in the center of his desk, activating three 12-inch silver-colored cylinders that rose up out of the recess in a triangular formation. Once fully extended, the multi-spectral emitters powered on, displaying a full-color 3D representation of an elderly man's head and shoulders, wearing a red fleet uniform with five silver stars on the collar. Admiral Jenkins reminded him of his father, olive-skinned, dark eyes, short in stature, plump and neatly groomed, with a bulging nose too large for his face. Jenkins always spoke in a deliberate manner, enunciating every word completely, just as his late father had, and this recorded communication was no different. Hello, DL. I hope this message finds you well. I'm pleased to see from your last mission report that you and your newly commissioned crew are meshing well. I look forward to reading your final analysis of the Hawthorne Nebula, which I expect will be riveting. Also, congratulations on receiving fleet approval to build the first rift-slipping prototype. It's truly exciting technology, which has everyone here in fleet operations acting like school kids before summer break. Keep us surprised as you run the first field test. Cleesby adjusted his backside in the seat as the Admiral's message continued playing. I'd rather not have to disrupt your study of the cosmos, but we have a critical situation brewing. Long-range telemetry from the colony on Nethian III has detected sudden activity along the Krellian border. Fleet intelligence believes the Krellians may be massing for an all-out invasion. Trinity is the closest ship to that sector, so we'll need you to change course to investigate and report back what you learn. Cleesby gulped while waiting for the rest of the briefing to be delivered. He wasn't a seasoned battle commander, and if they encountered the Krellian Empire directly, he was sure he'd lose some of his crew. Jenkins continued, Your orders are not to engage unless given no other choice. 
It's been 29 years since our last encounter with this ruthless species, so we have to assume they've beefed up their capabilities since then. Your ship's limited armaments would be no match, which is why we're sending the battlecruiser Challenger to assist. However, she's three days away, so learn what you can until then, but keep a safe distance on our side of the neutral zone until she arrives. Good luck and Godspeed. Jenkins out. Cleesby deactivated the vid screen, then sat back in his chair to contemplate his next move while staring at the photo on his desk. His loving family seemed farther away than they had just minutes before. He held them in his mind for a few moments longer, then let them go. It was time to put sentimentality aside and get to work. The fate of the galaxy was now at stake, with his ship and inexperienced crew leading the charge. It wasn't going to be easy, not when facing a predatory species like the Krellians. Hands down, they were the most deadly foe the Earth had ever encountered. First Officer Bruno Benner waited anxiously in the command chair on the bridge of the science vessel Trinity. Captain Cleesby was on his way from his quarters and was due to arrive any second. He wasn't sure what to make of the first-time captain, or the ship's crew for that matter. Bruno had seen his share of missions during his 20-year career thus far. Many of them had been filled with wondrous discoveries, as well as bloody, senseless deaths. Deep space was an unforgiving place for the uninitiated, and many of his crew members were just that. But there was little he could do about it, except work his ass off to train the crew and maintain discipline at all times. His job was simple, keep the ship running smoothly and carry out the captain's orders to the letter, both of which he'd excelled at thus far in his career, a career that would soon wind down once he made the decision to transition to civilian life. He'd been thinking long and hard about it for a few months now, feeling his love for the vastness of space starting to wane. Eventually, something would trigger his decision to retire, but he didn't know what that trigger might be. His eyes focused on the rush of movement heading his way from the other side of the bridge. Here's this week's duty roster, Commander Brenner, a striking female bridge officer said, handing Bruno a six-inch digis stick, which resembled a 20th century glow stick, only black with a pull tab on the side. Lieutenant Nellis was over six feet tall, with an athlete's body and long blonde hair held back in a tight bun. High cheekbones framed a small, turned-up nose and piercing blue eyes, making her look more like a runway model than a first-year officer on a ship assigned to exploring the far reaches of the Milky Way galaxy. Thank you, Lieutenant, Bruno said, sitting back in the captain's chair on deck one, glancing for a moment to admire the graceful lines of his beautiful underling. He knew Nellis would never be interested in him, even if it weren't against regulations, he was an average-looking guy, with little in the way of conversation skills or a sense of humor. Plus, he was twenty years her senior, not exactly the recipe for a whirlwind romance. But he could dream, though, as he planned to start work on improving his courting skills, if time permitted down the road. A man can only be alone for so long in the universe, he decided, feeling a stab of pain hit his heart. Eventually, a man must turn his attention to something more profound and more important than space exploration and duty assignments. That's when it hit him, at that exact moment, right there in the captain's chair. He wanted a family of his own, meaning this would be his last fleet assignment. Then he'd file for retirement and begin the grueling search for a wife before his biological clock ran out of steam. He knew time would soon ravage his mind and his body, meaning he needed to find that special someone who would have his back no matter what the future brought his way. Someone who could put up with his endless flaws and help him learn to be an attentive father and a better man. Bruno exhaled, feeling relieved. He finally had a plan for his future and his legacy. Now, he just needed to find the time and the proper words to explain it all to his captain, and then to fleet operations. Is there something wrong, sir? Nellis asked, snapping Bruno out of his thoughts. No, Lieutenant. Just got lost in my thoughts for a second, Bruno answered her, using the pull tab on the digit stick to slide out a wafer-thin screen. The transparent display lit up to show him the digital roster. Everything was in order. Everything but his social life, that is. 
Excellent work as usual, Nellis. Log this into the ship's computer. Make sure all department heads are notified, he said, closing the digistick and giving it back to her. She nodded and walked back to her duty station to his right. Then she straightened her posture, standing at attention when the jump pad's arrival tone played its customary four-note tune. Captain on the bridge, she announced to the bridge crew. Cleesby stepped off the jump pad next to the science officer's duty station, wearing his red and white captain's uniform with four brass pips on the collar. Bruno and the rest of the bridge officers snapped to attention, waiting for Cleesby to assume command. At ease, everyone, Cleesby said. Bruno stepped aside, allowing Cleesby to sit in the captain's chair. Set course to 111 Mark III, maximum speed, Cleesby said. Sir, that'll take us directly into Krellian space, across the DMZ, Bruno replied. You have your orders, Commander. Bruno turned to the helmsman. Mr. Heller, come about. Set course to 111 Mark III, best speed. The helmsman ran his hands over the navigation console like a concert pianist playing a Bach concerto. Course laid in, sir. Time to the border, Mr. Heller, Cleesby asked. Eleven minutes, sir. Shields up. Charge all weapons. Two minutes later, the communications officer said, Captain, I'm picking up a long-range distress call on one of the lower EM bands. Source, Mr. Blake. It's coming from Colony 359 on Nethian 3. Alter course. Maintain speed, Cleesby said. Just then, something rocked the ship, sending everyone lunging to the port side. Two of the bridge officers and their chairs toppled to the floor, while sparks flew from one of the unmanned duty stations behind the captain's chair. The tactical alert siren sounded. Captain, we were just hit by the leading edge of an intense gravimetric shockwave, Nellis reported. What's the source of the wave? Bruno asked her. Colony 359, sir. Ship status, Cleesby asked. Minor hull breach on decks 11 and 12. Contained. Shields holding, Nellis replied. We've also lost gravity plating in cargo bay 4. Dispatch repair crews, Bruno ordered. Minor injuries on deck 12, but engineering reports all systems operational, Nellis said, before she entered additional commands into her console. Shields at 92%. Maintain course and speed. Sound general quarters. All decks, Cleesby said. Yes, sir, she said, glancing at Bruno for a second. Ten minutes later, Helmsman Heller turned in his chair, making eye contact with Bruno. Entering Nethian system, Commander. Bruno turned his focus to the captain. Order, sir. Slow to sublight, Cleesby said. The origin of the shockwave is Nethian 6, an L-class planet. We're in visual range, Nellis said, as the whine of the ship's engines changed their pitch, indicating sublight speed had been achieved. On screen and magnify, the captain said, standing from his command chair. The bridge's 20-foot view screen showed floating hunks of rock and rubble loosely assembled in a spherical shape. Other than a few dozen pinpoints of starlight scattered across the background, nothing else was in view. It appears the debris cloud is all that's left of the planet. Sensors are picking up substantial amounts of charged Iditium-236 radiation, suggesting a massive detonation, Nellis reported. Didn't we just fire up a refinery on Nethian-6? Bruno asked Nellis. Yes, two months ago. The engineers finally developed a method to safely extract the volatile iditium deposits, she replied. Someone must have lit a match, Heller said from the helm. This is going to severely cripple our E-121 production, Bruno said. Captain, I'm detecting a series of subspace distortions in and around the debris field. They appear to be localized fractures in space-time, and they're drifting in space like icebergs, Nellis reported. Sir, if one of them comes in contact with the engine core, it will cause a breach in containment, Bruno said. Plot a course around them, Mr. Heller, Cleesby said. Acknowledged. Adjusting course to compensate. Sir, should I launch a microprobe into one of the fractures to investigate? Nellis asked. There isn't time. Best speed to Nethian 3, Cleesby said. Bring the forward plasma cannons online. Within seconds, the main viewer showed a blue and white planet growing larger as they got closer. Approaching Nethian 3, sir, Heller said. Standard orbit, Mr. Heller. Captain, I'm not picking up any other vessels in the area, Nellis reported. Cancel tactical alert, but keep the shields up, Cleesby commanded. Open a channel. Open, sir, communications officer Blake replied. Colony 359, this is Captain Cleesby of the science vessel Trinity. We've received your distress call and are standing by in orbit to assist. The bridge crew waited for a response, but none came. Cleesby repeated his hail a second time. Once again, there was no response from the colony. Biosigns, Cleesby asked Nellis, taking a seat in his chair. Scanning, sir. None detected. Scan the surface for trace signatures. No plant or animal life. No vegetation. No structures detected anywhere on the planet. 
Could our sensors be malfunctioning? Running a level one diagnostic, she said, hesitating before she spoke again. Sensors are working perfectly. What about atmospheric interference? She shook her head. Perhaps we should send a landing party to investigate, Bruno asked. Surface conditions? Please, we asked Nellis. Radiation and temperature are within acceptable levels. The atmosphere is breathable. Assemble a team, Cleesby told Bruno, nodding sharply. Bruno hurried to the jump pad. Lieutenant Nellis, you're with me. Mr. Blake, have Dr. McKnight and a security detail meet us in Jump Bay 2. Bruno stopped in outfitting on his way to the jump bay, changing out of his uniform and into his desert fatigues. He was looking forward to the Trinity's first official away mission, something a science vessel rarely had the opportunity to do. Bruno transported down to Colony 359 with six other members of the crew and found himself standing in the middle of a vast, barren wasteland. It was perfectly flat and stretched off to the horizon. His eyes scanned the area, but all he could see was a deep, charcoal-black color in every direction. The planet's surface was completely devoid of features, as if it had been flattened and then scorched by a blowtorch of unimaginable size. The four security officers fanned out and stood guard around the landing site, with their backs to Dr. Bruno, Dr. McKnight, and Lieutenant Nellis. Are we in the right place? The elderly Dr. McKnight asked, repositioning his medical satchel over his right shoulder. We're standing in what should be the center of a thriving settlement, Nellis said. Not anymore, the doc said. I thought the colony was surrounded by a mountain range, Bruno said to Nellis. It was, she answered. I'm not sure what happened here. Well then, there goes the curb appeal, McKnight said with a smirk on his face. Bruno knelt down and scooped up a handful of the black soot covering the entire area. He rubbed the powdery substance between his fingers. What is this stuff? Nellis tested a sample with her handheld M-spec scanner. I'm not detecting any organic or chemical compounds whatsoever. It's as if the powder isn't there. Bruno raised his fingers to his nose and took a whiff. How is that possible? Unknown, sir, she replied, putting a sample of the material into a travel container. Scan the area for life signs, Bruno told her, before blowing the powder off his fingertips. She adjusted her scanner's settings, then held the device up while slowly turning in a circle. Other than the seven of us, I'm not detecting anything organic within a 200-kilometer radius. Nothing, McKnight asked. She shook her head. Affirmative. I'm not reading any plant or animal life. What about chemical signatures? Bruno asked. None, sir. Could something natural have caused this? Unlikely. There would be some form of trace evidence. Then it must be some type of attack. It's possible. However, I'm not detecting any residual power signatures or elevated radiation. Is it those damn bugs? McKnight asked Bruno, eyes wide. We're practically in their backyard. If it is the Krellians, they've got some new type of weapon we haven't seen before. Something capable of leveling entire planets, topography and all. I knew I should have packed more than a gallon of exterminate, McKnight said. We should report this to the captain, Nellis said. Bruno nodded, activating the communications device on his wrist. Bruno to Trinity. Go ahead, Cleesby replied from the bridge. Sir, there's no sign of the colony. It's just gone, and I mean completely. So are the residents. What do you mean, gone? I mean everything has been obliterated, like it was never here in the first place. Even the mountain ranges have been leveled. Did you run scans for life signs? Yes, sir. However, they came up empty. There's absolutely nothing organic within a 200-kilometer radius, including plant and animal life. All we see is some type of black film covering the entire surface. We suspect it might be some new type of Krellian attack, though we can't detect any residual energy signature. If this is some type of weapon, it's something completely new, sir. Bruno waited, but Cleesby didn't answer. Sir, did you receive my last transmission? He asked, waiting for his commander to respond. Fifteen seconds later, Cleesby answered. However, this time his voice was charged with energy. Collect your team and return to the ship. On the double. Aye, sir. On our way. After transporting back to the ship, Bruno changed back into his uniform before returning to his post on the bridge. When he stepped off the jump pad, he wished he'd arrived a minute sooner. He didn't know what he'd just walked into, but whatever it was, it had everyone on edge. Shields at maximum. Weapons hot, Nellis reported. Stay alert, people, Cleesby said, looking over his shoulder at Bruno. Cleesby's eyes were dark and intense, telling Bruno to man his position at the tactical station. Mr. Blake, send a data burst to fleet with today's mission log, Cleesby said. Aye, Captain. 
I'm picking up a buildup in tachyon particles, 200,000 meters off the port bow, Nellis reported. On viewer. The screen changed to show a patch of stars oscillating as if they were being viewed through the bottom of a glass boat. Moments later, the same area of space began to change, fading in an enormous hive ship, at least a thousand times the size of the Trinity. It looked like a giant honeycomb with hundreds of identical octagon cells, each roughly the size of the Trinity. A web of yellow energy connected the eight sides of each green-colored cell with its neighbor. Sir, that's a Krellian destroyer, and she's on an intercept course, Nellis said. Hail them, Cleesby said. No response, sir, Blake said a few seconds later. The Krellian ship began to split apart, splintering into dozens of smaller cell groupings. Each cell group moved away from the others, working themselves into flanking positions around the Trinity. Captain, someone's tapped into our main computer. They're accessing our data core, Nellis said. Can you shut them out? Attempting to isolate the core and encrypt the network interface, Nellis said, working her controls feverishly. Got it. How much did they get? A hundred percent of the medical and historical databases, but it looks like we stopped them before they downloaded our tactical and scientific databanks. They're charging weapons, Bruno reported, activating the tactical alert siren from his console. Which one? Cleesby asked. All of them, sir. Evasive maneuvers. The enemy ships opened fire, sending a barrage of blue energy bursts streaming at the port side of Trinity's bow. The ship rocked hard to starboard when they made impact. Minor damage on deck 12, shields down to 62%, Nellis said. Looks like they're targeting engineering. Return fire, full spread. The forward battery of plasma cannons discharged, sending a torrent of energy pulses at the advancing enemy ships, striking several of them at center mass. Multiple hits, Bruno said. Minor fluctuation in their power grids, but no detectable damage, sir, Nellis said. The Krellian swarm fired a second volley, hammering the Trinity with even more force than before. Blake's communication console erupted into fire, searing his left hand and wrist. He screamed in pain. Medical team to the bridge, Cleesby shouted. Sick bay's not responding, sir, Nellis replied a few moments later. Several more salvos hit the ship, each time jolting the ship farther off course. Shields down to 27%. Bulkheads buckling on deck 12, section 4, Nellis reported. Remodulate shields. Continuing firing on all batteries, Cleesby said. Attack pattern Omega. Bruno fired the forward and port cannons. Direct hit, sir. Enemy shield still at full power, Nellis said. The ship's communication system came on. Engineering to the captain. We're close to losing containment down here. The reactor's nearing critical. Captain, we have no choice but to withdraw, Bruno said. We can't take any more of this pounding. The ship was hit two more times. Cleesby sat motionless in his command chair, his eyes pinched and aimed at the deck plating. Captain, Bruno shouted, trying to get his boss to act. Mr. Heller, hard to starboard, Cleesby said, after bringing his eyes to bear. Lieutenant Nellis, activate the rift generator. But sir, it hasn't been fully tested, she replied. We don't have a choice. Energize it now, while we still have sufficient power. Set destination coordinates for Earth. Aye, sir, Nellis replied, furiously entering commands into her station's console. Projector stream charged and online. Coordinates set for sector 000, Heller said. A vertical energy rift began to form directly in front of the ship, resembling a crumpled white envelope being opened lengthwise in space. It grew wider and longer with each passing second, letting in bright beams of light from the other side of the rift. Take us in, Cleesby shouted, just as the Krellians hit them with another onslaught. The bridge crew stumbled to the right, like crab fishermen battling a rising swell in the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska. Hull breach on deck seven, venting atmosphere, Nellis said. Entering rift, Heller reported. The Trinity was walloped again. Shields are down, Nellis said. Maintain course and speed, Cleesby said. Captain, we've been boarded, Nellis said. Location, deck 12, engineering. They must be after our E-121 supply, Bruno replied. Dispatch security teams. The Krellians fired again, missing the ship, but bombarding the rift's event horizon with blue energy. Their weapons are overloading the rift. It's destabilizing, Nellis said, right before an electrical discharge arced across the bridge between the active duty stations, knocking her, Blake, and the helmsman to the deck. The bolt continued through Cleesby's torso and pierced Bruno's neck, completing its circuit by connecting to the power supply installed under the base of the jump pad. A moment later, Bruno's eyes went dark, just as he watched Cleesby's body fall limp in the captain's chair. Chapter 24 Cleesby woke up slumped over in the captain's chair, 
Water poured through a rupture in the bulkhead above the bridge, splashing the right side of his face. His lungs tried to gather in a deep breath of air, but a mouthful of salt water entered his mouth instead. He spit it out in a fit of coughing, ridding his tongue of the salty taste. A salmon-sized fish came through the crack in the ceiling, smacking his cheek before glancing off his thigh and sliding across the deck plating. It came to rest in a pool of ocean water near the communication officer's station, flapping its fins. The only equipment active on the bridge was the emergency lighting system, casting a dull yellow pall over everything. All the control stations appeared to be offline, including the main viewer, which was hanging off the wall, slanting to the left. He could no longer feel the juddering pulse drive engines through the floor, meaning they were offline and the ship was now running on battery reserves. Bruno was nearby, but moving sluggishly on the deck plate. The rest of the bridge crew lay motionless near their duty stations. Take it slow, Cleesby said, helping Bruno to his feet. Do you think we made it home, Skipper? We'll soon find out. Nellis was to Cleesby's right on the other side of Bruno, lying on her back with her legs twisted to one side. He could see her chest expanding and contracting, so he knew she was still alive. See if you can revive the lieutenant, Cleesby told Bruno. Bruno nodded and went to Nellis. Cleesby sidestepped his way around debris to the other side of the bridge, where he found Officer Blake lying on his left side with his feet submerged in the water accumulating around his station. He slid Blake's body away from the rising water level, then checked his vitals. The young man's pulse was accelerated, possibly due to the burn injuries sustained earlier. He shook his communications officer, then wrapped him on the cheek. Blake finally let out a low groan and then opened his eyes. Easy does it, Chuck. You took a pretty good jolt. How do you feel? The pain's manageable, sir. I'll be all right, Blake replied, holding up his burned arm. Cleesby helped him up. Order, sir? the man asked in a weaker-than-normal voice. Sound the emergency evacuation alarm. We need to get everyone off the ship before we're completely underwater, Cleesby said. Dispatch medical teams to help the injured. Aye, Captain, Blake replied. The general alarm sounded, with Stella's computer voice telling the crew to abandon ship. Heller was face down with his head and shoulders lying under a toppled station chair. Cleesby uncovered his helmsman and rolled him over on his back, only to find Heller's face badly disfigured from the electrical burns. Dave, can you hear me? There was no response. He checked Heller's vitals. No pulse, no respiration. So far, medical teams had been unresponsive to Hales, probably busy elsewhere, he figured. He needed to do something, and quick, leaving him with only one choice, old school CPR. He tilted Heller's head back, pinched his nose, and covered the officer's mouth with his own. He blew twice into Heller's mouth, but his chest didn't expand. His hands went to Heller's sternum, rapidly pushing down thirty times in succession before blowing air into Heller's mouth again. Bruno, I need Dr. McKnight here now. Dave's non-responsive, Cleesby said, continuing resuscitation on Heller. I'll go find him, Nellis said after Bruno had revived her. She ran past the powerless jump pad, opened the emergency hatch, and climbed down the exit ladder to deck two. Is there anything I can do? Blake asked, favoring his badly burned arm. Both of you, grab what you can and get to the escape pods. I'll meet you on the surface, Cleesby said, continuing CPR on Heller. Captain, I should remain here with you, Bruno replied. No, you need to go. That's an order, Commander. Make sure Chuck and the rest of the crew get off the ship safely. Bruno nodded, helping Blake to one of the three escape pods along the rear wall of the bridge. He pressed a red, flush-mounted switch on the wall to the right of the pod, raising its hatch. Blake took a seat, and Bruno strapped him in. The egg-shaped pod was just big enough to accommodate two adult passengers and had a seven-day supply of battery power, air, vegetarian ration packs, and water. Each pod was equipped with an onboard navigation system, short-range communications, two EVA spacesuits, and a portable toilet that the crew affectionately called a bumper dumper. There were no weapons. Bruno turned around, unlocked the cabinet below his weapon station, and retrieved all three stun guns plus the four extra energy cells. These might come in handy, he said, handing the energy weapons to the injured Blake. He hurried over to the science station, opened a sliding panel door, and pulled out the removable data drive before returning to the pod. He handed the data core to Blake. Keep this safe. As soon as I close the hatch, press the green button to eject the pod. What about you? Blake asked, looking at the open seat next to him. 
I'll take the next one, Bruno said. When you reach the surface, use the nav system to locate the nearest shoreline. Then what? Use the pod's thruster assembly as a boat motor. Just be sure to sample the atmosphere before popping the hatch. How will I find the others? Hone in on the emergency beacons. They activate automatically as soon as a pod is launched. Now go, Bruno said, lowering the hatch until it latched into place. Moments later, he heard the pod eject. I thought I told you to evacuate with the rest of the crew, Cleesby said, dragging Heller's body away from the rising water. I know, sir, but you're going to need my help with Heller. Did someone call a doctor? McKnight asked, climbing out of the emergency hatch, carrying a medikit. Good to see you made it, Doc, Bruno said. Damn, I should have brought my swim trunks, McKnight said on his way to Cleesby, high-stepping through the water, filling up the left side of the bridge. What do we have here? He was hit by an energy discharge from his station. I've been administering CPR, but he's been unresponsive for about five minutes. McKnight held up his flashing medical scanner, passing it over Heller's chest and head several times. I'm not detecting any brain activity, and his lungs have been thermalized, he said, pulling the device away. Wait, you have to do something, Cleesby said, grabbing the doc by the elbow. McKnight shook his head, his voice filling with sorrow. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm afraid there's nothing more we can do for him. He's gone, Captain. Cleesby squeezed Heller's hand gently, then bent down close to his ear. Goodbye, cousin, he whispered, thinking of all the times they'd played ultimate rummy together in his quarters. And just so you know... I never once let you win a hand. Captain, we're running out of time, Bruno said, seeing the water level rising dangerously close to their position. Where's Lieutenant Nellis? Cleesby asked. She's helping evacuate the crew on the lower levels, McKnight said. We're taking on water all over the ship. All right then, to the escape pods. Let's hope the bugs in engineering can't swim. Cleesby felt the bottom of the escape pod scrape along the floor of the shoreline, right before the capsule leaned forward and came to a dead stop. He opened the hatch and felt blistering rays of sunshine and a stiff breeze in his face. A hand appeared through the open hatch from the outside. Good to see you, Captain, Bruno said, helping him out of the pod. Cleesby found himself standing on a rocky beach in the middle of a makeshift camp. Stacked up around the site were corrugated containers, dozens of ration packs and water containers, two bumper dumpers, one quart-sized glass container filled with the gooey nebula substance, and a portable communication unit. How many made it out safely? Bruno's face went dark. Twenty-four. Only twenty-four? he asked, his heart feeling a stabbing pain. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. The news hit Cleesby hard. Seventy-five souls went down with his ship, on his watch. He swallowed hard and turned away from Bruno. He looked back at the ocean, past the fourteen empty pods pushed up on shore, hoping to see additional capsules bobbing their way across the whitecaps. There were none. He took a moment to collect his thoughts, then asked, Any sign of the Krellians? Bruno shook his head. None at all. I don't see how they could have survived the swim from that deep in the ocean. Have you determined our location? Cleesby asked, looking at the moon low on the horizon. Its crescent shape was still visible despite abundant sunshine filling the sky. He wiped off the sweat dripping from his brow. Looks like we made it home, Bruno said, handing him an empty, rusty tin can of Maxwell House coffee, though the label was in Spanish. There's more trash like this along the beach. Cleesby was surrounded by Lieutenant Nellis, Chuck Blake, and Dr. McKnight, plus seven security team members, two astrobiologists, one geneticist, two ensigns, two nurses, one chef, the barber, two machinists, and one engineer, Lieutenant Roddenberry, whose nickname was E-Rod, a brilliant man he'd known since his first year at the Science Academy. In all, six females and 18 males had made it out alive. Are we picking up any radio chatter? Cleesby asked Bruno. Nothing on standard fleet frequencies, but we're receiving several broadcasts on the lower AM band. Most are in Spanish, but we did find a faint signal in English. Let's hear it. Bruno played the broadcast on the portable comm unit. More following today's top stories. Casino Royale's premiere makes a splash with Sean Connery at the helm. Surveyor 3 successfully lands on the moon after historic three-day trek. Violent war protests break out in San Francisco over recent U.S. bombings in Haiphong. The Beatles sign a contract to stay together for ten more years. Two thousand Red Sox fans burned alive when gas main erupts and levels Fenway Park.
That's enough. Turn it off. What do you think, Skipper? You're the history buff. You're right. We're on Earth. April 67, by the sounds of it. I'd say we're probably in Mexico, given the excessive heat and the Spanish broadcasts. 1967? As in the past? Yes, it appears so. How? Perhaps when the Krellians fired on the Rift's event horizon, their weapons somehow ruptured the fabric of subspace, sending us back in time, Nellis answered. But I thought time travel wasn't possible, Bruno said. It's not. It's simply a myth started by a few over-imaginative science fiction authors of the 20th century. Einstein was proven wrong in 2187 when E-121 was first discovered, and we used it to power our engines close to light speeds. Time does not slow down when you approach light speed. It simply shudders like a three-legged table in an earthquake. What has already transpired cannot be undone. But the radio broadcast? Nellis asked. It may be a fake, Bruno said. Or we're not on Earth, Nellis added. We might be picking up an ancient radio signal that has traveled from Earth, arriving here 400 years later. However, that would also mean someone went to all the trouble to fake the rubbish along the beach, too. That seems unlikely. What do you think, Skip? Bruno asked Cleesby. The captain bent down and picked up a crumbled sheet of heavy bond paper buried in the loose sand. He wiped off the paper and read its contents aloud. Playboy, February 1967. Kim Farber, Playmate of the Month. He tossed the paper aside. I don't know how, but I'm pretty damn sure we're on Earth. But a couple of things concern me. David Niven was the star of Casino Royale, not Sean Connery, and I don't remember reading about a deadly gas explosion at Fenway Park in 1967. Order, sir? Nellis asked. Cleesby didn't respond. He couldn't stop thinking about the 3D hollow cell of his wife and son at the Grand Canyon, now buried deep at the bottom of the ocean, half a mile down and a lifetime away. Captain? Nellis asked again. Cleesby snapped out of his trance. Let's set up camp for the night and see if any more survivors make their way here. We've got about an hour or so before sunset, so let's get to it. We'll head inland in the morning to find the nearest city. Aye, sir, several members of the crew said in unison before walking away. Cleesby grabbed one of the security team members by the elbow. Lieutenant, establish a secure perimeter at 50 meters and rotate your guards in three-hour shifts. Pull in some of the other men if you need to fill shifts. Roger that, the lieutenant replied. Erod. Do you have a moment? Cleesby asked his longtime friend, looking to the rear of the crowd. The engineer stepped forward. Cleesby put his right arm across the back of Roddenberry's shoulders. Eugene, I need you to scuttle the pods before we leave tomorrow, so make sure you've cannibalized whatever you can from them tonight. We'll also need the emergency beacons deactivated. We don't want any unfriendlies salvaging our equipment. You got it, DL. Just after sunrise the following morning, Cleesby woke up to the sound of a donkey braying in the distance. He rolled over in the sand, sat up, and looked inland. A short Hispanic man wearing a wide-brimmed straw hat, a dirty, long-sleeved shirt, and gray slacks was leading a pack mule down the dirt path to their base camp. His dark brown face was almost as weathered as his prehistoric leather sandals, looking as though he'd spent every moment of his life under a heat lamp. Hola, muchachos, the man shouted in a friendly voice, grinning from ear to ear. His dark eyes beamed with youthful mischief, despite his obvious age. Cleesby sprang to his feet and rushed over to the visitor. Cleesby's security detail was only a few steps behind him. The captain stopped a few feet away from the man when a waft of body odor hit his senses. The Spanish-speaking man smelled as if he hadn't bathed in weeks. Do you speak English? Si, sí, senor. I speak very much English. Can you tell me where we are? You are on a beach, mi amigo? Cleesby tried not to laugh, but couldn't stop himself. Not what I meant. Is there a city nearby? See, si, very much close. The man held out his hand and shook it, palm up. For five dollars, American, I will take you. One of Cleesby's soldiers pressed the barrel of his stunner pistol to the Mexican's temple. How about you just tell us where it is? The man pointed inland to the north. Chicxulub, two kilometers. Thank you, Cleesby said, pulling the guard's hand down and away from the visitor's head. What's your name? Jose Cesar Enrique Humberto Ramirez, the man answered, pulling out a colorful Mexican blanket and a necklace from one of the donkey's packs. You need blanket? Only two dollars? No thanks. I like you, gringo. How about one dollar? The peddler asked, pressing the blanket close to Cleesby's face. It smelled of donkey and sweat. Cleesby turned his head, pushing it away. 
What about necklace? It was mi esposas, real turquoise, good deal, only one dollar. No, but I'd be interested in your donkey and packs. We'll need them for our long trip home. How much? For you, mi amigo, I make you good deal. One hundred dollars, Jose said. I give you blanket and necklace, no charge. Again, the soldier put the stunner to Jose's head. How about ten dollars, Jose said without hesitation, his eyebrows raised and face filled with nervousness. We don't have any money. How about a trade? Jose pointed at the soldier's weapon. Si, senor. The pistola? No, not the pistol. Pick something else. We have food, water, and supplies. I very much like the watch, he said, staring at Bruno's wrist. Deal, Cleesby said, not hesitating. He motioned for Bruno to give up his watch. Bruno took it off and gave it to Jose. Jose slipped his hand through the twist wristband. Gracias, senor. Muy bueno. He stood silent for at least a minute, playing with the buttons around its perimeter. You should probably be on your way now, Cleesby said, ushering the man gently with his hand. Jose smiled, took off his straw hat, bowed quickly, then turned around and walked back down the path, leaving his mule, trinkets, and packs behind. Cleesby waited for the man to disappear over the shallow rise just beyond the end of the beach, then went and sat next to Bruno and Erod near the campfire, rubbing his hands above the flames. We are going to need cash if we plan on surviving in this time period. Erod flicked a coal over with a stick. He pushed it to the middle of the crackling fire. I suppose a rescue is impossible. Cleesby shook his head. Nobody knows where we are, or when we are for that matter. No, I'm afraid we're stuck here for a while, until we can figure out a way home. Orders, skipper, Bruno asked. You, Erod, and I will walk into town to see if we can barter for transportation or additional mules. It's a long way home to the U.S. The donkey let out several snot-filled brays just behind Cleesby. The animal nudged him in the back of the neck, twice with its soggy nose. Anybody know what we're supposed to feed this thing? Bruno laughed. I don't think the ration bars are going to cut it, boss. Chapter 25 Wow, it must have been hard not seeing your family for such a long time, Drew said, without a hint of disbelief after Cleesby's whopper of a story. Are you kidding me? Lucas said to Drew, wondering why his brother wasn't reacting to what they'd just heard. What? Drew replied with a surprised look on his face. You believe all that shit? Sure, why not? I know you're skeptical, but what I just told you is the truth, Cleesby said. Sorry, Professor, but it's a little hard to swallow. Trust me, it's all true, every word of it. Why would I make up something like that? Lucas shook his head and shrugged. So now what? Are we supposed to call you Captain Cleesby? No, I'm the same old professor you've always known. Nothing's changed, except now you know where I'm from. Lucas didn't respond. How could he? Everything he thought he knew about his mentor was complete fiction. His perception of reality had been shaken to its very core, and he needed a few minutes to reassess the situation. It was nearly incomprehensible that his bearded, low-key, flannel-wearing advisor was really a starship captain from the future. Then... There was the whole Erod thing, suggesting the famous mastermind behind the Star Trek franchise, Gene Roddenberry, didn't just invent the mythology of the popular show, he'd actually lived it. It was where he got all the ideas, from Cleesby's future. Lucas took a few seconds to run through it again in his mind, then gave in to the insanity of it all. The whole story was so preposterous, it must be true. What else could it be other than the truth? So what happened after the trip into Chicxulub? Drew asked. We made our way across the Mexican desert and entered the United States. Fortunately for us, crossing the U.S. border in Nogales was much easier back then, and we were able to get our people and supplies into the country without too much hassle. We entered southern Arizona, found jobs in Tucson, and settled into our new lives. It took a while, but eventually everyone accepted the fact we weren't going home any time soon. I can imagine, Drew said, nodding. Cleesby continued. Some of them paired off and started new families, while others married women from this version of Earth. I still held out hope that we'd someday return home, so I never remarried. Instead, I enrolled in the University of Arizona and earned my doctorates in short order, then got a job in the physics department. I worked my way up from there. We've been trying to find a way home ever since. 
Since you're obviously on Earth in the past, I take it you eventually decided time travel was possible? Drew asked. Actually, just the opposite. It took us a while to prove it scientifically, but we're definitely not from your future, or ours. What? Drew asked. I don't understand. When we were hurled through the rift, we were sent to a parallel universe, to an alternate version of Earth. Given everything we now know, it's the only conclusion that explains why some of your historical facts are different than ours. It's clear we don't share the same past, so, by extension, we can't be part of your same future. Lucas couldn't believe what he was hearing. Interdimensional travel, really? So basically you're talking about the exact same theory I proposed in my thesis, the same theory that everyone blasted to hell across the internet. Yes, that's why you needed to run your paper by me first. How the hell was I supposed to know that when you keep us in the dark uh, about everything? What paper? Drew asked, looking at Cleesby and then at Lucas. Lucas hesitated for a moment, then decided to come clean with his brother. A couple of weeks ago, I emailed my equations for opening a rift in space to Astrophysics Today. I was hoping to get published and generate some cash for Mom's medical bills, but it totally backfired. That asshole editor Dr. Green ripped me a new one on his blog. That's the real reason Larson shut us down, isn't it, Professor? Cleesby nodded. Mostly. Lucas thought about the facts, lining them up in his head. He locked eyes again with his brother. So basically, if I hadn't sent my paper to Green, Larson wouldn't have shut us down, forcing us to run the experiment a second time, and we all know what happened after that. So it all boils down to this. If I hadn't clicked that stupid send button, the end of the world never would have happened. A single email, that's all it took. Seriously, it boggles the mind when you think about the chain reaction it cost. You couldn't have known what would happen, Lucas. It's not your fault, Drew said in his sympathetic voice. Yes, it is. All this death and destruction is on my hands. I killed all these people. No two ways about it. Drew stared at Lucas, but didn't say a thing. What's done is done, so let it go, Cleesby said. History is what it is. You can't change it. Like your brother said, you couldn't have known. Besides, NASA is also at fault here. So am I. We're all culpable in our own way, so let's move on, shall we? Lucas agreed and appreciated the support from the professor and his brother, though he was still upset, mostly with himself. Drew turned to Cleesby. How did you prove it, professor? The alternate universe part. Matter in each universe vibrates with its own specific subatomic frequency, meaning your universe and ours vibrate differently. Eventually, we were able to use that fact to rule out time travel and determine what actually happened to us. Neither Drew nor Lucas said anything. Do you remember what I taught you in my quantum mechanics course, that the laws of physics can vary from one universe to the next? Drew and Lucas both nodded. The same is true for the flow of time. It can vary as well. In your universe, time flows at a rate slower than ours. When we crossed over, we entered your history and did so at a point that was 400 years behind ours. That means we're reliving your version of Earth's history. I see. So it wasn't time travel, it was a time differential, due to the fact that time advances faster in your home universe than ours, Drew said in a matter-of-fact way. Interesting. I never would have considered that. Wow. This story just keeps getting better and better, Lucas replied with a full-on smirk. Cleesby put his hands on Lucas's shoulders, squeezed gently, and then said in a soft, gentle tone, Look, Lucas, I know you're upset, but you need to listen to me carefully. Right now, it doesn't matter where I'm from, or how I got here, or that you sent your thesis to Green. We can't change the past. All you need to be concerned with is what we do next to stop the Krellians before they destroy this planet and all of humanity. Lucas nodded. He didn't want to admit it, but Cleesby was right. Billions of lives were at stake, including his mother's, and they still had a job to do. So that's how you knew what real estate to buy and when. You used your knowledge of Earth's history for profit, Drew said. The parts of history that didn't change from one universe to another. To some extent, yes. We also earned substantial royalties from several technology patents we own. We pooled our money and purchased old missile silos from the U.S. government to serve as our network of underground bases. How many do you have, Professor? Thirty-seven. All but two of them have working jump pads, which is how we move our staff and supplies around the world. 
Can you tell us who will win the next five Stanley Cups? I could play some bets and be a billionaire before I'm 30, Lucas replied sarcastically. Cleesby quickly shook his head. Sorry, there's no guarantee history will unfold exactly the same on your version of Earth. The very nature of the multiverse stipulates that there must be differences, some subtle, some not. For example, in our universe, Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor of California, and Ronald Reagan became president. Also, our Michael Jackson never went through gender reassignment surgery to become Belle Mae Watson, the country music singer. What happened to the real Bruno? Drew asked. Cleesby choked up for a moment. He died of prostate cancer in 2001. We used our biotechs to keep his memory and his spirit alive. Why is all this happening now? Lucas asked. It can't be simply because of me, right? Two reasons. First, the U.S. Navy was finally able to recover the E-121 modules for us from our ship. We had to wait for Earth's technology to catch up before our ship's power core could be salvaged from the deep sea trench. Once they had it, our replicas inside the Navy had it redirected into our hands. And the second reason? You brought the Krellians here by changing the specs on your E-121 experiment. The Krellians are behind the energy fields? Cleesby nodded. We think so. When you changed the experiment, NASA's energy spike sent the E-121 canister to our home universe, which the bugs must have intercepted and traced back to your dimension and time. We assume they've been looking for us ever since we disappeared through the rift. Why would the bugs care where you went? They want our biotechs, assuming they were able to decipher the data they downloaded from Trinity's data core. It would give them a huge tactical advantage in the war. Of course, that's assuming the war is still going on after all these years, Drew added. Trust me, it is. As long as there's advanced technology to be had, they'll never stop trying to acquire it. Unbelievable, Lucas said, looking at the ground, shaking his head. We're in the middle of an intergalactic war. Actually, it's more like a trans-dimensional war, Drew replied. I take it the gooey stuff from the nebula was the biotechs. An early version of it. We studied the sample and eventually learned how to synthesize a limited supply from alpha material we saved from our ship. If the Krellians get their hands on it, it would make them unstoppable. They'd be able to increase their numbers geometrically through endless cloning. They might even capture and replicate some of our own high-ranking officials to infiltrate our leadership and uncover the location of our colonies. Multiple worlds and trillions of lives are at stake. Why didn't you tell us this before, Professor? Drew asked. We operate on a strict need-to-know basis, for obvious reasons. Plus, we weren't absolutely sure the Krellian Empire was behind these attacks until recently, when we started putting all the pieces together. Remember when I told you in your apartment that I'd seen the black powder once before, a long time ago? Lucas nodded. It was on Colony 359 after the attack, but we didn't know why it was there or what had created it. We'd never seen the energy fields either. When the domes left behind the same residue on campus, we began to suspect the Krellians were behind the attacks. It wasn't until you uncovered the source of the energy spike that we understood how our enemy found us here. Basically, we phoned them and told them where you were, Drew said. Cleesby nodded. When we later analyzed the pattern of the domes, we realized they were tracking us, appearing in places our replicas had been. Shit! That's how you knew where the Green Valley Energy Dome would appear. You used biotechs to lure it there, Lucas said. Yes. Can we stop them? Lucas asked. The bugs, I mean. Possibly, but it won't be easy. They're a warrior race of sadistic, malevolent creatures that can't be reasoned with, bargained with, or dissuaded from their mission. Their singular goal is to scavenge entire worlds, consuming their resources, their technology, and their inhabitants. They're cannibals? No, they don't eat their own, but they do think of all other species as a food source. Lucas remembered the pyramids of human remains left behind by the energy fields each time they disappeared. If they eat other species, why are their domes leaving behind the pyramid of remains when they retract to their dimension? We believe it has to do with your Earth's most virulent contagions, like NVL and Striallis. It's likely the Krellians detected them in the bodies of those they returned. It's probably the reason your planet has not been consumed en masse thus far. Your flavor has upset their palate, and your technology is of little interest to them. They are here mainly for my people and our technology. So your version of Earth was able to avoid these viruses? 
Yes, those two we did, but we had to deal with a few you avoided, like H1N1 and AIDS. Trust me, it's been no picnic in our universe either. What do the Krellians look like? Drew asked. They're nine-foot-tall, crustacean-like arthropods. They have a hard outer shell that acts like armor, but they're bipedal and walk upright. The closest analogy on Earth would be a fusion of a giant beetle and a crawfish. They have a powerful set of front claws, long suction tentacles, a tail with a serrated edge stinger, and they drool uncontrollably. Their appearance is revolting, to say the least. And the smell... Next, you're going to tell us they have acid for blood, like in the movie Aliens, Lucas said. Cleesby laughed. Lucas wasn't trying to be funny. No, but they're ruthless predators who will fight to the death to achieve their goals. They simply will not stop until every advanced civilization in every universe has been consumed and its technology acquired. If you leave our planet, will they stop their attacks? Drew asked. That would be a logical assumption. Okay, then. How would they know when you're off-world? In order to track us, their energy fields must have some sort of remote sensors that can detect our specific biomolecular signatures. From what we've been able to gather, they aren't very accurate, particularly during the daylight hours. We assume that's why their domes employ a systematic farming pattern to cover an entire area once they've detected us. Most of the time, Lucas asked. It all has to do with the number of active domes in the area. When there are three or more, we believe they use a hidden signal to network their sensors together, to perform multi-point triangulation. We try not to remain out in the open and stationary for too long, especially at night. Our replicas are even more vulnerable, since their biotech signature is easier to detect among this Earth's inhabitants. When my replica was sucked up on I-19, didn't the bugs get their hands, I mean claws, on some of your biotechs? Lucas said. Correct, but they don't have the activating enzyme. Despite their supremacy, they're not a very technically astute species. They're able to use third-party technology, but advanced physics and reverse engineering are not their forte. Then it should be relatively easy to outsmart them. One would think so, but they're very cunning and can sense deception. We've tried to outmaneuver them numerous times over the course of our conflict, with limited success. It's been quite humbling for the humans in my time stream. The Krellians learn quickly, almost instinctually. They're going to find the enzyme, aren't they? Drew asked. It's only a matter of time. So far, they've been thinking two-dimensionally, only consuming surface resources. But eventually, they'll expand their efforts to underground locations. Fortunately, we do have some time to work with. Well, maybe you do, but our planet is being consumed one square mile at a time, Lucas snorted. Do you have a plan? Drew asked. I'm hoping we can use the quantum foam generator to provide the supplemental power we need to contact our home world. Once they know where we are, they should be able to open a rift to us in this universe so we can return. Why do you have to contact them first? Can't you just open a rift from our side to get home? I have to assume you know the quantum signature of your home universe, Lucas said. We do, but they probably have safeguards in place to stop unscheduled travelers from entering their space. Then, there's the problem of time advancing differently in both universes. They'll need to open the bridge from their side. Makes sense, Drew replied, nodding. Huh? Lucas said, suspecting that Drew was full of shit. Think of time as flowing like the mighty Mississippi River, Drew told him. Their universe is in the future, or upstream, and ours is downstream, in the past. When trying to swim across the strong current, it's only possible to hit your mark if you start your swim from the upstream side. The same thing is true with a trans-dimensional bridge. They'll have to open it from their side. This was one of those times when Drew was three steps ahead of Lucas. He wasn't sure how Drew knew the answer, but the explanation did help him understand the concept. He looked at his boss. So what do we do next? You two get back to the silo and begin preparations. This time, be sure to follow my specs to the letter. I'll stay here and get the generator running. When I'm ready, I'll call you. Call us? Lucas asked, worrying he didn't have the strength for yet another trek up the stairs with Drew on his back. Cleesby opened his equipment bag and, after sifting through its contents, pulled out a pair of Motorola handheld radios. Use this to stay in contact, Cleesby said, handing one of the two-way transmitters to Lucas. What's the range? 52 miles. More than adequate. Stay on channel 44, Cleesby said, digging into his bag again. Will it work down here? The professor pulled out two silver devices with a red toggle switch on the side. Each was the size of a cigarette pack with a stubby black antenna sticking out of the top. 
Place these signal boosters in the stairwell, one at the top and one at the bottom. They're battery powered and will take care of the problem. Excellent, Lucas replied, with admiration for his mentor's ability to foresee needs and plan accordingly. Drew unfolded his handwritten calculations and gave them to Cleesby. Here, you'll need these, Professor. Chapter 26 It took a while to carry Drew back up the stairs and get him to the silo, where they rode the underground facility's elevator down to the seventh floor. They found Bruno waiting for them with a steaming cup of coffee in his right hand. Lucas expected Bruno to be chowing down a few caramel-covered treats, not drinking a cup of joe. If Cleesby hadn't told him about Bruno's death in 2001, Lucas might have thought this man was the real Bruno, not just another replica. The fresh coffee stain on his shirt would have been a dead giveaway. "'Welcome back, gentlemen,' Bruno said in his usual jovial voice. "'Good to be back. How's Mom doing?' Lucas asked, worrying everyone had forgotten about her. He envisioned her lying on the floor in the bathroom for hours, crying out in pain. He thought it might be a good idea to get her one of those emergency necklaces advertised on late-night TV, the kind with the push-button radio transmitter built in so she could call for help. Assuming, of course, the planet survived and he wasn't prosecuted for mass murder. Great, she's upstairs in her quarters. We just had lunch together. I need to go spend some time with her, Lucas said to Drew. After I help you and DL save the world, of course, I gotta do something to atone for my sins on multiple fronts. Drew nodded. Me too. Lucas looked down the hallway in both directions. Where's the reactor? Just two doors down on the left. Follow me, Bruno said. Lucas held the radio he was carrying up to his mouth, then pressed the switch on the side of it. Dr. Cleesby, can you hear me? This is Lucas. The radio squawked. Read you loud and clear. We're here in the silo. Bruno's taking us to the reactor. Excellent. I've entered the new equations for NASA's reactor, and we should be ready to begin the power-up sequence within the hour. Call me when you're ready. 10-4, Lucas said. You're supposed to say over when you finish a sentence, Drew said. I really don't think DL cares, Lucas said, clipping the radio to his belt. He wanted to say something else with a little heat in it, but chose not to with Bruno within earshot. Bruno held the door to the reactor room open. Lucas and Drew went through to the inside. Yeah, it's a near duplicate, all right, Lucas said, looking at the reactor sitting in the middle of the room. However, unlike in their lab, it wasn't in its own sealed chamber with a twin-door airlock system, but it did appear to have most of the same components, the ring of electromagnets, the cold neutron beam, and all the coolant pipes, power cables, and other equipment. To the right was Cleesby's version of the primary control station, with its twin consoles, video screens, and control instruments in between. There's the E-121, Drew said, pointing at two familiar-looking metal containers in the corner. A three-ring binder was sitting on top of them. I'm assuming the contaminant receptacles are around here somewhere, too? Lucas asked. Bruno nodded. In the bottom container. But DL had us preload the reactor with one of the E-121 spheres. You should be all set. Awesome, Drew replied, rolling over to the containers. He opened the binder sitting on top. Here's the procedure manual. Where's the computer equipment? I need to recompile Trevor's code, asked Lucas. Our Linux servers are on the first floor, in the data center. Trevor's up there now, prepping the servers. How'd he know to do that? Lucas asked. You installed the signal boosters, didn't you? Lucas thought about it for a second. Oh, DL called ahead, he said, nodding as if he should have known the answer. Cleesby must have used a channel other than 44, since he didn't remember hearing anything on his radio. All Trevor needs is your username and password to download the code from your cloud storage space, Bruno said, with a hint of impatience in his voice. My username is DRLREMC2, and the password is CATSRULE3X. Do you need the IP address? Bruno wrote on a slip of paper before answering. Trevor already knows your stuff's on Bitwise Server Group 12. Lucas figured Trevor must have been looking over his shoulder when he accessed his storage space from the lab. It wasn't a big deal. The source code was his anyway. Actually, it's server group 11. They moved me to a different cloud last week. His stuff's in a folder called Gigantor with an uppercase G. Got it, Bruno said, scribbling one more time on the paper before walking to the door. I'll get this to him right away. Lucas waited for Bruno to leave the room before speaking to Drew. How do you think Cleesby's interdimensional beacon works? They're probably going to open a micro-rift to their home universe and then send a compressed data stream through it. E.T. phone home, Lucas wisecracked. Drew laughed. 
I'd bet it's an SOS that's encoded with our coordinates within the multiverse. I wonder how long it will take them to respond. The real question is where. I don't think they'll send a communique back. They're most likely going to open a portal from their side. Probably down here, where it's secure and out of sight. Both of them looked at each other before staring at the open section of the floor right behind the primary control station. You don't think, Lucas asked. Drew smiled. We'll know soon enough. Five minutes later, Bruno returned. He looked at his watch. Trevor says he'll be ready in three minutes. That was quick. Damn, those must be some lightning-fast servers, Lucas said. You ready to get started? Drew asked, flipping through the procedure manual. Let's light the fires and kick the tires, Big Daddy, Lucas quipped with a military inflection in his voice. Forty-five minutes later, they had completed the startup procedures and the reactor was humming along. Man, I love that sound, Lucas said. So, what's next? There's a new page of instructions added onto the back, Drew replied, handing the binder to Lucas. Lucas looked them over. Seems simple enough. Let's get her done. Drew entered the new command sequences into his console, while Lucas followed up by adjusting a few of the riser panel's instruments. It only took another minute to complete. That should do it. All we need to do now is wait for DL to call, Lucas said. Let's hope he got NASA's reactor working, Bruno said. Yeah, otherwise we're all fucked, Lucas said, leaning back in his chair. What's the word on Larson? Drew asked Bruno. Last I heard, he was in surgery, but he's expected to pull through. That's a damn shame, Lucas replied. You do realize the first thing he's going to do is call the general and tell him we're alive. Bruno nodded. Yes, assuming his memory's intact and he's able to speak, you cracked his skull pretty hard. There could be permanent damage. Imagine that, a self-serving attorney who can't think or speak. Just goes to show you, there is a God in heaven, Drew added. Bruno walked out of the room without saying anything. I hope we didn't offend him, Drew said. I don't see how, Lucas replied. Then he smiled when a new string of thoughts entered his mind. Maybe he had one too many spicy burritos today? You may have to loan him your extra can of air freshener. Drew laughed. So, what's your take on this whole Cleesby from outer space thing? Lucas asked, trying to stop his own laughter. It's pretty wild stuff, but when you look at everything we know about him, it all fits. It certainly explains all his toys and his cash. He does always seem to be two steps ahead of everyone else. Well, I'd be too, if I knew the future. There's no guarantee his past and our future are always going to be the same, not when we're from two different universes. Yeah, I know, it's not always a slam dunk. It's probably a good thing he's smarter than everyone else. Everyone except maybe you, Lucas replied. Drew looked a little embarrassed when he smiled. The radio activated with Cleesby's voice. You guys ready? Lucas depressed the transmit button on the radio. Yes, sir. We're powered up and ready to proceed. On my mark. Wait precisely ten seconds and then engage your neutron beam. Roger that, Lucas replied in his most military-like voice. Once Cleesby gave his mark, Lucas and Drew waited exactly ten seconds, then proceeded with their experiment, firing the neutron beam right on cue. Both Lucas and Drew reviewed the chamber's video feed to verify the E-121 canister had vanished. Looks like it worked, Lucas told Cleesby over the radio. E-121 is on its way. Their radio squelched with Cleesby's next communication. Excellent work. Go ahead and power down. I'll meet you in the surveillance room in one hour. 10-4, Lucas responded before turning down his radio. DL can't be serious, Drew said. How's he going to climb up those stairs on crutches and still get here in an hour? The guards up top must be helping him up the stairs. Drew nodded. So, what do you think DL stands for? Lucas shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. Next time we're alone with Bruno, let's ask him. He probably knows. Drew looked at the door behind them. Let's go check on Mom while we have some time. I'm sure she could use the company. Good idea. Let's stop at the mess hall on the way. I'm starving. Ninety minutes later... Lucas and Drew were chatting in the silo's surveillance room with Cleesby, Bruno, and several video technicians after eating and then checking in on Dorothy. Two armed guards had just joined them, taking position on either side of the elevator doors. Energy domes were still terrorizing the planet, filling the video screens with scenes of destruction and mayhem. This had better work. We're running out of time, Lucas said, haunted by the activity on the screens. Even though Drew and Cleesby wanted him to let the guilt go, he couldn't. It was staring him in the face, and he knew it would follow him for the rest of his life. How long will it take for your people to answer, Professor? Drew asked. It all depends on their ability to decrypt my message and follow the instructions I sent them, 
What did you tell them? Lucas asked. I gave them the exact spatial coordinates of this room, as well as my equations. Equations? To open the bridge from their side. When we were marooned on Earth, we had only just begun to explore the possibilities of the new rift-slipping technology. I continued to refine the equations here, but we have no way to know if our people back home have done so as well. The equations I sent will ensure they have what they need to make this happen. Assuming they won't need some time to build the equipment they need to open the rift, you might be stuck here for a while longer. Certainly a possibility. Maybe they've spent the last 50 years perfecting the technology on their own and building the hardware. If that's true, all they needed to know was that we're still alive and our location in the multiverse. Four hours later, Lucas was leaning back in his chair, watching the video screens, when he nodded off for a second. His nose snorted once, waking him up. He looked around to see if anyone noticed. Everyone seemed to be focused on other things, and nobody was looking at him. He stood up and walked briskly around the room, swinging his arms to get the blood flowing. He needed caffeine. I'm going to run down to the mess hall and grab a soda. Drew, you want one? Drew nodded. Anyone else? Coffee? Soda? Bagel? Lucas asked. Both Bruno and Cleesby declined. The video techs ignored him. As he walked to the elevator, his shadow suddenly appeared ahead of him and started jiggling along the back wall, jumping from one place to another with no predictable pattern. At the same time, Lucas noticed the look in the guard's eyes changed, as if something had caught their attention. The men leaned to the side and looked past him as he approached the elevator. Lucas turned around to see what they were looking at and saw a flickering bright light near the center of the room. It resembled a tiny lightning storm, maybe six inches wide, and it was expanding gradually. Guys! Lucas yelled, pointing at the phenomenon. Cleesby and Bruno turned to face him, as did Drew, whose eyes seemed to grow to the size of ping-pong balls. The security guards ran past Lucas with their weapons drawn. Cleesby scrambled around from the far side of the light and held out his arms. Stand down, he told his guards. They're our friends. The security guards lowered their guns and moved to the right of Cleesby, who was now standing on crutches a few feet in front of the light. Bruno slipped between the guards and Cleesby, while the video techs got up from their stations and waited to the far right of the security guards. They all seemed eager to greet their long-lost brethren. Lucas moved to the left of Cleesby and put his hand on his mentor's shoulder as a gesture of solidarity. Cleesby looked at him and smiled. Lucas nodded as Drew rolled in next to him on his left. The portal, now six feet in diameter, seemed to stabilize as its oscillating light rays slowed their pace. A trio of green laser beams appeared from the rift's center, spreading out horizontally across the elevator doors. Don't be alarmed, they're just following safety protocols and scanning the area, Cleesby said. The beams danced independently around the room, like spotlights piercing the night sky above a Hollywood movie premiere. Their pattern seemed random, moving quickly in multiple directions until every inch of the surveillance room had been mapped. Then they vanished. Here we go, Bruno said with excitement in his words. Fifteen seconds later, murky silhouettes of three tiny figures began to take shape at the center of the portal, as if they'd just stepped into view at the far end of a giant funnel. The figures moved forward toward the portal's event horizon, slowly growing in size. The figures thickened and solidified with each passing second. Even though they were no longer hazy shadows, Lucas still couldn't make out much in the way of detail. Their heads were larger than he expected, perhaps because they were wearing space suits or helmets of some kind, and it looked like they were carrying something in their hands. Lucas looked at Cleesby and then Bruno. Both men seemed to be mesmerized with anticipation, each smiling like a groom-to-be, enjoying his last night of freedom at a local strip club. Lucas was proud to be sharing this moment with his friends, who had toiled for decades to reach this epic milestone. It was too bad history hadn't been invited to this reunion. If it had, Lucas's name would have been forever etched into the annals of time for something positive and historic, never to be forgotten. But he knew that wouldn't be his future. His would be one of shame and persecution for being the asshole who brought the Krellians and their energy domes to Earth in the first place. Lucas turned off the self-pity party in his head and turned his focus to his mentor, he wondered what Cleesby was thinking right now. He couldn't imagine what it was like for the professor to be without his wife and son all these years, dreaming of them and longing to hold them close again. 
Would they be waiting for him on the other side with loving smiles and open arms? What if they weren't? What if Caroline was dead or had remarried? Would getting his people home be enough for Cleesby, or would it tear his guts out, leaving him a shell of a man? Drew was sitting next to Lucas's hip in his wheelchair, looking like a kid waiting for a hot fudge sundae to be delivered, completely oblivious to the complexities of Cleesby's homecoming. Drew was a glass-half-full kind of person, always looking on the bright side, always expecting things to work out. He admired his little brother for having that type of blind faith in the unexpected, but he wasn't wired that way. Lucas dealt with life's twisted sense of humor by planning for the worst and hoping for the best. It might seem like an overly simple concept to some, but it allowed him to sleep at night, especially now with all the blood on his hands. Fate had a funny way of finding him, often with harsh results. Lucas looked back at the portal just in time to see the visitors stepping through to his universe. He gasped and his chest tightened forcefully when he realized what had just come through wasn't human. He wanted to run for cover, but his feet wouldn't move. In an instant, his brain recorded what his eyes were seeing. Three nine-foot-tall creatures had arrived, each with a pair of giant claw-like appendages extended out in front. Their bodies were burnt orange in color and made of stacked layers of donut-shaped modules, like exposed vertebrae, held together by thin connecting tissue or bone. Their heads were stretched back horizontally into an elongated sphere, with two sets of glowing compound eyes along the front. Mucus dripped from the creatures' mouths, sliming down to the floor as the aliens moved. A collection of tentacles hung down from the rear of their exoskeletons like dreadlocks, maybe twenty feet long, with a pulsating orifice on each end. Stinger-like tails thrashed about behind the creatures, with barbs or serrated edges along the pointed tips. Two of the creatures advanced forward, standing in front of the third like a football team's offensive line moving to the line of scrimmage to block access to the quarterback. The first two aliens were carrying grappling devices mounted to their claws. Before the two security guards could get off a shot, the aliens fired, impaling the men with the jagged hooks. Almost immediately, the creatures retracted their weapons, ripping the men apart from the inside. Blood and guts splattered everywhere. The third alien raced forward, using the back of its mighty claw to knock Bruno, Cleesby, and Lucas across the room in one swing. Lucas landed upside down with his back against the wall, knocking the wind out of him. He was dazed, gasping for air, but alive. Bruno landed on top of Cleesby, just to Lucas's right. Neither of his colleagues was moving. The alien's tentacles snaked quickly along the floor and began siphoning the human remains through the pliable opening on the ends. When some of the bigger hunks were ingested, the tentacles bulged like a boa constrictor swallowing a rabbit for supper. Lucas tried to stand, wanting to protect Drew, who was sitting helpless in his wheelchair, but his legs wouldn't cooperate. The alien was much quicker than Lucas could have predicted. It snatched Drew from his wheelchair and wrapped him inside a web of tentacles before carrying him back to the portal. Drew was hanging horizontally against the creature's side, looking back at Lucas, with his leather pouch hanging free outside his shirt. Lucas cried out for Drew just as the creature disappeared through the rift with his brother in tow. Two of the techs picked up the security guard's handguns and fired at the two remaining creatures. The invaders raised their claws to protect their heads while the techs fired a continuous volley into what Lucas guessed were their torsos. A gooey orange substance gushed from their bodies each time a bullet hit its mark. The creatures backed up single file toward the rift, with their tentacles continuing to suck up the last few chunks of the guards. The creature nearest to the techs took the brunt of the weapon's fire, while the other one slipped through the portal. The remaining creature appeared to be succumbing to its wounds as it stumbled sideways into the portal's event horizon. The rift closed around it, chopping off one of its claws and legs. It flopped to the floor. Lucas was bent over, holding his abdomen, when the elevator doors opened and a four-man security team rushed into the room, followed by two medics Lucas recognized from the infirmary. He figured one of the video techs must have called for reinforcements. The security team dashed to surround the quivering alien, leaving behind boot prints in human blood. One of the medics, a woman, ran up to Lucas. Are you injured? Lucas nodded. 
Where does it hurt? She asked. Everywhere, Lucas grunted with diminished breath. He felt like he'd been hit by a cement truck. I think they just knocked the wind out of me. The female medic helped him off the floor and then raised his hands over his head. Try to relax. Take slow, deep breaths. Lucas's breathing slowly returned to normal. Better, he said, nodding. His whole body ached. I'll be all right. Go help my friends, Lucas told her, pointing at Cleesby and Bruno. While the medic was tending to his friends, Lucas staggered over to the portal's last position, pushing his way through the guards surrounding the wounded creature. The alien was convulsing, spurting jets of orange blood from its severed limbs and bullet wounds. Its claw, stinger, and tentacles were not moving, no longer a threat. Where's my brother? Lucas asked the creature, ignoring its putrid smell. There was no response. He kicked the creature in the head, crushing one of its four eyes. Answer me! He screamed at it before one of the guards pulled him away from the marauder. I doubt it understands you, the guard said. Those things took my brother, Lucas said, trying to squirm free from the guard's arm lock. I have to get him back! Look at it, the guard said, turning Lucas's body toward the creature. The convulsions had stopped, and its eyes had started to dim. It's almost dead. It's never going to tell you anything. Reality set in, sending a torrent of emotions washing over Lucas. His mind and body went numb. He dropped to his knees with his mouth open and his eyes full of tears. He sobbed into his hands as his heart screamed in silence for his brother. Several minutes later, Lucas felt a sudden calm come over the room. He wiped off his cheeks and nose and then looked up. The guards were helping the medical team remove the alien's carcass from the surveillance room. Both Cleesby and Bruno were alive and receiving treatment from the female medic who'd helped him earlier. Lucas stepped around the pool of orange blood and walked up to Cleesby. We have to go after Drew. I wish we could, but there's no way to find him. Even if we knew where he was, we can't open the rift from this side. We can't just sit here. There has to be something we can do. Trust me. He'll be all right. They won't hurt him. How the hell could you possibly know that? Because the Krellians didn't send through a battalion of warriors to kill us all. It was only a small surgical strike. They're going to want to trade. For what? The biotechs. But why Drew? Why not me or you? We were much closer to it. Cleesby looked at Lucas with an apologetic look on his face. The man's expression changed, and so did his eyes. He looked like he was about to throw up. Lucas could sense another revelation was about to erupt from his mentor's lips. I know that look, he snapped, feeling a rising swell of trepidation mounting in his chest. There's something else you haven't told me. What is it? Tell me, dammit. What the hell is going on? I know why they took Drew, and not the rest of us. Lucas flared his eyes at the man, sticking out his chin in anger. Because Drew is my son, Cleesby said, with obvious heartbreak fueling his words. Lucas's brain went into a spin. What? Cleesby ushered Lucas to a chair sitting in front of the video control station. Have a seat and let me explain. Lucas sat down in the chair with his arms folded across his chest. Every cell in his body was filled with anger and disbelief. Cleesby took a seat across from him. Remember when I told you earlier that after we crashed, my crew began to pair off and start new families? Yeah. Well... I couldn't bring myself to choose a new woman. I loved my wife too much, and I still held out hope we'd get home. But eventually, after twenty years of futility, even I began to doubt our chances of getting home. I gave in to the realization we might be marooned on your planet for a long time, quite possibly for generations. I was lonely and decided I needed a son, someone to carry on my legacy and continue the work— but I was too old and too busy to raise a child, and I certainly didn't want a new wife. Lucas was starting to suspect Cleesby had knocked up Drew's mom. Jesus Christ, Professor, what did you do? I had our geneticist open a fertility clinic. Lucas hesitated for a moment, thinking about the professor's last statement. I'm guessing it was the same one that Drew's bio mom chose? Yes. We needed a woman with no family, a compatible genetic makeup, and who possessed superior intelligence. Lauren Falconio fit the bill. After she selected her donor sperm, we hijacked her pregnancy and inseminated her with my sperm. I'm not proud of what we did, but if we hadn't, Drew wouldn't be here today.
It took a minute for the words to sink in before Lucas was able to speak again. How did the aliens know Drew was your son? When they scanned the room, they must have checked our genetic markers and determined he was my offspring. What about me? Lucas asked, wondering what earth-shattering revelation was next. Am I one of your offspring too? Cleesby shook his head. No, you're not. Only Drew. How can I believe anything you say at this point? Well, believe what you want, but it's true. Part of Lucas was disappointed that Cleesby wasn't his father too, but the rest of him felt a deep sense of regret and... He wasn't sure why. Then, his mind put a spotlight on his childhood, helping him remember some key moments from his early life. That's when it hit him. That's when he realized how he felt about his adoptive father. Pride. He was proud of the unaccomplished man who'd taken him and drew in, even if he never amounted to much in the grand scheme of things. John was a man of deep conviction and unwavering honesty, something Cleesby lacked from head to toe. But at the same time, Lucas was angry at the world for not recognizing his father's genius when he'd released his amazing pest control invention. Dishonest, manipulative men like Cleesby got all the breaks, he decided, leaving genuine souls like his father to flounder in obscurity. Just like everything else in life, it wasn't fair, and he'd just about had it with everyone and their secret agendas. Lucas brought his eyes up. So my being a part of this is what, an accident? Hardly. After we had your intelligence tested, we arranged for the two of you to be roommates in the orphanage. I had hoped you two would bond. Lucas figured Drew was going to be pissed when he learned that Cleesby, his bio dad, knew his whereabouts the entire time, but chose to leave him in the orphanage to fend for himself. The video screen in the back of his mind suddenly played a movie of Drew crying himself to sleep night after night in the orphanage, which wouldn't have been necessary if Cleesby had stepped up and taken responsibility for his progeny. Maybe Cleesby wasn't confident in his skills as a single parent, or perhaps his wife Caroline took care of all the child rearing, leaving Cleesby to focus solely on work. Whatever the reason, Lucas had just lost more respect for Cleesby not as an accomplished scientist, but as a man and father. Do the right thing was something his adoptive father always preached to him, and now Lucas understood what John was trying to teach him. It's not what you make of yourself in the world that matters, it's how you carry yourself. Respect is a reputation well-earned, and it takes a lifetime of dedication to accomplish. What about our adoption? Lucas asked. Did you arrange that too? We may have helped nudge it along a bit. So you've orchestrated everything since day one? Cleesby nodded. We needed to keep close tabs on you, and Drew. And the free rent? I would have done that regardless. And you should probably know, Trevor isn't just your lab assistant. He's also your bodyguard. That makes sense in retrospect, Lucas said. Why didn't you tell Drew he was your son? Simple, really. He has a family, a good one. Telling him I'm his biological father would only muddy the situation. But he has a right to know. You may be right, but I prefer you not tell him or your mother. It could destroy your family, and I'm sure you don't want that. Lucas wasn't sure if he agreed with Cleesby's reasoning, but nodded anyway. Regardless of what Cleesby thought or expected of him, Drew was his primary responsibility. If he later decided to tell Drew the truth, he would. Cleesby would just have to deal with it. Fuck him, he decided. Lucas started thinking about his biological parents and the humiliating stories he was told about their criminal pasts. He'd always secretly hoped their backgrounds were a fabrication of lies, but never expected it to be a possibility, until now. Was my bio mom really a drug addict? Yes, and your biological father died in prison. That all happened before we placed you with Drew. So much for ridding himself of some emotional baggage... He'd never be that lucky. What about Drew's bio mom? Is she really dead? Cleesby nodded in a strange manner, acting as if he wasn't telling the whole truth. Oh my God. You didn't run her car off the road, did you? No, it was a tragic accident. We had nothing to do with it. Well, what is it then? The photograph Drew carries around his neck isn't hers. It's a picture of one of my crew, someone who died a long time ago. What? Why would you give him a fake photo? 
We didn't have a good photo of Lauren to use. Then why'd you even bother? We needed something he'd carry with him at all times. There's a tracking device and audio transmitter hidden inside the photo's backing paper. Lucas's head spun when those words landed on his ears. Did he just hear the professor correctly? Had Cleesby been eavesdropping on them all their lives? Lucas was certain somewhere along the way, a few embarrassing or slanderous conversations must have taken place between him and Drew that Cleesby never should have heard. Was the audio on all the time? No, not all the time. Lucas wasn't sure he believed him. But you always seemed to know when we needed help. Cleesby nodded. I kept tabs. Lucas was still pissed, but now wasn't the time to dwell on the transmitter and the privacy issues. He decided to save that debate for later, and focus for now on saving his brother. That was when an idea popped into his head. Can we use the tracking device in the pouch to find Drew? If we could get close enough, yes, but it won't work across dimensions. For now, we have to wait for the Krellians to contact us and arrange an exchange. Not much of a plan, Lucas thought. He expected something more out of Cleesby, the man who was a former starship captain and supposed to be the master planner. He'd hoped for a more direct response to the Krellian threat. Can't we just overpower them the next time the portal opens? And do what? Send in a handful of men? If they're opening the portal from one of their hive ships, we'd be outnumbered a hundred thousand to one. It'll just get everyone killed, Drew included. No, we're going to wait and see what they want, and then formulate a rescue plan. Right now, the best course of action is to step back and think rationally. They may look like simple, overgrown bugs, but they're very cunning and formidable. Bruno tapped Cleesby on the shoulder. Boss, we really need to start preparing for the exchange. Cleesby acknowledged Bruno's request, then turned to Lucas. Are we good? They were far from good, Lucas thought, but he wasn't going to push too hard against Cleesby, at least not while Drew was being held captive by the Krellians. His main responsibility was to save Drew and protect his mom, and to do that, he needed Cleesby for the time being. Well, Cleesby asked. Yeah. Lucas nodded, though he didn't want to. We're good. Chapter 27 An hour later, Lucas was standing next to Trevor and Bruno in the video room, listening to Cleesby give instructions to a gathering of armed guards. Three of the ten men were Bruno copies. When the rift opens again, I want you to spread out and flank the opening just in case they decide to attack. It'll be harder for them to select their targets if we're not all grouped together. Did you bring the stunners? Yes, sir, one of the men replied, opening a black duffel bag. He pulled out weapons and distributed them to his squad. He also gave a stunner to Trevor. Can I get one of those? Lucas asked, hoping to join the fight. Even though he didn't have any formal training, he figured he could aim and shoot an energy-based weapon much easier than a regular handgun. How hard could it be? Cleesby nodded, taking a stunner from the guard handing them out and giving it to Lucas. He put the tip of his finger on the switch sitting on top of the gun. Set your weapons to stun level two, which is right here. I doubt level one will be sufficient to incapacitate their sentinels. When Cleesby clicked the switch, Lucas could see the gun's green power meter increasing from halfway to full. As it did, the indicator showed the weapon's energy bank increasing to maximum, giving off a short-lived hum that increased in pitch. Everyone else standing nearby followed suit, filling the room with a symphony of harmonic sounds. Cleesby told his techs, I want all our sensors and recording equipment trained on the portal to see if we can trace it back to their location. We may not get another chance, so let's get it right the first time. Another hour crawled by before the Krellians finally made their appearance. Their arrival started with the portal opening with a flicker of light, in the same manner and location as before, sending the security team into action. The guards fanned out and took position ten feet in front of the expanding rift, with their backs only a few feet from the elevator doors. Cleesby hobbled around on crutches behind the gauntlet of men. Lucas joined him. It was the most defensible position in case they needed to make a quick retreat into the elevator. Trevor and the original Bruno copy were standing to the left, just in front of the hidden entrance to the med lab. Both of them were armed with stunner weapons. A single Krellian warrior stepped through the rift, carrying a naked human female out in front like a protective shield. 
The red-headed young woman's eyes were closed, and her limp body was covered in blood and bruises. The lower section of her right leg was shredded, as if it had been torn off at the shin, then cauterized by an intense heat source. The creature swung her from side to side as it stepped forward, furnishing Lucas with a clear view of her back. He almost puked. The alien had impaled the center of her spine with one of its tentacles, wearing her like a ten-cent hand puppet. Blood was dripping from around the insertion point. Her eyes opened halfway and focused on Lucas while she reached out slowly with one trembling hand. Kill me, please, she said in a weak, thready voice. Her face was creased in pain, sending a stab of anguish into Lucas's heart. He wanted to help her by putting her out of her misery, but he couldn't. Drew's life was at stake, and he knew taking action would probably kill him. He needed to make a choice, a tough choice, one that would surely haunt him forever. He broke eye contact with her and looked away. When he brought his eyes back, her wilted body quivered, then fully energized as she began to speak in a low-pitched, monotone voice. It sounded as though two bellowing male voices were speaking in unison. We have cripple. Give us substance, or cripple dies. Ugly species dies. Blue planet dies. We return in one revolution. Give us substance, and we give cripple. After the short speech, the creature stepped backward into the rift, managing to get one of its legs across the event horizon before Bruno did what Lucas couldn't bring himself to do, take action. The security chief fired his stunner, blasting the alien on the right side, which sent an energy discharge traveling across its body and down its tentacles. The female interpreter fell from the tentacle's grip just as the alien disappeared through the rift. The portal closed an instant later, leaving her lying on the floor in the silo, crying. Everyone except Lucas rushed forward to help, kneeling down next to her. He stood alone, embarrassed by his earlier cowardice. How could he face her now? What would he say? She started crying in a feeble voice from the center of the crowd of good Samaritans surrounding her, blocking Lucas's view of her eyes. Let's get her to the infirmary, Cleesby commanded with his back to Lucas. Trevor stood up, so did Bruno with the woman draped across his arms. The giant Swede removed his white tunic and lay it over her naked body, restoring some of her humanity. Lucas stood aside as Bruno rushed her to the elevator. Her head and lone remaining foot were hanging below his arms, flaccid and calm. Lucas could now see her face, but mercifully her eyes were closed. He prayed she couldn't feel the pain from the injuries across her frail-looking body, Bruno stepped into the elevator and was quickly followed in by Trevor. The doors closed in a swoosh a few moments later. Cleesby slid his crutches forward, bumping into Lucas's left elbow. We'll take the next elevator. We? You and I need to debrief her. Maybe she knows where they're holding Drew. Shouldn't we let them treat her first? She didn't look so good. That's precisely why we must talk to her now. What if she dies or lapses into a coma? If she can provide some intel, we're going to need it. 24 hours isn't much time to mount a rescue plan. Lucas was standing in the infirmary along the back wall between Cleesby and Bruno. They were still waiting to speak to the unconscious woman, who was being treated by a male physician and three nurses. Trevor had returned to the med lab at Cleesby's behest. I'll be right back, Lucas said to Cleesby, before wandering over to the isolation ward's viewing window. He couldn't help himself. He needed to check again. He wiped off the glass, using his right index finger as a squeegee to clear the patch of frost blocking his view. The creature's body was right where it was supposed to be, lying on the table farthest from the window, and it wasn't moving. He checked, but found nothing slithering down from the table or hiding in the corner of the room. He'd seen it happen too many times in the movies where the alien's body wasn't actually dead, only to suddenly spring back to life and catch the unsuspecting heroes by surprise, usually while they were enjoying a premature victory celebration. Lucas returned to his colleagues and nodded once. It's all good. Still dead. Can we really afford to just keep waiting, boss? Bruno asked Cleesby with a curious look on his face. Cleesby looked at him then at his watch, then at the medical team. He sighed and shook his head several times. No, 
The wait ends now, he said, lifting his chin and hobbling closer to the medical team. Doc, give her something to wake her up. It was the third time Cleesby had made the demand. Look, I told you before, Professor, she's not strong enough. Giving her a stimulant now might kill her. We can't wait any longer. My son's life is at stake, Cleesby replied in a sharp voice. No, I'm not going to take the risk. Cleesby grabbed the doc by the collar, pulling the man close to his face. Give me the damn syringe, and I'll inject her myself. Cleesby let go of the doctor, shoving him back a step in the process. Okay, okay, the doc replied, handing Cleesby a syringe loaded with a stimulant. The man backed away with his hands out to his sides. But you're responsible if she dies. One of the nurses used an alcohol swab to sterilize the woman's neck. While the alcohol dried, Cleesby held up the syringe, removed the needle guard, then tapped the needle gently while squeezing the plunger until a drop of liquid appeared on the tip. It was as if the professor had done it a thousand times before. He aimed the needle at her neck, inserted it, then pressed the plunger to shoot the load of stimulant into her system. He handed the empty syringe to the nurse assisting him. Should only take a few seconds, the nurse said, looking at the doctor, then back at Cleesby. The fingers on the injured woman's left hand twitched, then her head turned toward the center. Moments later, she opened her eyes and looked directly at Cleesby, who was leaning over her like a mother hawk ready to feed her young. He spoke softly to her. What's your name? Alicia, the woman answered in barely more than a whisper. Where am I? You're in a hospital. My name's Dr. Cleesby. D.L. Cleesby, she replied, her words a little more coherent than before. Uh... Yes. You know who I am? No, but my handler did. I could hear it thinking about you. They've been searching the galaxy for you. Cleesby lifted one eyebrow and tilted his head as if he were moderately surprised. Perhaps it was more of a look of pride, knowing he was important enough for his enemy to dedicate years of their lives in pursuit of him. Was anyone else with you? Lucas asked, leaning in to catch her attention. She hesitated, showing a look that indicated she was deep in thought, searching for something in her memories. Just then, the machinery monitoring her vital signs reacted like an angry child, throwing a barrage of chirps and beeps across the room. Her eyes turned sharp, looking at Cleesby. Julianne! she screamed, trying to sit up. She thrashed her arms at Cleesby, hitting him several times in the face. Cleesby wrestled with her, trying to deflect the attack. Two nurses jumped in, grabbing her shoulders and pulled her back down to the bed. Cleesby stepped back and stumbled on his crutches when she started kicking her legs at everyone around the bed. Lucas gasped when her mangled stump of a leg whacked him in the thigh, narrowly missing his groin. The nurses struggled with her arms, but managed to restrain her long enough for Lucas and Cleesby to lash her down using the leather straps sewn around the bed frame. Let me go, she cried out, pulling at the arm straps, keeping her subdued. I have to find my sister. Where is she? We need you to calm down, Cleesby answered sharply, holding her right hand with both of his. Your sister isn't here. You're the only one we rescued. The doctor slid in next to Cleesby, replacing one of the nurses. She turned her head toward the edge of the pillow and started crying with anger. A minute later, she stopped suddenly, as if something important just caught her attention. She opened her eyes, looked back at Cleesby, and asked, Where am I? In a hospital. No, not that. What planet am I on? Earth. No, 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 she said, looking around frantically like she was afraid for her life. Yes, Earth. Oh, God, please, no. Everything's going to be okay, Alicia. But it's occupied territory, she replied with panic in her voice. They'll be coming for us. We have to get out of here. Cleesby smiled softly at her, rubbing the back of her hand with his thumbs. No, child. We're on a different earth. You're perfectly safe here. Trust me. Julianne, she said in a sad voice, trailing off in volume as she lay her head back on the pillow. She stared silently at the ceiling with a blank expression on her face. Can you tell me what happened to you? Cleesby asked her. She brought her eyes back to the professor. My sister and I were walking back to our village when those creatures appeared out of nowhere. They took us prisoner. The Krellians? Yeah, sentinels armed with shredder hooks, but we didn't know who they were at first. We'd only heard stories about them. Then what happened? They took us to their ship and delivered us to one of their leaders who stripped off our clothes. 
Alicia then lifted and twisted her torso, revealing a raised scar on her right shoulder, carved into her skin in two sections. The bottom was an infinity symbol, and the top was a pair of broken lines, like wiggly sevens, only split at the midpoint. They made one of the older women do this to me with a hot knife. She was crying as hard as I was. I know she didn't want to brand me, but she didn't have a choice. How long ago was this? Cleesby asked. I'm not sure. A couple of months, maybe? Is that the last time you saw your sister? Alicia nodded. She and I were split up right after. I haven't seen her since. Did they do this to your sister too? Lucas asked, watching her eyes turn sad again when his question landed on her ears. He thought the girl was going to start crying again, but she didn't. It was clear Alicia was fighting her emotions, but somehow she held it together and didn't break down again. For some reason, no, they didn't. I think she may have been traded to one of the other factions. Or worse. Other factions? There are dozens of them. Some get along peacefully, but some fight over territory and feeding grounds. I think it's why they brand us, like cattle. Where was your village? On Colony 12. Lucas looked at Cleesby to see if the professor knew the name of the colony. His blank expression indicated he didn't. She added, I found out later they'd already invaded Earth, which is why no one warned us they were coming. Lucas tugged at Cleesby's shirt sleeve, then nodded for the professor to follow him away from the bed. Both of them moved to the corner of the room, where they huddled together to have a chat. What if Earth was already occupied territory when our E-121 module arrived? Lucas asked in a low voice, not wanting the girl to hear what they were talking about. She was already emotionally unstable, and he didn't want to make the situation worse. Cleesby's eyes indicated he was deep in thought. Then he nodded with pinched eyebrows. If that's true, then our enemy intercepted it, not our people. It would explain their sudden appearance here, and their possession of the rift-opening technology, Lucas added. The professor nodded, hobbling back to the bed. Lucas followed, knowing his actions caused this innocent girl to suffer unimaginable pain when the bugs impaled her spine in order to communicate. His list of victims was growing by the minute, making his insides ache even more. They'd better come up with a plan to get Drew back, and soon, then, figure out a way to end all this suffering across the universe. His shoulders couldn't support the weight of any more guilt. Was anyone else on the ship with you? The professor asked the girl. Yes, a lot of us, all women. No men? She started crying again. They eat them. We could hear their screams. Lucas's face went numb as those words sank in. Some of the men killed themselves so they wouldn't be eaten, she said through more tears. The Krellians, they like to eat their food alive. Lucas's mind went into frenzy mode, worrying for Drew. He tapped the professor on the arm and waited for Cleesby to look at him before he spoke. I thought you said Drew would be safe. Cleesby shook his head quickly without saying anything, then shot a disapproving look back. Lucas understood the gesture. The professor wanted him to shut the hell up. It wasn't easy, not with the flashes of blood and guts filling his thoughts, but he held his tongue, for now. Why only the men, Cleesby asked, turning back to the girl. They keep the women as breeders, Alicia answered, tears streaming down her face. Breeders, Lucas snapped, feeling the knot in the pit of his stomach swell. He wanted to scream and punch something, thinking of what the bugs might be doing to his brother. Alicia's voice cracked as she tried to catch her breath between the waves of emotion and tears pouring out of her. They keep us pregnant so we can provide them with more food. They prefer live children. Oh my god, it's so awful to watch. I can't stand it when they come for the newborns. Lucas clenched his jaw as he stared at the edge of the bed, wondering how God, if he existed, could allow such barbaric creatures to exist in the universe. His mind spun with a terrifying vision of Drew lying on a table as the main course of a meal, while a swarm of Krellians pulled at his arms and legs, tearing them off at the joints as if they were eating a live chicken. If there are no men, how do they keep you pregnant? Bruno asked from behind Cleesby. His voice was soft and tender, but Lucas still couldn't believe the callousness of his friend's question. Alicia answered anyway, pushing the words out through her obvious grief. They farm semen from them before they're, she said, 
stopping mid-sentence. Those of us who can't bear children are used as translators or nannies, or we're thrown into the feeding pit with the men. Lucas figured that's what she meant earlier when she talked about her sister's fate and used the words, or worse. Alicia, I know how hard this is to talk about, but we need everything if we're going to help you and your sister. Do you think you can answer a few more questions for us? Cleesby asked. She nodded, wiping the tears from her cheeks. I'll try. Can you tell me what happened to your leg? The girl gulped as her eyes filled with more despair. She took a few deep breaths before answering. Sometimes they run low on food, and the sentinels decide to ration us, but it doesn't always sit well with the others. Sometimes one of them will sneak into our cell after dark and drag us to a different room, away from the others. That's what happened to me and another girl one night. We both tried to get away, but the creature kept hitting us with its claw. Then it started on her. Every time I close my eyes, I can still see the girl's face screaming at me to help her. She couldn't have been more than fifteen. I was so scared, I couldn't move. So I just sat there in the corner and covered my ears so I didn't have to listen to the sound of her bones crunching. She closed her eyes while drawing in a series of quick, shallow breaths before she spoke again. Oh my God, the blood, it was everywhere. Lucas couldn't imagine what this young girl had been through, nor did he really want to, but he couldn't ignore her. Her plight infuriated him. It was more than any human should ever have to endure. His empathy for her galvanized his resolve. His brother was in the hands of these heinous creatures, and hearing Alicia's story fueled his internal drive to save Drew at all costs. She let out another round of tears before looking up at Cleesby. When it finished with her, it came after me. I wished I was already dead. I almost passed out when it started on my leg, but one of their sentinels showed up to stop it. Then it took me to another chamber where it burned my leg to stop the bleeding. A few minutes later, I was moved to a room filled with some fancy equipment where my handler put its tentacle in my back. The room fell into an emotional silence. Everyone's eyes were focused on the girl, as was their compassion, Lucas assumed. He imagined the collective hearts of Cleesby and the rest of his crew were now beating with the force of a thunderous herd. His was. Why should theirs be any different? Cleesby unstrapped Alicia from his side of the bed. Lucas did the same on the other side, wondering what else he could do to help this girl. Alicia sniffed a few times as her tears slowed, using her forearm to wipe her nose. Lucas spun and found a box of tissues behind him and gave it to her. She blew her nose and thanked him. Cleesby asked her, When you were connected to the creature, do you remember what you said to us? Yeah, I think I remember most of it. Do you know if my brother's still alive? Lucas asked. She nodded, then reached over and touched his hand. Despite all she'd been through and all the pain she was in, she still had compassion for Lucas's situation. His heart reached out to her. He admired her strength and courage. If she could handle captivity, he knew Drew could handle it too. Are they going to give him back if we hand over the biotechs? No. They're planning to invade as soon as you turn over the stuff they want. They're never going to pass up such a rich feeding ground. You have to get everyone out of here. Lucas looked at Cleesby and then at Bruno, hoping for some indication of what to do next. Bruno seemed distracted, standing a few feet away, touching his finger to his ear. A few moments later, he touched his watch and said, Ten four, before walking up to the professor and tapping him on the shoulder. Cleesby turned, allowing Bruno to whisper something in his ear. When Bruno was finished, the professor smiled and said, Excellent. You know what to do. Bruno nodded, then quickly left the infirmary. What's going on? Lucas asked, figuring the only course of action was to storm the rift when the creatures reappeared. Maybe his earlier suggestion to attack wasn't so idiotic after all. Cleesby didn't respond. Instead, he asked Alicia, If we can get you back on their ship, do you think you'd be able to show us where they're holding my son? No way. I'm never going back. I'll kill myself first. What about your sister? She could still be on the ship, Lucas said, hoping to change her mind. It was a lot to ask of the girl, but they really didn't have a choice at this point. She sighed, then sat quietly, gently shaking her head while staring off into space. 
she might have been considering his request or resigning herself to the fact that Julianne was long gone. Can you at least draw us a map? Lucas asked, wondering if the girl's connection to the Sentinel's thoughts had provided her with access to the ship's layout. She looked at him for a few seconds, then answered, Yeah, I think so. Lucas smiled, then ran to the medical table and picked up a red pen and clipboard. He turned the medical paperwork over to check the backside of the paper. It was blank. He hustled back to the bed and gave her the pen and paper. Here, draw on this. Chapter 28 Lucas handed Alicia's map to Cleesby, then followed the professor back to the elevator and rode with him down to the surveillance room, where they met up with Bruno and Trevor. Sir, we've confirmed the data and their ship's spatial coordinates, Bruno reported, handing a report to Cleesby. Cleesby looked over the paperwork for a minute, then replied, Nice work, gentlemen. He gave the report back to Bruno, who passed it to Trevor. What's going on, professor? Lucas asked. Our scans of the rift provided us with new data. Looks like I was wrong. About what? It might be possible to open the rift from this side. So we are going after Drew? Cleesby nodded. But we'll need a plan to deal with their army. Bruno stepped forward and stood at attention. My team and I are ready to go. Just give the order, sir. Count me in too, Lucas said, patting Bruno on the back. Trust me, we'll get Drew back. You realize this is probably a suicide mission for all of you. Then so be it, Lucas replied. I'd rather die trying to save my brother than just sit here waiting to be eaten by those things. Hell, give us some frag grenades and we'll take out as many of those ugly bastards as we can. Look, I want to get Drew back just as much as you do, but let's not go off half-cocked. We need to step back and think this through, Cleesby said, walking away with his hand stroking his gray beard. Lucas moved to intercept his boss, but Bruno latched onto his elbow and said, Give him a few minutes. The colorful tattoos on Bruno's forearms danced as his powerful grip held Lucas in place. When Bruno flexed his left arm in just the right way, the artwork connected with a fresh memory in Lucas's head. He suddenly realized the drawings weren't just random artistry. They were imprecise and aging a bit, but he recognized the misshapen head, long stinger tail, and pair of claws. He shot Bruno an inquisitive look, pointing at the man's tats. Hey, I just realized something. Your ink. They're supposed to represent the bugs, aren't they? Bruno nodded, his face turning sour. I wear them as a reminder of what stranded us here, so we'd never forget what we're up against. Shit, and all this time I thought they were a loose representation of scorpions or something along those lines, Lucas said, studying the renderings more carefully. His eyes observed something new about the creature's physical appearance, its segmented body. His mind churned through several ideas until one of them bubbled to the surface. It involved his dad's failed pest control device. Lucas turned to his boss, barely able to contain his sudden excitement. Dr. Cleesby, is it all right if I make a quick trip home to Phoenix? There's something there I need to get. The professor whirled around and looked at Lucas as if he were sizing him up for something. What is it? An invention my old man was working on before he died. If my mom hasn't tossed it away, it just might help us breach the Krellian stronghold. He shook his head, tightening his scowl. I don't think splitting up is a wise idea right now. The safest place for all of us is right here. We need to stick together. Please, sir, for Drew's sake and ours, I think, no, check that, I know my dad's tech can help us. Cleesby didn't respond, so Lucas continued his plea. Please, sir, I need you to trust me on this. It won't take long for me to run up to Phoenix and grab what I need. I'll be back before you even miss me, but I really need to do this. Right now, I'm completely useless around here, and I need to do something to help get Drew back and stop all the senseless deaths. Please, I beg you, Professor, let me go and do this. Cleesby hesitated, then looked at his watch. Fine, but you're not going alone. Bruno will escort you. Lucas locked eyes with Bruno. Okay, but I'm driving this time. I don't think that'll be necessary, Cleesby said, turning to his lead tech. Is the jump station still viable at the hockey arena? The man typed into his computer, then reported, Confirmed, sir. The pad's still online and operational. What about ground transportation once you arrive? Cleesby asked Bruno. Our van should still be parked in the underground garage. All right, then. You go with Lucas, but make it quick. Ninety minutes later, Lucas and Bruno returned from their trip to Phoenix. Lucas put a torn, dirty cardboard box on the floor in front of Cleesby, then blew a cloud of dust off the top. 
He'd found it in a corner of his dad's workshop next to a pile of old clothes ready for donation to Goodwill. So what do you have for me? Cleesby asked. My dad's best invention, Lucas said with a proud grin on his face. He unfolded the box and pulled out a black device the size of a cigarette pack, which was attached to a two-inch square power transformer. He untangled the six-foot electrical cord before handing it to Cleesby. Dad called it a sonic pad. Cleesby tested the device's retractable legs before wiping the dirt off the ring of sensors lined up across its middle, directly below the miniature antenna protruding from its top. He gave the unit to Bruno. Lucas pulled out another item lying in the bottom of the box, a notebook containing his dad's handwritten notes. He opened the journal, fanning the pages to demonstrate its contents before giving it to Cleesby. Dad's handwriting is worse than a doctor's, but I can translate it if you need me to. What's this thing do? Bruno asked, holding the sonic pad away from his body as if it were an explosive. It's for pest control, and it works awesome. Lucas thought about mentioning the device's one minor flaw, but decided against it. He didn't see how the liquefaction of a dog's brain had any relevance to their current situation. At least the device wasn't harmful to humans. Pests? Bruno asked. Dad networked a series of these around our yard to kill scorpions. If one of them crawled inside the perimeter, the motion sensors triangulated its location, sending a finely tuned blend of infrasonic and ultrasonic sound waves at the creature. The blast was powerful enough to shatter the bug's segmented body. They'd explode like popcorn. Cleesby was busy skimming through the journal and remained silent. My dad hated scorpions. They were always wandering inside the house at night, and after Mom stepped on her third one, he decided we needed to do something else. The commercial pesticides he sprayed were slow to work, if at all. Damn ingenious, Cleesby said, pointing at one particular page in the notebook. The pad emits an inaudible set of specifically calibrated sonic pulses to attack the creature's nervous system. Do you think we can adapt it? Lucas asked his boss. For what? Bruno replied. For the Krellians, Lucas answered. Cleesby let out a thin smile from the corner of his mouth. This just might work, but we'll need to crank up the juice considerably. I was thinking we could use E-121 for the additional power, Lucas said. The professor gave him a proud look. Excellent idea. We can use it to power all of them. Bruno gave the device in his hands to Lucas, then looked inside the box. Uh, boss, looks like there's only one. Right now there is, Cleesby said in a matter-of-fact way, still scanning the information in the notebook. Lucas knew where the professor was going with this. You're going to use the biotechs to duplicate more of them, right? Yes, we'll need to arm each member of the rescue team with one of the modified sonic pads. We certainly don't have enough ammo to take out a hive ship full of sentinels. Lucas smiled, feeling damn good about himself. I figured you could use the biotechs for inanimate objects too. Yes, we can, though Trevor will need to modify the replication code a bit. Granted, it's not a very efficient use of our technology, but given our limited options, we really don't have much of a choice. Do we have time to make them all? Lucas asked, wondering how long it would take Trevor to make the changes. We're good, Cleesby said, opening the med lab's hidden door and walking inside. Lucas followed him to where Trevor was standing and working. Rig a power source based on E-121 and make as many copies of this as you can, Cleesby told Trevor. I need it weaponized by morning. Yeah, will do, the Swedish giant responded, taking the device from the professor. The following day, Lucas was heading to the video room to meet up with Cleesby and his staff after the food run along the way. The Krellians were due to reappear in 62 minutes for the exchange, but first he stopped at the mess hall on the way to fill up on caffeine. He'd battled a serious case of insomnia through the night, leaving him exhausted. He couldn't get Drew out of his mind. He kept seeing his little brother sitting in a corner of a Krellian holding cell, surrounded by the blood and guts of hundreds of men, all of whom had been eaten right before his eyes. The jolt cola he grabbed in the cafeteria did the trick and energized his body, but it still didn't change the way he felt on the inside. When he looked back over the events of the past few days, it all seemed surreal. He felt like he was in some low-budget sci-fi movie, one filled with endless twists and turns, almost too absurd for anyone to believe. Yet, it was real, and happening to him, and to his family. If he and his brother somehow survived this mess, he promised himself to write a novel about their experiences. Even if no one ever read their story, he felt it was important to chronicle the events and to pay homage to those who'd suffered and died.
He'd spent several hours of the previous evening consoling his mother after explaining what had happened to Drew. It wasn't easy to confess his sins and his failures to her, but he managed to get through it. He took great care to relay the tragic events with a positive spin, but despite his optimism, Dorothy took the news of Drew's abduction extremely hard. Promise me you'll get him back. I don't care what it takes. You get it done, you hear me? She said, while hugging him tight the previous night. He could still hear the words ringing in his ears, stinging like acid rain on the edges of his heart. Ever since Lucas met his brother in the orphanage, he'd been Drew's protector. It was his singular most important job. His life wasn't about E-121 experiments, thesis papers, or fame and fortune. It was about Drew and the rest of his family. That was all that really mattered in the world. Family. He knew it and accepted it, especially after he'd promised his dying father he'd always watch over Drew and keep him safe. Yet, when the Krellians came through the rift and snatched Drew, he froze like a total coward, showing his true colors. There was no denying it. He was a miserable failure as a man, as a son, and as a brother. His mom didn't come right out and say it, but he knew she was very disappointed in him. He worried that if he failed to get Drew back, she'd never forgive him, and seeing the disappointment in her eyes was something he couldn't live with, not on top of everything else. After stopping at the mess hall for his caffeine fix, Lucas decided to take another detour to the armory before heading to the surveillance room. He went inside, planning to stock up on a few items he might need. He never bothered to get approval from Cleesby to carry heavy today, mainly because he was going to do it regardless of what his boss said, but also because this wasn't the professor's decision. It was his. He was going to do his job and get Drew back, or die trying. End of story. He was tired of being a coward and wasn't going to let anyone or anything stop him. Not the professor, not Bruno, and certainly not the Krellians. A traditional handgun would be too loud for a stealthy assault, so he decided to grab two of Cleesby's stunners instead. He strapped one of them to his ankle and slipped the other one inside the back of his trousers. He put on one of the Kevlar vests lying in a stack to his right, concealing it with his shirt. He went outside and stood tall in the hallway, taking in a few deep breaths to steal himself. He was ready, ready for whatever the universe had in store for him. There were only two possible endings to the story, and he was ready for whichever one fate threw at him today. When Lucas stepped out of the elevator and walked into the video room, he found Cleesby and Trevor fitting Bruno with a jet black vest. Five feet away from them was a four-wheeled sled with a stack of five-gallon containers filled to the brim with scarlet-colored liquid. The vest contained a series of bulging pockets with a set of electrical wires hopscotching between them. All the vest needed was a few dozen sticks of dynamite, and Bruno would have looked like a suicide bomber ready to take out a shopping mall. Bruno's street clothes bulged from under the vest, white polo shirt, dark slacks, and brown loafers. The polo shirt fit his sagging gut much better than his uniform top did, except it highlighted his baseball-sized belly button recess. The only part of Bruno's outfit Lucas recognized was the pentagon-shaped watch. Overall, Bruno actually looked good in casual attire. What do you think? Cleesby asked Lucas, leaning forward on his crutches to tug at the open belt clip hanging from the front of Bruno's vest. Trevor did a hell of a job integrating your father's device. Yeah, no doubt, Lucas said, beaming a prideful smile. Looks a little snug, though, don't you think? It's not bad, Bruno said, clipping the belt to close the vest around his midsection. There was a second vest lying on the table next to Trevor. Since it was much too small to fit Trevor or Cleesby, Lucas assumed the vest was for him. Either that, or it was for one of the skinny security officers to wear. He assumed they only had time to make two vests, not the dozen Cleesby ordered. We're calling it a sonic disruptor, Cleesby said. Lucas picked up the second vest to inspect it. He was surprised to see six of his father's sonic pads installed around the outside of the garment, each one nestled inside its own pocket. Nice work. Dad would be proud. Trevor constructed it out of interwoven layers of Kevlar, plus he added a few layers of graphene nanofibers for added strength. Should be able to withstand one hell of a beating. 
Lucas continued his inspection and found electrical wires running from each sonic pad to a common pouch sewn inside the back of the vest. Lucas tore open the pouch's Velcro closure. That's the E-121 power unit, Cleesby said, holding up a push-button activator switch. All you need to do is press this button to set off the pulse. Lucas didn't see any wires connecting the switch to the vest. Wireless? Cleesby nodded. Bruno walked around the room with the vest wrapped around his chest, though not in a normal upright posture. He was leaning slightly backward. I don't know. It's a tad back heavy because of the E-121 module. We could add a counterweight to the front if you'd like, Cleesby replied. Nah, if you make it any heavier, I'll be too slow to react. I think I just need to get used to it. Why are you using multiple emitters in one vest? Lucas asked the professor. We tested it on the alien corpse and found we needed to use multiple combinations of infrasonic and ultrasonic waves. Otherwise, it had little effect. It took a bit of engineering for Trevor to make the adjustments needed so we could load the vest with the properly tuned emitters. You should have seen the horrible mess when that thing finally popped, Bruno added, looking satisfied. Lucas laughed, imagining what the explosion looked like. It took longer to tweak your father's technology than we expected, so we only had time to make the two vests, Cleesby said. I take it the other one is for me, Lucas asked. Yeah, go ahead and put it on, Cleesby said, testing the trigger on the activation switch. If something goes wrong during the exchange, I want you and the security team to do whatever is needed to bring Drew home. So you are going to let me help? Of course. Besides, I know there's not a chance in hell you'll sit back and let us handle this without you. You got that right, Lucas answered, flaring his eyebrows. Will I get a gun? Not without the proper training first. You need to let the tactical team enter first and secure the area before you go in. Understood? Sure, Professor. Whatever you need, he answered, checking to make sure the stunner was still tucked deep inside the back of his waistband. It was. He wondered why they weren't going in ahead of schedule in a preemptive assault. But why wait until the exchange? Don't we have the element of surprise on our side? Yes, we do. But they might just return him without a fight. You don't really believe that, do you? After what Alicia said? Well... She was rather emotional and could have been misinterpreting things. The smart move here is to try a diplomatic solution first. An all-out assault is our last resort. Once we have him back, what then? Bruno asked. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. For now, let's try to rescue Drew and not get us all killed in the process. You got it, Bruno said, nodding once. Cleesby turned to face his texts and said, Once we're back, make sure to close the rift immediately. Yes, sir. Lucas slid on the sonic disruptor vest, but initially had trouble buckling the belt. He didn't say anything about the snug fit, fearing they might discover the protective vest hiding under his shirt and the stunner tucked in his pants. He figured two layers of protection couldn't hurt, as long as he could breathe properly. He finally got the belt clipped and waited for Cleesby's orders, which came moments later when he addressed everyone in the room. As a gesture of good faith, Bruno and I will step through with a small amount of biotechs. I suspect they'll want to test its authenticity. Once they do, I'll demand they return Drew before we conclude the exchange. What if they refuse? Lucas asked. Then it's Plan B and your team. Until then, I need you to stand down and monitor the exchange, Cleesby answered before looking at Trevor. Remember, don't bring the rest of the material until I call for you. Trevor nodded. Cleesby held up a pair of pendant necklaces. The techs have built a one-way video audio transmitter into these pendants. They should allow you to see what's going on during the exchange. He pointed to a pair of unmanned video screens just to the right of his lead technician. We'll pipe the signals through those monitors. Will they be powerful enough to carry the signal back here, across dimensions? Lucas asked. Cleesby didn't answer. Instead, he looked at his lead tech. The tech nodded. Won't be a problem, sir. We've programmed the transmitters to scan the rift and match its energy signature. We should be able to piggyback the carrier wave. Should have plenty of signal strength. Assuming the bugs leave the rift open the entire time, Lucas added. True, the tech answered. Chapter 29 Twenty-two minutes later, the Krellians opened the rift in the same location as before. It started as a pinpoint before growing to full size, sending flashes of light rippling across the walls. The aliens had put out the welcome mat right on schedule, adding a sliver of optimism to counterbalance Lucas's growing anxiety. 
Unlike his colleagues, Lucas refused to pin all his hope on Cleesby's approach. The professor's rescue plan was founded on a set of optimistic assumptions, most of which Lucas considered unreliable. Plus, since everything Lucas was involved in lately had turned to shit, why should today's plan be any different? Expect the worst and hope for the best was the only motto that seemed to work for him. If he was going to die today, he intended to go out on his feet, fighting like a wildcat, a University of Arizona wildcat. He sucked at all things sports-related, so joining a paramilitary team on an interdimensional bug hunt would have to make up for it. He let out a guarded smile, more out of pride than from high expectations, while he adjusted the hidden stunner's position inside the back of his pants. The elevator bell sounded, delivering seven additional security team members, who scampered out of the lift while carrying stunners and traditional 9mm handguns. They spread out in formation to take flanking positions in front of the portal with their weapons drawn. Cleesby slipped the transmitter necklace over his head, then moved in front of the rift on crutches, where he waited for Bruno to join him. Bruno, who was already wearing his copy of the necklace, bent down to snatch a one-gallon jug of deactivated Biotex. He carried the container in his arms, walking with heavy feet to Cleesby's location. Other than Bruno's sonic disruptor vest, neither man was armed. Lucas joined Trevor at the remote monitoring station near the front of the room. He watched the screen while his boss and friend entered the trans-dimensional portal and stepped into their home universe. The portal's surveillance system functioned perfectly, allowing them to see and hear everything. Lucas raised his left hand, then knuckle-bumped the elderly video tech sitting to his left. Great job, he told him emphatically. He was sure the tech already knew who he was, but he wanted to know the tech's name. His right hand went out for a shake. My name's Lucas Ramsey, by the way. Claude Vandersteen, pleased to meet you, the old guy said, shaking his hand in earnest. The monitor in front of Lucas contained the video transmission from Cleesby's pendant. Bruno's feed was streaming live on the other monitor to his right, directly in front of Trevor. Cleesby and Bruno were standing inside a sparsely lit room with angled eight-foot-long wall segments, which glistened like algae green sheet metal. Based on Cleesby's earlier description of Krellian ship design, Lucas assumed the shape of the room was octagonal. Three Krellian sentinels were standing with their backs against the visible wall segments, aiming their grappling hook weapons at Cleesby. Lucas wondered why their warriors didn't carry more powerful energy-based weapons, like phase pistols or pulse rifles. Granted, the grappling hooks were deadly and reusable, but their range was limited. Then the answer hit him when he realized their enormous claws would make it impossible for them to pull the trigger on a more conventional weapon. Makes you wonder how they operate their ship controls with those enormous claws, Claude said. Yeah, it must be tough for them to wipe, too, Lucas replied. Trevor laughed, sending a patch of spittle from his mouth as he snorted and doubled over in his chair. Lucas took a moment to relish the big man's chuckle. It was the first time he remembered hearing the Swede bust a gut about anything, making Trevor seem more human than before. Perhaps the stress of the situation had finally gotten to his massive friend. The elevator doors behind them opened again, delivering another seven-member squad of men to the surveillance room. This time, two of the reinforcements were Bruno copies. They joined the other men already standing guard in front of the still-open rift. When Cleesby turned to his left, the video pendant showed a human female approaching his position. She was stark naked, in her twenties, and full-figured. The other monitor showed Bruno turning to greet her, too. Looks like the women aren't allowed to wear clothes ever, Lucas said, watching the amber-haired woman carry some type of hooded garment draped across her arms, possibly a robe. The rust-colored clothing was much too small to fit the creatures. The woman gave the robe to Cleesby in exchange for his crutches. Oh shit, Lucas said, seeing the professor unbutton his shirt. What if they make Bruno change too? They'll take the activator switch away. Then he won't be able to activate the vest, Claude replied typing on his wireless keyboard, then using the touch screen to swipe through a few control screens. But not to worry, I can remotely trigger the vest if Bruno can't, as long as the rift remains open. Then let's hope it stays open, Lucas replied, as a new window appeared on the text computer screen with a title bar that said Remote Arming Sequence. 
Below the title was a red outlined button labeled Fire. Lucas wondered if he'd be the one to press the kill switch. If so, he needed to know more about the control system the technician was using. What about my vest? Can they both be set off? The system can activate them at the same time, but you must activate the secondary transmission channel like this, the tech said, pointing at the monitor. He swiped twice and pulled the contents of the display down, showing an underlying page of six buttons, each with text underneath. One of them was labeled Dual Activation in red lettering. Lucas studied the screen, memorizing how the tech navigated to it, as well as the location of the activation button. The tech entered more commands into the keyboard before using his hand to touch and swipe back to the original remote arming sequence screen. A partially filled computer graphic, like a meter, was now showing in the corner. It read, Output Level. Vest's power level? Lucas asked, wondering why it wasn't clearly labeled like the others. Claude nodded and said, Sure is. The meter showed it was set very low, and Lucas didn't understand why. Shouldn't we be using full power? No, we don't want to take the chance of overloading the disruptor pads, so I've set the power level to 10%. Is it enough to kill him? Absolutely. Many times over. The Vest's E121 power supply is much more powerful than we really need. When we tested it on the alien corpse, we were successful using only a 5% nominal yield. 10% should be more than enough to kill anything in that room. While Cleesby changed his clothes, his body kept swaying, and so did the pendant. The video feed jostled and blurred as it bounced around his chest. After Cleesby bent down to slide off what Lucas assumed was his underpants, the professor's hidden camera held still long enough for Lucas to catch a glimpse of the naked woman standing in front of him. She was still holding the pair of crutches. Cleesby put on the robe and lashed it around his waist. His video feed went black. Come on, DL, pull it out, Lucas coaxed him, needing to see what was happening. The video screen's image returned to normal when Cleesby adjusted the pendant's position so it hung outside the robe. Good thing you used a pendant cam instead of a button cam, Lucas said, watching the streaming footage sway back and forth repeatedly until the pendant came to rest. Both Bruno and Cleesby faced the woman as she scooped up the professor's clothes and walked away, giving Lucas a clear view of her shoulder tattoo. It was the same hand-carved branding mark Alicia showed them earlier in the infirmary. Moments later, she returned with another robe, giving it to Bruno. I hope it's a double XL, he wisecracked. Let's see what she does with the vest, Claude said after a short chuckle. Cleesby kept his pendant trained on Bruno as he removed his pants. God, I hope we don't have to see him without his... Too late, Claude replied as Bruno removed his boxers. Cleesby's camera feed turned away from Bruno, providing a panoramic view of the octagon-shaped room. The wall segment to the professor's right had an arched passageway that led into another chamber. Flaming torches were burning on either side of the opening, making the room look medieval. Not exactly high-tech, Lucas said. When Cleesby turned back, Bruno was dressed in the robe with his pendant hanging outside the garment. The woman was picking up Bruno's clothes. Since his clothes aren't dissolving into biotechs, I assume they're real, Lucas asked. Yeah, real close, Trevor said, breaking his silence. Vest not fit on uniform. The woman put Bruno's vest on top of the clothes and carried them through the passageway, out of sight. Is that going to be a problem? Lucas asked Claude. It depends on where she takes it, Claude answered, as the woman walked back into the room empty-handed. She couldn't have gone far, so we should be okay. Four gray-haired men all at least 60 years old, entered the exchange room wearing white ceremonial garb. Based on their dress and mannerisms, Lucas assumed they were diplomats from Cleesby's planet. At least not all the men had been eaten, giving him renewed hope that his brother might be returned in one piece. Looks like a geriatric toga party, he mumbled, trying to relieve some of his own stress with a little more humor. The old men stood in pairs, facing the entrance. Two ultra-slender naked females, no more than 18 years old, carried in an eight-foot-long banquet table and put it between the two pairs of men. You don't think it's dinner time, do you? Lucas asked his colleagues, worrying his brother might be the entree. Trevor looked more concerned than the tech, but neither of them answered. A Krellian sentinel entered the room with a human female impaled on the end of one of its tentacles. 
Four more aliens followed in behind it, then moved to surround Cleesby and Bruno. Here we go, Claude said. The sentinel used the female translator to say, Show us. Bruno placed the one-gallon container of biotechs on the table and slid it close to the Krellian puppeteer. The elder statesman closest to the creature removed the container's lid, allowing the sentinel to slip one of its remaining tentacles into the goop. It must be siphoning a sample, Claude said. Yeah, to test it, Trevor added. The creature withdrew its tentacle and began to speak on its own, bypassing the woman translator. Its language sounded like a computer modem on steroids as it whined and squealed at a feverish pitch. Lucas figured the alien was reporting its findings to the others, or perhaps to its superiors. There was no telling who or what might have been monitoring the proceedings. Thirty seconds went by before the sentinel stopped its communication and then turned to face the other aliens in the room. Its chest plate lit up like the Las Vegas Strip with an array of lights buried deep inside its exoskeleton. The chest plate gave off a dull hum as the lights flashed in an irregular pattern. Lucas could see the faint outline of organs and other tissue inside the towering beast. Bruno turned his body to show some of the other aliens, whose chest plates were flashing in a similar fashion. Lucas assumed the Krellians were communicating with each other over some form of biological network. He thought the other bugs were receiving data from the Sentinel, or perhaps all of them were receiving orders from a remote location. A few seconds later, the Sentinel stuck its tentacle back into the female hand puppet. The creature raised her high into the air and squealed as if it were celebrating. The other aliens joined in the festivities with their own rendition of the noise. It reminded Lucas of a Native American war cry that preceded an all-out assault. I've got a bad feeling about this. The Krellian sentinel used the female translator to speak to Cleesby. Second substance missing. I want to see my son first, the professor shot back. One of the other warriors approached Cleesby, opened its right claw, and held it open just inches from Cleesby's jugular. Lucas looked at Claude but the tech's hand never moved. Lucas reached out with his left arm to position the tip of his finger a quarter inch from the touchscreen's fire button. Claude grabbed Lucas's wrist, pulling it back. Not yet. They could simply be posturing, testing for weakness. Let's see what happens. You can kill me if you want, Cleesby told the bugs, but we're not giving you the activator enzyme until you bring me my son. The sentinel tilted its head, then squealed as if Cleesby's demand pissed it off. Hold position, the creature answered through its female translator. Both Bruno and Cleesby turned their bodies toward the wall opening. Moments later, an alien soldier armed with a grappling hook device in one of its claws appeared with Drew wrapped inside its tentacles, carrying him like a loaf of bread on its side. It raised its empty claw, then opened and snapped it shut several times, only a foot in front of Drew's neck. Oh my god, Drew, Lucas said, his heart ready to explode. Release him and let him return to Earth, Cleesby demanded. Then I'll hand over the remaining material. Give us material or Cripple dies, the sentinel replied, as its chest plate flashed and hummed. Lucas looked at Claude. We have to do something, now. The tech didn't answer, his eyes glued to the video feeds. Okay, okay, just don't hurt him, Cleesby shouted as he turned slowly back toward the portal. The change in view showed two sentinels standing guard in front of the portal's opening. The professor's voice changed as he used a controlled, softer tone. Claude, go ahead and send Trevor through. Claude finally turned his attention to Lucas. You need to calm down and stop overreacting. We have this covered. He gave Trevor a hand wave, telling him it was time to step through. Trevor stood up from his chair, grabbed hold of the flatbed cart, and rolled the stack of canisters toward the rift. Cleesby turned forward to face the creature in charge. Okay, I did as you asked. The material is on its way. Give me my son. The sentinel let out a short squeal, and its chest flashed twice. The alien holding its claw around Cleesby's neck backed away to make room for the other creature to deliver Drew to Cleesby. Bruno moved next to Cleesby and stood behind Drew, who was now sitting on the deck. 
Lucas watched Trevor step into the portal and disappear with the balance of the ransom material, the activator enzyme. Lucas took his eyes from Trevor and looked back at Claude's video feeds, but now both of them were dark and offline, even though the rift was still open. Claude was now pounding away at the keyboard in obvious panic. What the hell just happened? I thought you had this covered! Lucas screamed at him. Claude didn't answer, his hands working quickly across the array of equipment. Get them back, Lucas said, shaking the man's shoulder, hoping to get a response. I can't. The feeds were shut down at the source, Claude said, stopping his work and sitting back in the chair. Why? I have no idea, he said, throwing up his hands. You have to do something! Claude didn't budge, sitting there, looking shell-shocked. Lucas couldn't believe what was happening, or this man's incompetence. He decided it was time to take action. He stood up and tore off his disruptor vest, then tossed it into the portal, sending it to the exchange room on the other side. He went back to the console station and used both arms to push Claude out of the way, sending the tech flying out of his chair. Lucas quickly changed screens and armed the dual transmitter system the way Claude showed him earlier, then swiped back to the power screen and raised the energy level to 100%. 10% my ass, he yelled at Claude while his finger pressed the fire button on the screen. Lucas grabbed the stunner from the back of his waistband and pulled open the Velcro strap holding the other stunner against his ankle. He ran for the portal with both guns in hand. On the way, he motioned for Bruno's guards to follow him to the Krellian ship. Lucas yelled a commando scream as he jumped into the rift like Rambo breaching a terrorist encampment. Chapter 30 when Lucas arrived on the other side of the rift, his feet slipped out from under him, sending him crashing onto the floor. He knew he needed to roll out of the way, and did, as fourteen of Bruno's security details stormed through the portal behind him. They too slipped on the floor, one after another, sending them sliding past Lucas on their butts. Welcome to the party, pal, Lucas told the last guard to arrive. The exchange room looked like a biological bomb had detonated. The walls were covered in a flood of orange blood, as runny chunks of the Krellian tissue oozed down from the ceiling, dripping into piles on the deck plating. It reminded him of Dexter's putrid-smelling kill room, minus the plastic. When he stood up and walked to the banquet table, gravity tugged at the seat of his blood-soaked pants. He found the geriatric men squatting on the floor, cowering in the fetal position. The naked female translator was still alive, but lying on her side with a stubby piece of tentacle hanging from her spine. Her face and body were covered in orange tissue, and she was sobbing into her hands. Bruno's security detail deployed to cover the corridor outside the wall opening. Lucas lowered his weapons and searched the room for his brother, but couldn't find him. Cleesby and Bruno were missing, too. He found his disruptor vest lying next to the female translator. He looked down at it, expecting it to be smoldering. It wasn't. He hand-checked the condition of the wires and sonic pads. They hadn't overloaded, as Claude had feared. Too bad Dad's not here to see this, he said. His father's invention was a resounding success. Well, after a little of Cleesby's tweaking and Lucas's decision to use full power... Let's fan out. Search the ship, one of the commandos yelled. Lucas assumed he was the leader. The name on the man's uniform ID'd him as Harkins. I'll join you, Lucas said, following them into the hall. Team leaders, I want three teams of four men. Sergeant Nash, you and Phillips remain here and guard the portal. Yes, sir, Nash replied. The security teams scurried off, each taking a different hallway. Lucas decided to follow the group containing the commander. They went to the right, and so did he. The Krellian ship was divided into a labyrinth of short, angled hallways lined with flaming torches. Lucas expected the passageways to be filled with smoke, but they weren't. They were only filled with the runny splatter of orange blood and tissue. Each shiny green corridor looked identical, making it tough for Lucas to maintain his bearings. He felt like he was running through a carnival funhouse, trying to navigate a maze of endless mirrors. Even if he rescued his brother from the bugs, he wasn't sure he could find his way back to the exchange room. The end of each corridor had an octagon-shaped hatch that forked into two adjoining hallways. Harkins made only right turns, which Lucas assumed was the most efficient method for searching the seemingly endless network of passageways. 
Lucas kept expecting to be ambushed by a Krellian welcoming party as they turned each corner, but all they saw was orange blood and tissue on the floors and walls, seemingly everywhere. It appeared the range of the disruptor vest was far greater than they hoped, or maybe his decision to max out its power did the trick, or both. Either way, it didn't matter. The ultrasonic blast took out the Krellians with extreme prejudice. Eventually, they came across a 20-foot-wide nook on the right. Access to the room was blocked by a lattice of black riveted metal bars, stamped flat instead of round. Beyond the door was a hay-like substance covering the floor. Interspersed with the hay were random patches of black and brown spots. Just then, movement caught his eye from the back left corner. He could see a group of human women bunched together, all of them naked. About half of the females, two of whom were clearly under 16, had fully extended bellies. His mind flashed a single word that Alicia had said earlier, after they'd rescued her from the clutches of the sentinel warrior. Breeders. Shit. That's right. She said the Krellians used the females as breeders in order to further their food supply of humans. His heart sank, realizing the pregnant girls were nearing full term, ready to give birth any day. A second later, an awful odor found its way into his nose. He realized it was coming from the hay. It reeked of urine and excrement, making Lucas want to puke. Somehow, he managed to hold the vomit back, even though the smell was a hundred times worse than the chemical smell in Griffith's chem lab back home. Let's go, men. Cleesby's not in there, Harkin said, turning his head and shoulders to continue down the hall. Hey, wait a minute. We can't just leave them here, Lucas said. We're not here for them. But they're human. We have to get them out. Harkins moved closer to Lucas, shuffling through his men. Look, we don't have time for this. Lucas raised his stunner and fired it at the ceiling. Make the time, goddammit. Harkins leaned in close and sneered at Lucas. One of his men, the shortest of the group, said, He's right, boss. We can't leave them here. Three more of his team stepped forward and said the same thing. No, we can't, Lucas added, waiting for the commander to respond. Harkins bit his lower lip and shook his head. A few seconds later, Harkins told Lucas, Fine, but they're your problem. Lucas nodded without hesitation, knowing the delay could mean he might never see his brother again. But he had no choice. It was the right thing to do. Earlier, when Alicia first appeared through the rift, he failed to act when she held out her hand and pleaded for his help. He wasn't about to make the same mistake twice. He couldn't leave the women there to die. Harkins told one of his men, Hand me a brick. Harkins took the C4 from the man and broke it into three smaller blocks before attaching them to the inside of the door's hinges. He inserted a detonator into the center of each block, then said, Stand clear. Once everyone was a safe distance away, Harkins detonated the explosives. The power of the blast sent the bars clanking across the hallway in a cloud of acrid smoke. Let's move it, Harkins said. They probably heard that and are on their way with reinforcements. Lucas ran inside the cage, leading the way. Ladies, you need to come with us. None of the two dozen women budged from the back wall. He held out his right hand, trying to appear friendly, and spoke again, this time using a much louder voice. It's okay. We're here to help you, but you need to come with us right now. A soft voice called out from the left. Lucas, is that you? Yes, it's me, he said, stunned. He brought his eyes around to search for the source. The throng of women parted, allowing one of the smaller women in the back to work her way forward. Lucas couldn't believe his eyes when he saw a dark-haired beauty that he recognized. She stepped forward and smiled, even though streams of tears were covering her face. Abby, how the hell? She flew into his arms and cried hysterically. He held her tight, feeling the hand-carved alien tattoo etched into her shoulder. It's okay. You're safe now. Lucas ran it all through his head in a flash and came to the realization that the theater flash must have been some type of sampler probe, not a destructive energy dome like he first thought. It must have snatched her up, along with the rest of the students standing completely inside its perimeter. Jasmine had been cut in half because she was straddling the edge of the field, but not Abby. Abby leaned away slightly, looking up at him with her fear-stricken eyes. They've got Drew. 
I know. That's why we're here. Do you know where he is? No, she said, shaking her head and sniffing. I only saw him once, when they carried him past our cell. We have to leave, now, Harkins yelled. Lucas broke free from her embrace and led her out of the confinement cell. Abby stood half-crouched among the men in the hallway, with her arms and hands trying to cover her privates. Lucas removed his shirt and gave it to her to wear. The other women joined them in the corridor, flocking around him, thanking him for saving them. Do you remember the way back to the exchange room? Harkins asked Lucas. No clue. I lost my bearings. I can take him, sir, the shortest man in the team said. Harkins didn't respond right away. Instead, he turned slightly and spoke into his communicator watch. Harkins here. A few seconds later, his eyes grew wide and his voice was charged with excitement as he spoke. Where? Okay then, secure the area. Harkins stepped in front of the group and spoke in a command voice, making eye contact with several members of his team. Let's get everyone back to the portal. What's wrong? Lucas asked, keeping Abby close. We have a situation, he said, returning his attention to his team. Let's go, men. Double time it. After rushing through a maze of hallways, the group finally turned the last corner on their way back to the rally point, escorting the girls they'd rescued from the Krellian holding cell. Lucas could see a group of soldiers standing guard outside the exchange room. He wasn't sure what situation had caused Harkins to order the fallback, but the pain in his chest was telling him it wasn't good. He feared something horrible had happened to Drew, or Cleesby, or Bruno, or Trevor, maybe all four. Or perhaps another alien hive ship was closing in on their position. Abby kept a tight grip on Lucas as he held her back, letting four members of the tactical squad go through the door first. A few seconds later, the other girls were ushered inside by the remaining soldiers. All seemed quiet, so Lucas thought it was safe to bring Abby forward. He did keeping his arm wrapped around her as they turned left and went through the door. The second his eyes focused on the inside of the exchange room, two things happened simultaneously. His heart lit up with a massive rush of joy, and Abby screamed, Drew! There he was, safe and unharmed, standing with the help of Trevor's powerful arm, next to Cleesby and three members of the rescue team. His little brother's smile was full and infectious and aimed squarely at him. Abby ran to Drew, as did Lucas, passing a small collection of girls who were standing together. Abby planted a passionate kiss on Drew's lips. Lucas slowed his approach, waiting for his brother to finish the smooch and come up for air. When he did, Lucas asked him, Are you okay? I'm hungry and exhausted, but other than that, I'm fine, Drew replied, with Abby's arms wrapped around his neck. Where the hell did you guys go? Lucas asked Bruno. The guard held out his watch. We never left. We knew they'd attack, so we ducked into subspace. Shit, I ran right past you. Cleesby lifted one of his shoes, letting the orange blood and tissue drip from his heel. You detonated the vest, didn't you? He asked Lucas. Lucas nodded. Yep, both of them, and I cranked them up to full power. Harkins added. I think it took out the entire ship, sir. We encountered no hostiles, anywhere. Cleesby's eyes darted about the room, obviously thinking the facts over. The supercharged disruptor signal must have been transmitted across their biocom network, destroying them all. He patted Lucas on the back. Nice work. Thanks, Professor, but it was just dumb luck. I really wasn't thinking clearly. I just knew I had to do something once the video feeds went dark. I'm sure it was more than just luck, Cleesby said. I'd say more like instinct, Bruno said, sending a congratulatory nod at Lucas. Well done, Dr. Lucas. Order, sir, Harkins asked Cleesby. Search the rest of the ship. There are probably more humans on board. Yes, sir. What about the energy domes? Any change now that the creatures are all dead? Drew asked. I suspect we've seen the last of the energy fields, Cleesby said, nodding, assuming this ship was controlling them. Lucas turned to his little brother and smiled. How about that? Dad's invention might have just saved Earth. Too bad we can't tell anyone, Drew replied. Can we go home now? Abby asked in a soft, meek voice. Cleesby cocked his head in Bruno's direction. Escort them, please. Lucas whispered into Drew's ear. When we get home, there's something I need to tell you about your biological father. Drew looked confused for a moment, then nodded. Bruno helped Drew and Abby through the rift. Lucas stayed behind. So, Professor, what are you going to do with your new ship? I'm going to take my people home, assuming we can figure out how to fly this thing. 
Lucas looked around at the blood and guts covering the walls. It's going to need a fresh coat of paint and a ton of disinfectant. He sniffed the air. A little Febreze wouldn't hurt either. Cleesby laughed. Chapter 31 Lucas returned to the silo through the portal and found Drew sitting in his wheelchair. Abby was sitting in an office chair next to him, still wearing Lucas's shirt. He wondered if Cleesby intended to find her some real clothes. Lucas checked the video screens, but didn't see any active energy fields. In fact, half the screens were switched off, and the room was abuzz with talk of the crisis on Earth finally being over. They'd done it. As a group and as individuals, they'd saved the world. He felt like an enormous weight had been lifted from his shoulders. There was no way to ever make up for the people who were already dead, but at least no more were going to die because of him. Atonement comes in small doses, he decided. You said you had something to tell me? Drew asked him. Lucas looked to make sure Cleesby wasn't nearby. The professor was across the room, standing next to Bruno, and talking with the white-robed elders from his home world. If he kept his voice down, the professor shouldn't hear him. You know how you always thought your bio-mom was impregnated by anonymous sperm, Lucas said, keeping his voice calm and steady. Yeah. Well, as it turns out, it wasn't so anonymous after all. What do you mean? Lucas pointed in Cleesby's direction. He was still in deep conversation with Bruno and the elders. Bruno? Drew asked. No, not him. Cleesby. Drew stared at Cleesby for what seemed like a full minute, then said, No, I don't believe you. Well, believe it. It's true. He owns the fertility clinic your mother used. Drew shook his head vigorously. Nah, you're putting me on again, aren't you? Cleesby would never do that. Trust me, it's true. Hey, look on the bright side. At least he didn't do it the old-fashioned way. The look on Drew's face went from friendly disbelief to one of bewilderment. Then it changed again, this time showing anger and concern. Lucas tried to stop Drew when he rolled his chair toward Cleesby. Drew fought off Lucas's grip, sped across the room, and nearly smashed into the back of Cleesby's leg. He tugged on his mentor's sleeve. Excuse me, Professor, but I need to ask you something. Cleesby whirled around. Sure, what is it? Lucas saw Drew take in a deep breath before he spoke, like he was about to dive underwater for a long swim. Lucas told me you're my real father. Is this true? Cleesby glared at Lucas, looking more than pissed. Lucas shrugged. Sorry, Professor, he had a right to know. Cleesby turned to Drew, and his face went soft. Yes, it's true. I'm your biological father. Drew leaned back in his chair, wrinkling his nose and flaring his eyes. Why didn't you tell me? Cleesby took a moment before he answered. You already had a family, and I didn't want to butt in. I knew you were healthy and happy, and that's all that mattered to me. Besides, I got to see you almost every day. That was enough for an old man like me. Drew's face turned a deep shade of red. Then he looked at Lucas as if he were searching for guidance. Lucas wanted to help, but didn't say anything. Drew needed to handle this on his own. Drew turned back to Cleesby and wrapped his arms around Cleesby's legs, nearly knocking the man off his crutches. Lucas could see Cleesby fighting back tears, trying to maintain his self-control. The professor pried Drew's arms loose, then bent down and hugged him back. When the family reunion was finished, Lucas went to Drew and the professor, realizing they hadn't brought the four-wheeled cart back from the Krellian ship. Dr. Cleesby, didn't we forget something? What about all the canisters? Bruno laughed. They were filled with spoiled milk from the mess hall. Only the first canister I carried was real. So let me get this straight. Trevor wasn't transporting the enzyme? No, I would never do that, Cleesby said. Not even for my own son. I figured they wouldn't check them, too. Not after sampling the first container that Bruno brought with him. Wow, Lucas said, thinking about how his boss had gambled with Drew's life and done so based on a paper-thin assumption. But it worked out in the end, and he was thankful. Cleesby leaned on one crutch and put his free hand on Lucas's shoulder. I hope you realize that you too, with the help from your father's marvelous invention, saved billions of lives in both dimensions, 
all of the Ramsey men are trans-dimensional heroes. Congratulations. Too bad we can never tell anyone, Bruno said in a matter-of-fact way. But regardless, props to both of you and your old man. Drew replied with pure joy. We have to tell Mom that Dad's invention saved the world. Oh yeah, she'll love to hear that, Lucas said, realizing that atonement wasn't the only thing that came in small doses. So did vindication, though only his family and Cleesby's crew would ever know about it. But at least it was something. Dorothy had supported John's endeavors all those years, even during the lean financial times. He couldn't remember one time when she wavered, despite constant second-guessing by her friends, her co-workers, and even her estranged father-in-law, Roy. Lucas wondered if Grandpa Roy would ever man up and apologize for his pig-headedness. The grumpy old man would have to change his perspective once he learned his only son wasn't a dismal failure after all, wouldn't he? It's a shame the government will never know what we've done for them. They still think we're mass murderers, Drew said. Bruno replied. The minute Larson recovers from surgery, the first thing he'll do is contact General Alvarez and tell him you're still alive. I doubt we can fool them again. He's never going to stop looking for us, is he? Even now? After this? Lucas asked. Bruno shook his head. No, I'm afraid not. Lucas asked Cleesby. I don't suppose you'll help us clear our family's good name. Not for me, but for Drew and my parents. Sorry, can't do it. Going public would require exposing our technology and our existence on your world. But what I can do is offer you sanctuary on our world. You'll be treated as heroes and live in peace. Lucas didn't answer. He needed a moment to think. Cleesby continued. Look, I know you think this is all your fault. But like I said before, it's not. NASA and I are the reason all of this happened, not you. In the end, you had nothing to do with this. What happened in the E-121 lab was an accident, a horribly tragic accident that you couldn't have seen coming, not when I kept you in the dark all these years. That was the wrong approach, and for that I apologize. So right now, I need you to forgive yourself. You've done enough to atone for what happened. I'd like to, Professor, but every time I close my eyes, the dead haunt me. I don't think I'll ever rid myself of the guilt, no matter what you say. And to be honest... I'm not sure I really want to. I understand. You're an honorable young man, Lucas. But you need to try, because this simply wasn't your fault. The best course of action right now is for you to come with us to our universe. We've done all we can do here. The planet will heal eventually. It's time to go, Lucas. Lucas let his eyes fall to the floor, feeling a feral mix of emotions spinning inside. Their lab was gone, and all that was left on this earth was a mountain of unpaid medical bills and an even bigger pile of public scorn headed his way. He had no future, and neither did his family. Plus, there were a slew of people who wanted his head on the end of a stick. Those same people would probably blame Drew as well, and possibly even his mother. There was no way he'd ever let that happen, no matter how guilty he was or wasn't. His family didn't deserve that. No, they needed to go to Cleesby's universe. That much was clear. But at the same time, he knew Drew would never go without him. Lucas locked eyes with his boss. All right, I'll go. But I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for Drew. What about Mom and Abby? Drew asked. They're welcome too. So are you, Cleesby said, turning to Bruno. You should probably go get Dorothy and bring her down. Bruno spun on his heels and headed for the elevator. What about Grandpa Roy? Drew asked Lucas. What about him? I know you've been secretly emailing him. Only recently, but trust me, he'd never come. His military career is all he cares about. Don't you think we should ask him? After all, he's family. No, Mom would never allow it. He blew his chance with that brawl at Thanksgiving. For the next half hour, Cleesby took charge of the introductions between his crew and the diplomats from his home world. Then, the elevator's bell chimed and Dorothy walked out of the lift with Bruno holding onto her right elbow. She was grinning from ear to ear, obviously ecstatic to see both of her boys were safe. Lucas tugged on Drew's shirt sleeve to direct his attention away from Abby. He whispered, Mom's here. Dorothy came over to them, then hugged Drew and kissed him softly on the cheek. I thought I'd never see you again. She hugged Lucas, too. 
Oh, I'm so happy both of my boys are home, safe and sound. I prayed all night for your safe return. Thank the Lord Almighty. Dorothy stared at Abby, who was sitting next to Drew, holding his hand. She was still wearing only Lucas's shirt, which left most of her legs and upper thighs exposed. Mom, this is my, uh, girlfriend, Abby, Drew replied, with a look of pure fright in his eyes. We just rescued her from the Krellian ship. Are you all right, dear? Dorothy asked her. Abby nodded and then stared off into space. She wrapped her arms around Drew with her right cheek pressed flat against his chest. She'll be okay, Mom. She just needs a little time to recover. Lucas walked over to Cleesby and asked, How long do we have before we need to leave, Professor? I'm sure my mom will want to grab a few things. He figured Cleesby would need at least several days to recall his people and gather up their advanced technology, since he probably wouldn't want to leave anything behind that might cause a shift in the balance of power on Earth. It'll take 24 hours to evacuate our people and equipment. You have until then. Wow, only 24 hours? Lucas thought, realizing Cleesby must have had exit plans on deck for years. Okay, we'll be packed and ready. Just keep it light. Sure thing, Professor. The following morning, Lucas and Drew returned to the video surveillance room with their mother and Abby. Bruno and his security team had provided protection while they returned home the night before and collected a few personal mementos, including clothes and the family photo albums. When they stepped off the elevator, they saw two groups of personnel and equipment walking through the portal to Cleesby's home universe. The rest of the room was nearly empty. Are you ready to go? Cleesby asked. Yes, sir, we are, Lucas replied, helping his mother toward the rift. Drew and Abby were a few steps behind. Bruno was carrying two suitcases filled with their keepsakes. What about Trevor? Lucas asked. He went through an hour ago with our entire inventory of biotechs, Cleesby said. Lucas held on to his mother's arm as they stepped into the rift. A few seconds later, they were through and standing on the other side, where they met up with Trevor and several of the elderly diplomats they'd rescued the day before. Now it was Drew's turn to step through. Lucas spun around and waited, seeing a faint shadow appear near the portal's midpoint. It started as a fuzzy mass, then grew in size. After it solidified, Bruno stepped through with the pair of suitcases. I thought Drew was next, Lucas asked Bruno. Don't worry, DL is sending him through right behind me. What does DL stand for anyway? The round man laughed, looking at Dorothy, then back at Lucas. If I tell you, you can't let him know you heard it from me. He'll have my head. Don't worry, my lips are sealed. Come on, tell me, what does it mean? Drock Morton Leslie. Lucas broke into hysterical laughter. Really? Drock Morton? No wonder he goes by DL. I would too. Lucas let his smile and his amusement linger as he focused his attention back on the rift. How much longer? Dorothy asked. Shouldn't be long now, Mom. The rift shimmered a few times, then a pair of faint shadows appeared. Lucas could see the outline of a person in a wheelchair and a figure standing next to it, Drew and Abby. They were holding hands. Here they come, he told his mother. Just then, the portal flickered twice like a TV set on the fritz. Then the rift suddenly collapsed. Lucas watched the vision of Drew and Abby fade to a pinpoint and disappear while they were still inside the conduit. Oh my God, Bruno shouted. Dorothy gasped, squeezing Lucas's arm in a vice-like grip. What the hell just happened? Lucas screamed at Bruno, burning his gaze into the man. Where's my brother? The story continues in Gravity Wave, Book Two, in the Quantum Realm series. <laughs>